All right, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> we'll get started here in a minute. All right, good morning, everyone. It is Monday, it is day three. We are on schedule. Uh, we have a long day ahead of us. So without further ado, I will turn to Executive Director Tracy for any announcements and an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so today we've got <clears throat> um, three ground fish items and one salmon item. Um, but uh, before we get started, um, uh, in, in a moment, I'll, I'll be introducing Sam Rauch. Uh, he's our uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Regulatory Programs, and he's going to speak to us a little bit on the topic of Executive Order 14008, uh, which is the tackling the climate crisis uh, at home and abroad uh, executive order. Um, but before, uh, before we get to Sam, let me just uh, go over a few things on the agenda today. Uh, we start off with the NIMS report. Um, and then we move into uh, workload and new management measures for uh, for ground fish. Um, and as you recall, we had a proposal for an emergency rule, uh, which came up under uh, open comment on uh, Thursday, March 4th. Uh, the council agreed to consider this in light of the other ground fish priorities. And so, uh, so that is something that will be included in today's discussion. Um, if the council decides to move ahead with that, we will have to find some time, uh, sub, you know, on the agenda tomorrow or, or uh, Wednesday or Thursday to deal with that. <clears throat> um, we've got salmon management alternatives um, coming back before the council for uh, additional um, guidance. Uh, we would like to get that in um, before lunch, uh, so. We will be looking for an opportunity to do that. It, it'll, uh, I don't think it'll be too soon, but, uh, um, and I, I would prefer not to uh, break up the other agenda items, but, but uh, in order to accommodate that, depending on how things are going, we, we may uh, decide to uh, insert it somewhere uh, in today's agenda uh, in, in the morning time frame to, to make sure that those folks can get their guidance and uh, get that information turned around and back out to the technical team for their uh, further analysis in the next iteration. So uh, I, I guess we'll just be flexible there, but uh, would expect to see salmon uh, sometime before lunch. And then we have our final agenda item, which is the mothership utilization uh, scoping range of alternatives. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the plan for today. Um, so, uh, uh, so beyond that, um, I think I'll turn the uh, turn the mic over to um, Sam Rauch and let him uh, uh, brief us on the executive order. Sam, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you taking time to uh, to come and, and brief us up on this. And, uh, and I know there's a, a lot of effort going into um, pursuing the goals and objectives of this executive order. Um, so uh, so thank you, and uh, be interested to hear what you have to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. I was having some difficulties earlier. They seem to have been resolved. So please let me know if um, they re-arise. Uh, for those of you who I have not met, I am Sam Rauch. I am one of three Deputy Directors of the National Marine Fisheries Service. 
Uh, the way we are structured is beyond the regions. Uh, we have a three career deputy directors. I'm one of them. I oversee the, the work of the regional offices, including the West Coast region, and several headquarters offices. There is a deputy director for operations who oversees facilities, enforcement, budget, those kind of issues. And then there is a chief scientist, which is essentially the deputy director for science and oversees the work in science centers. We three are career. We answer normally to a political uh, assistant administrator, which is the head of the National Fisheries Service, who was Chris Oliver. Um, there is not currently a politically appointed uh, assistant administrator. And in that situation, unless the administration does something different, the principal deputy, which is the operational deputy, steps up and is in charge. Uh, that's Paul Doremus. Uh, he is currently acting as the assistant administrator, and um, I am retaining my role as the as the, the deputy. Um, before I get started, I know that you would like to hear about uh, Executive Order 216. Uh, a few more updates on transition. Uh, we did have a new Secretary of Commerce uh, was uh, appointed, has been sworn in. Uh, sec uh, former Governor Raimondo from Connecticut uh, just started last week. Uh, we do not have a NOAA administrator or, as I said, a head of the National Fisheries Service yet. Uh, and we continue to work through uh, other issues, and I'll talk about a few of them in terms of the executive orders. We are going to talk about Executive Order 14008 in a minute, but there have been a number of other ones that are perhaps of interest to this council. I am not going to talk about them in any depth, but I do want to point out that uh, a number of actions were taken in the first, uh, uh, first few days, weeks of this administration. One of them was Executive Order 13990, which is called Protecting Public Health and the Environment and Restoring Science to Tackle the Climate Crisis. So that is another climate executive order. Uh, that is the one that has a regulatory review in it, uh, requiring us to look at regulations that we've done in the last few years to see whether or not they comply with a broad policy statement that is in that executive order, and is the one that requires the Department of the Interior to conduct the review of the existing national monuments, or three of them, including the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Monument uh, off of the uh, Northeast. Um, in addition to that one, there is also a presidential memorandum of tribal consultation, which has asked us to uh, renew and uh, invigorate our consultations with the tribes. And that may be something that we will at some point in the process um, be talking with this council about and with our tribal partners on the West Coast about how to conduct that, uh, those uh, discussions. Um, there's also an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And this is designed to look at issues of um, the benefits that the federal government gives out to underserved communities, and many fishing communities are underserved communities. Uh, are we allocating the benefits of the federal largesse uh, fairly and equitably across those or are there things that we can do to correct for that and there is a lot of detail in that one none of it specifically related to fisheries but a lot of it could apply to fisheries and then before i get to 14008 there was also an executive order 13992 which revoked many of the executive orders of the prior administration including the executive order on two for one which is the loose term for the executive order that required us to eliminate two regulations for every regulation we issued, and that required us to have a, um, a regulatory budget of zero, zero dollars, uh, costing the American taxpayer uh, based on the application of the regulations and a number of other things. But I wanted to, I've been invited to, and I did want to particularly talk about Executive Order 14008. Uh, that, that executive order includes many different topics. There is a goal to double offshore wind by 2030. There is work on creating a civilian climate core. There are provisions that deal with oil and natural gas development and sustainable infrastructure. 
I'm not going to talk about many of those things, but those things are in this executive order. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about is Section 216. And the entire executive order, by the way, is called Tackling the Climate Crisis at Home and Abroad. Uh, Section 216 has a provision on uh, setting a goal, 216A, setting a goal uh, for the country of uh, 30, conserving 30% 30 of our uh, land and water by 2030. So that's not, uh, that's not overnight. Uh, and it sets a process for, uh, it asks us to establish a process to get there. Uh, and the Interior Department is leading that and is supposed to have a report within 90 days of this executive order uh, going out there. The one I wanted to focus on is 216C. 216C directs the Commerce Department and NOAA to initiate efforts in the first 60 days to collect input from fishermen, regional ocean councils, fishery management councils, scientists, and other stakeholders on how to make fisheries and protected resources more resilient to climate change, including changes in management and conservation measures and improvements in science, monitoring, and cooperative research. Obviously, this does specifically mention the councils, and so we wanted to make sure that we outreached directly to the councils on fulfilling section 216C. We know that many of our fish stocks are being affected by changes in the ocean, temperature changes, salinity changes, other things that uh, appear to be driven by climate change. It is having an effect on ocean ecosystems and other effects uh, on the environment, on our fishing communities and those kind of issues. Um, we work with our partners to understand and respond to these changing climate conditions across all fronts, not just the fisheries fronts, in order to try to minimize these impacts um, and, and adapt to the changes so that present and future generations can continue to enjoy healthy marine ecosystems and the economies on which those ecosystems are built. Um, but for specifically today, I wanted to start uh, sharing uh, with you uh, and from our acting uh, assistant minister, Paul Dremus, a specific invitation to provide us with your thoughts on how to make sure our fisheries can be more resilient to climate change, including, as I indicated, changes in management conservation measures, improvement in science monitoring and cooperative research. Uh, there's a not, lot of no authorities that are related to this goal, not the least of which is the Magnuson-Stevens Act, but there are others. And we're going to use the input that we get from you and others uh, to inform our rulemaking policy and, and notably the next series of our regional action plans, which we've issued under the climate science strategy. So it, the executive order does ask us to collect recommendations in addition from the Fishery Management Council from a broad suite of other people and the public at large. Uh, we've issued a federal register notice opening a public comment period on this in which we've requested information for 30 days. The deadline for those public comments is April 2nd of 2021. Uh, that is available. I'm sure we could, we could make that uh, available as well. But we're also clearly accepting comments from the council. Uh, we could also send comments to a website that we've set up called oceanresources.climate at noaa.gov. So let me stop there. Um, I will say before, before I stop, it does tell us to initiate. I understand the council processes are sometimes lengthy, sometimes are not well suited to uh, quick action, although I'm very pleased we could get on the Pacific Council's agenda and start this process. Um, I, we will be working with the councils for quite some time on these issues. Uh, these are issues that the councils are well aware of and I think I've worked uh, with extensively uh, to date, so I don't think this is is terribly new to the councils, although we are specifically asking if you've got new ideas, new input, or if you would just like to gather your current ideas and input, we would appreciate that. So let me stop there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Director Tracy, I'm happy to take any comments on this or anything else you may have uh, as it suits your agenda. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, let me just uh, get one question of clarification in here. Uh, 
I, I think you touched on it, but um, just just so uh, people are clear, that the, the 30-day uh, comment period uh, is is a, it's open to the public, but uh, but you will be working with the councils beyond that 30-day period to um, uh, to gather our input on this. So uh, so we're not the council itself isn't necessarily bound by that 30-day period. Is that right? That's correct. We were supposed to initiate. We wanted a, a mechanism for the com for the public to give us comments quickly. It does not say we have to complete the this uh, response, nor does it indicate clearly in the executive order what the final product will be. I've mentioned one use we're going to make of this, which is uh, we're going to incorporate this into the next series of regional action plans, which we have some time to develop. And we will work with the councils to make sure that uh, we accept the council's input in a reasonable schedule. Thank you very much. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna turn the gavel back over to, to Mark and uh, let you handle any comments from other council members. All right, thanks a lot, Chuck. Let me see if there are any hands, any questions for Sam. Virgil Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sam, thanks for being here this morning. Um, and it's Virgil Moore. I'm a member from Idaho. And my my question is is broad initially, and it's the the 30 by 30 goal that you mentioned relative to this executive order. Was there some foundational documents that speak to that amount of surface area and what it's what we're trying to do with it or is it just kind of an arbitrary figure um thank you uh thank you the the executive order did not come with it uh there was no associated documents with the executive order uh, so to that extent there's no foundational document that is referenced in the order the 30 by 30 concept is something that was circulating in the ocean, in the international ocean community for some time. Uh, the, it was a point of discussion in many of our regional fishery management forums, these international bodies that uh, regulate ocean fishing or discuss ocean fishing on the high seas. Uh, and has been a concept that has been circulated in the, in the conservation community. It is something that um, it is a little unclear at this point. One of the things that we will be working with Interior on is exactly what it means to conserve 30%. There are different ways to assess that now. I have seen agri the U.S. Department of Agriculture make assessments that indicate that the uh, the land, and I, these numbers are inaccurate, so do not quote the, these numbers precisely, but, but I saw something the other day that the, uh, I think as agriculture thinks that about 16 to 20% of the current land base is uh, in one definition of conserved and 28% of the ocean. I have seen other figures that range from the ocean being 3% to 80%, depending on how you calculate that. Uh, one of the, the tasks that the Interior Department will be tasked with is to come up with uh, criteria on which to judge that, to judge where we are now and where we may need to try to go by 2030. Um, there are different ideas that you could have about that and about managed areas such as uh, fishery management closed areas. We have a number of closed areas in the Pacific. Uh, whether they count or not is something that we will be discussing with uh, the Interior Department and with the administration as this process goes forward. <clears throat> Virgil, does that answer your question? It does, partially. I think it gets to the root of some of the discussions we've had in the council. What is conserving. Uh, I would maintain that our fishery management goals and activities for both recreational, commercial, and tribal fisheries meet all of those concepts and that eliminating those types of activities in these areas 
is of my concern. And I think that's where the misunderstanding or lack of understanding be a better term is that some people are articulating as 30 by 30 to be no human activities or wilderness areas on terrestrial lands. And I believe that's misstating what it is we're trying to do with with that. And I, you hit on that, Sam, and I appreciate it, but I think it's going to require clarification um, in terms of the breadth of what proper management which is conservation of our natural resources is that could qualify for this. Mr. Chair, if I could, if I could add to that thought, uh, yes. Secretary nominee Howland from Interior, who has not been confirmed yet, uh, in her confirmation hearing expressed the view that uh, she believed the concept involves managed lands and not uh, no take reserves basically not uh, that she intended to her view was that um, you worked with landowners on conservation use of these lands now she is not yet the secretary of interior and interior does uh, will have a, a lot to say about uh, what conserve is but i would refer to you to some of her comments if you want to get an idea of what interior may be thinking in terms of the what they mean by conserve Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Are there uh, further questions for our honored guest, Corey Niles? Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Sam, for being here. Um, a question back on the, I think it's section 216C, it is, or if I got that wrong, apologies, on, your, on a reasonable schedule for engaging the councils. Uh, this council has been working on a climate and communities initiative for a number of years, and including that, it was, part of that was a scenario planning where we we're looking at some scenarios, climate scenarios, and that that we'll be hearing for some on this meeting, but coming back in full, reporting back in September. So in terms of reasonable, and you mentioned councils might not always be quick, Is did you have any reaction on whether September would be a, within the realm of, of reasonable for getting feedback from this council. So I would say that we, we interact with the councils on a regular and ongoing basis and that uh, the climate problem is not something that started in one council meeting and will not end in one council meeting. Uh, so that uh, this effort is not intended to upend uh, the climate, uh, the, the council's activities, nor to hasten them uh, but to reflect them. Uh, so I, I would hope that the Pacific Council could give us feedback on a quicker basis so that we could get started. Um, but that doesn't mean that when the Pacific Council issues that report that we won't fully take it into account um, in this. I, my view of, the, of our relationship with the Council, and I hope your view is as well, that there is a constant back and forth between the agency and the Council uh, and a feedback loop that goes both ways in terms of uh, seeking the opinions of each other, developing work products from each other, and then um, implementing those products. So it is, if you do not give us anything until September, we, we will take it in September. I would hope that you could give us something along 216 in a more uh, quicker uh, fashion. But we, we will never ignore uh, input that we get from the council on this or anything else. I, this is a vague answer. I'm, we're trying to work with the council, but I do not. I think the bottom line is I would hope you give us something before then. I would hope that uh, it is fine if you wanted to give us something and then refer to your more extensive efforts in the future as something that will be important for us to pay attention to when you're done with that. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sam. Further questions uh, for Sam? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Sam. Um, wish we could be in the same room uh, instead of meeting like this. Hopefully, we'll get to that here one of these days before too long, and and uh, hope you're doing well. Um, my question 
uh, is in regards to our electronic monitoring program and our efforts to transfer it from an uh, EFP uh, to one that is uh, permanent in regulation. Um, I know you're. Um, I know you've been engaged in this issue. I don't. I, I won't say I know to what degree, but I know you've you've been watching this with us, and this and have probably uh, had some uh, interaction on the, on the issue. And I know as we uh, as we the council asked for uh, an additional year to operate the program under EFP, um, you were you were very helpful in that, and we we appreciate uh, that accommodation. And as you know, the regulated fishing community has worked extremely hard um, and has invested several millions of dollars in conjunction and cooperation uh, with the council and with the Pacific States uh, and with National Marine Fishery Service in putting the program together under the EFP. And I can't find anyone really that that uh, doesn't view what we have done as a success. Uh, and so we're, as you know, anxious to build on that success as it transitions to a permanent program under federal regulations. Um, even with this additional year, um, we have struggled uh, to find ways to make the transition without adding to the overall cost of the program, and at the same time, without losing the integrity of the program. Um, um, the, um, and uh, one of the major uh, uh, kind of differences in the, the program is from going to EFP to regulation, as you know, is, is having to introduce a third party um, model. And uh, what has come with that is the creation of an audit capacity um, within the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, as you know, the, the third party service providers will be certified by NIMPS, uh, uh, yet there's a, a, a feeling, a sense of, of uh, the ne necessity uh, to create this audit capacity, even if, for example, if we're if if all of the um, participants decided to use, for example, Pacific States as a third-party provider, uh, there's still this um, audit capacity uh, that uh, is going to be built within them. Um, and um, and you know and, and obviously in in doing that it's it's uh, resulting in additional costs. Um, the the creation of the auditing capacity just in round numbers is somewhere around four hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, we're we're looking um, within the program for cost saving measures uh, that we might. Uh, that we might take. Um, I don't know exactly. We don't know exactly what the overall uh, review, the, the proportion of the video that will be uh, required to be reviewed. Right now, we're we're doing 100 percent, or we Pacific States is doing 100 um, percent. They've retained all the video uh, since this program started, so we've got a pretty high bar there. Um, and uh, but I guess when I, when I'm in, we we continue to work we we are continuing to struggle to try to make this transition and not add something north of three hundred thousand um, or maybe more could I mean three hundred thousand is kind of the minimum that I see that we're going to be adding to the shoulders of industry and in making the transition and having them pick up the cost associated with the video review and data storage, but what's added complications to this and cost is the creation of the audit shop. And we don't have, you know, we're not at a point yet where we have estimates from or bids from service providers 
So we don't know exactly what that's going to be. Um, so I'm just uh, make, I'm bringing this to your attention. I'm hoping that um, I know you're uh, uh, you're really creative, and if there's anything that you can think of that NIMS can do to help minimize the cost of the audit and the, that secondary review, um, uh, that would be extremely helpful. It is, um, are we overbuilding that shop given that these service providers are gonna be NIMS certified? Um, you know, is there anything that, that can be done in the near term here, in the first, for first few years of the third party program so that uh, we can ensure that this program that we view as successful, we don't want it to fail after all the efforts that we put into it. Is there anything else is uh, within NIMPS that could help um, um, offset some of these increased costs, understanding that the industry will be taking on the video review and storage uh, responsibility, um, and, and, and they know that. Uh, but the way we're headed, we're going to be adding a pretty fair chunk of cost to the existing program to make it work under the regulation. So um, th thanks for allowing me to, to go on a little bit here, Mr. Chairman and, and Sam, but uh, just appealing to you if, if you have any ideas, if there's anything associated with cost recovery or anything that we might do to help lessen uh, the burden on, the, on, on a relatively small number of people, but um, it's a relatively small number, but it's a huge portion of our fleet, particularly in the in the whiting area and in our traditional ground fish places that are that are benefiting from this. And we're also, of course, hoping to use this as a model that could be used and expanded into other uh, sectors, other gear types. So, thanks. Mr. Chairman, it was not clear to me whether there was a question in there or not, um, but well, I am aware. Is. I am aware of the uh, the the lengthy discussions uh, that we have had. We've been working on this program for years, trying to transition it to a regulatory program. We delayed it for one year last year, such that it is due to be in place in January this year. And there's a number of significant events with uh, external providers that are coming up. And I know that our regional staff, the Science Center staff, continue to work extensively with all the parties to try to do what you suggested, to try to minimize cost, uh, to try to uh, answer all the questions as they arise, and we will continue to do so. So um, it is an issue that we continue to monitor, I continue to monitor, uh, I think that this recent uh, pandemic has indicated the importance of a viable electronic monitoring alternative. And uh, we continue to try to work to put this in place in a more permanent approach. So we'll continue to, 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 to work on this uh, as this year progresses. Thank you, Sam. Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for coming to talk to us, uh, Sam. As, as uh, I think you know, I'm a California council member, and our governor has issued his own 30 by 30 order. How do you envision coordination and timelines between the federal agencies and the states on 3030? Could you see that the states would forge ahead, ahead of federal, or, or how do you see that? Thank you. Yes, well, I can't speak at all to what the state of California may or may not uh, do. The timelines for the federal government is that the president set out this objective, which is 30, conserving 30, at least 30% 30 of U.S. land and waters by 2030. So that's not tomorrow, that's 2030. Um, and then task an interior, the interior department was submitting a report within 90 days of the executive order. The report is for to lay out a, some criteria, define where I anticipate interior defining what is meant by conserve. We talked about that already. That will let us gauge as to how close we are 
to those objectives, how much work we may have to do over the next nine years um, to meet those objectives and what kind of partnerships. I do envision at least uh, hearing from some of the statements made by the nominee for the Secretary of Interior that um, this is not a federal only effort, that they want to look at um, land conserved by other entities as well. So it may not have to be a national park or a national wilderness, federal wilderness area, but we would look at other kinds of things. So I do believe that by 2030, um, or, or there will be an acceptance of those, the interrelationship of those kind of programs into that, that it won't federalize all of the, this land or these waters. Um, but beyond that, I can't tell you how the timing would add up. Uh, the only thing I know is the timing of the initial interior report, which is 90 days from basically uh, January 20th. So uh, uh, May, did I get that right? Uh, February, March, April, April 20th. Through the chair, thank you very much, Sam. That, that really helps. All right, thank you. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you very much, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, and thank you very much, Sam, for being here with us today. I'm Maggie Summer, representing the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, it, the, the state of Oregon certainly has a lot of interest in uh, climate change and the impacts on our fish and wildlife resources. Some of the ocean specific effects, uh, uh, you know, ocean acidification and hypoxia in particular have been an area of focus for uh, ODFW and for others in the state of Oregon. We are uh, very appreciative of the chance to provide comments uh, and we'll be taking advantage of that both through the council and, and perhaps individually as a state uh, on this topic and um, look forward to uh, being active partners with the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, into the future on this. We certainly see a number of productive avenues for ways to improve our, uh, our management systems as well as the science and monitoring uh, in order to provide for resilient fisheries as, as requested. So just wanted to say thanks for being here and uh, we really look forward to future collaboration on this. Thank you. Uh, Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you uh, for joining us here this morning. I'm Marcy Uremko with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I noted in your introductory remarks uh, that uh, there is a um, new uh, focal priority on um, equity and under potentially that can include discussions surrounding underserved fishing communities uh, and small businesses, presumably um, uh, that are sport and commercial fishery uh, oriented. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit for us on uh, what upcoming um, priority initiatives uh, might be coming out of those discussions? Thank you, and I cannot give you many specifics. As I said, the executive order is broad and it does not mention fisheries specifically, although fisheries could be conceived of one aspect of how you would uh, go about doing things. Um, it is directed at the department level. So it is directed at the Interior Department, the Commerce Department, and in a sense, we have it needs to be translated down to us as to how that would actually work. So at the moment, there is nothing specific. But if you look at uh, what an underserved community is, there's different ways that you could characterize an underserved community um, in terms of diversity issues, in terms of economic issues. We, we look at, through the fishery service and the councils, we look at a lot of those things through the Magus and Stevens Act because we do have uh, a requirement to consider the effects that we have on communities and we, we have needed tools to address communities. We do have, within the fishery service, a social indicators working group and there is a national a database which you can access and which you could put in various parameters that uh, might be associated with environmental justice or 
underserved communities. And you can see that in many of these, in many of these criteria, a fishing community would be considered a underserved community. And uh, there is a significant overlap between that and various different definitions. So I imagine that we are going to be asked to look at um, the way we allocate benefits to fishing, the way we allocate fishing privileges to the extent that, um, you know, we have a number of limited entry per permits in which we have allocated fishing privileges. Has it been fair and equitable or is it accessible to all? Uh, it's expensive to 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 be a significant participant on a uh, in an ocean fishery three miles offshore. Um, there are things that we do that may advantage or disadvantage communities. A lot of these things we take into account anyway as we design the programs. I recall when you were designing the large ground fish catch share program off the west coast, there were a number of discussions about impacts on communities of just this very nature. So I'm not sure that this is new, but I do, uh, I do envision that we're going to be asked to look at uh, the way that we deal with that. I think we're going to be asked to look at the way we deal with disaster funds or the CARES Act funding uh, for COVID that we do with AI that are, is it being fair and equitably distributed? If not, are there ways that we can change to adjust that? So those are some of the things that I think we could be doing. At the moment, we do not have a clear uh, statement as to what we will be doing, uh, but those are some areas that I, I think that we are likely uh, to be acting in under this one, and we would be working with the councils uh, in that regard. Uh, further questions for Sam? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Sam. Thank you so much for being here and, and talking to us this morning. I'm Bob Dooley. Uh, council member from California. We heard this week uh, from science centers that there seems to be a disconnect in uh, in misunderstanding on the vaccination process uh, that's to get our our workers that are in the in the surveys and such vaccinated so we'll be able to con uh, actually conduct those those surveys this this year. Uh, you know that's critical importance to, to our fisheries and a high concern to our constituents here and council members as well. Uh, we heard from the Science Center that the federal government has no direct access to vaccines, so therefore they cannot have, uh, you know, come up with a way to get their, their workers vaccinated. That falls to the states. And we were also told that there, was, there were lists that were compiled of those by, by the Science Center's of those people that need to be considered essential and get vaccinations. Uh, but we also heard there was no communication to the states of that. And that is a great concern, I believe. And I think we need to open up the communications because I know here in California, if you're considered essential, it, there's access to vaccinations right now. And uh, I, I see that happening with our fishermen. I see it happening with a lot of our processing sector as well. And I think if, you know, if there's an inability for the federal government to have access to those vaccinations, we need to uh, at least get the, transmit to the states who those people are or who that group of people are and make it known that those are essential personnel so that they can proceed through their states to get vaccinated. And um, I guess my question here, is there any national outreach to make this happen? Has there been any discussions? And how do we how do we expedite this? Thank you for the question. I was not participant in the science center discussion, so I do not know exactly what they said. But the gist of it is largely correct, as you have uh, explained it to me. There is no I can't speak for the federal government as a whole. The Commerce Department has not been allocated, and certainly NOAA has not been allocated, any set of vaccines. So we have none, which means that, uh, as you indicated, to the extent that any Commerce Department or NOAA employee is getting vaccinated, he's doing it he or she is doing it because they meet the other cr criteria set out for, by the state to do that. 
We do have a list prepared where the states to ask us um, what would be our priority order. Uh, very few states have asked us to do that. Uh, so I, I, that is all I can tell you at the moment. There is no concerted effort to uh, have federal employees um, vaccinated at any higher priority than what a state would put on a government employee. Some states do. There is a, there is a place in most states' registries for government essential employees. I know like in Virginia, they haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, maybe they have in other states. Um, if the states do inquire of us as to what we believe are our essential list, we have them prepared. Um, but my understanding is the states have largely not inquired and are still at the earlier stages than looking at these uh, friends. But there is no set of vaccinations that the Commerce Department has access to um, that we would that we could distribute along that guidance. But if we were to get them, we have the guidance, we know who, who would get them first, but there aren't, there, there is no subset of vaccinations at this point. Mr. Chairman, a follow-up if I may? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for that, that answer, I appreciate it. I guess my other question would be, if you have the lists and is there is there a prohibition to work, to reaching out proactively to the states and identifying those personnel so that they might be able to include them. I mean, I'm assuming they might not know who they are. They might not know what, you know, the people that are, uh, they're, they're trying to include. And it, it just seems like there needs to be a, a linkage of the communication here. Not, I know, I realize that the federal government and Department of Commerce don't have direct access to those vaccinations, but it, um, it seems, seems odd to me that we're waiting for the states to reach out rather than proactively reaching out as critical as it is to get these people vaccinated. So that, that's the question. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, yes, if I could follow up, uh, thank you for the additional question. I am not personally uh, been involved in the communication with the states. I am under the impression that NOAA as a whole has made its list available to the relevant states. Um, to the relevant counterparts in the states, as I'm sure other federal agencies have. So I do not think there's a prohibition, and I think those lists have been shared with the relevant health departments of the various states. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for being here today. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Joe Oakman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. My name is Joe Spoken. I represent the tribal government with federally recognized fishing rights in this council. It is a pleasure to hear from you uh, this morning on this uh, objective of Climate change and its impacts on ecosystem and to tribal economies who depend upon land and waters are of interest to the Indian tribes. If tribes do plan on commenting on this, I expect that this could possibly occur through the council process and maybe through direct consultations. Uh, the question I have um, for you is, does this executive order acknowledge the federal treaty and trust obligations that the federal government has to Indian tribes, such as those I represent? Thank you for the question. I, I cannot say whether this executive order, which I don't actually have in front of me, I have a summary of it, uh, discusses the unique relationship we have with the tribes itself. Um, many statements of this administration have done so. And as I mentioned at the outset, um, there is a presidential memorandum on tribal consultation and strengthening nation to nation uh, relationships that have come out, that came out roughly at the same time. It reaffirms a number of existing policies that the federal government has regarding the tribes and it affirms the, our consultation obligation to federally recognized tribes. It directs agencies after consulting with the recognized tribes to prepare and submit detailed plans for implementing policies and directives of the uh, Obama administration's executive order of tribal consultation. That's once like the other one. That's at the Department of Commerce level, and so we will be working with the Department of Commerce. But there are numerous instances 
including that specific memorandum that reaffirms the consultation obligation and the unique nature of treaty rights. I cannot, I do not know whether or not there is such a statement in uh, Executive Order 14008 because I do not have it in front of me. There may be, but I do not know. Thank you very much for that response, and I appreciate that. Further questions? Uh, well, let me say I do have the executive order in front of me, and the tribes are not referenced expressly with regard to uh, subparagraph C or subparagraph A. Um, there's reference to other key stakeholders, but um, uh, I'm certainly hopeful that the Department of the Interior and the Department of Commerce will take into account the important role that the tribes have with regard to our uh, living marine resources. Um, not seeing any other, Joe is here. You have another question, Joe? Your hand is still up. Just wanna make sure I'm not jumping the gun. So, so I've got a, a couple of questions, Sam, if, if you don't mind. Um, subparagraph C is, is the responsibility of commerce and and that's principally why why you're here today to brief us and and we've talked about climate resilience uh, issues. Subparagraph A, the responsibility uh, is with the principal responsibility is with the Department of the Interior, <clears throat> but subparagraph under A A one uh, lowercase Roman numeral one um, does task the uh, Secretary of Commerce with soliciting input from uh, fishermen and other key stakeholders. So with regard to subparagraph, with regard to compliance with subparagraph A, to, to what extent is the Secretary of Commerce planning to solicit input um, from fishermen? And although regional councils are not mentioned there, I would note that that's a particularly useful resource for soliciting input. Yes, uh, thank you for that comment. And once again, I apologize for not having the executive order right in front of me. I thought I did. Um, I believe that that paragraph indicates that this is a task that the report should uh, include is a discussion of about how to solicit stakeholder involvement and support. And so I do not believe Interior intends to solicit, to solicit broad-based input ahead of their report. I think that the report will lay out the process for seeking input. But at the moment, we do not have that. So there's, there are two different things, as you mentioned, right? There's the report, which comes out in 90 days, which is going to be hard to solicit a great deal of input into that process. And then there is the long effort to try to uh, evaluate, monitor, uh, and achieve the objective, depending on how far away from the objective we are. And I imagine that the Commerce Department will be quite active in that second phase um, of soliciting input. And I will say that to the extent that the councils or stakeholders give us any input in our um, current solicitation, which is not directed necessarily at 30 by 30, but if, if we get any 30 by 30 input, we will forward those on to the Interior Department for inclusion in their process. Okay, thanks very much. And, and I guess, you know, we've been through this process uh, last year in the state of California, and it, 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 the process basically fell apart over the concept of protection and whether um, the uh, conservation practices under Magnuson uh, should even count uh, as protection, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, with the involvement of the Secretary of Commerce in this process that will uh, fully recognize the role that the Councils and the uh, Magnuson Act has historically uh, played in, uh, in conservation, noting that the executive order uses the term uh, conserve rather than uh, protect, protect being a means to accomplish that conservation. One other point I'd like to make, and this I think something sometimes gets lost um, when shifting from the terrestrial 
to the marine is that uh, terrestrial, uh, the terrestrial environment is essentially two-dimensional. Uh, it's the land, it's the surface. Uh, whereas in the ocean, you have the water column and then you have the benthic environment. And m much of the conservation efforts undertaken by the council with regard to essential fish habitat has to do with uh, protecting uh, corals and other important um, bottom features um, as essential fish habitat as a means to uh, conserving uh, biodiversity. So I just want to make sure that point is made. It, it's entirely feasible to uh, establish uh, conservation measures that do not uh, inhibit uh, otherwise um, responsible fishing practices higher in the water column. Anyway, that was my speech. <laughs> Sorry. All right, are there any further questions for uh, Sam Rauch? Mr. Chair, this is Chuck. Maybe I could uh, kind of wrap this up for Sam. I wish you would. Thank you. <laughs> well, Sam, <clears throat> thanks very much for your time and being willing to <clears throat> answer questions um, uh, on a, of a broad nature. Um, certainly appreciate having you here. Uh, I, I will just uh, want to particularly express my uh, thanks for you and for uh, for National Marine Fisheries Service uh, to uh, your commitment to weigh in on uh, uh, 216A2, the uh, proposing guidelines uh, for whether lands and waters qualify and mechanisms to measure progress. I think, uh, you know, that's probably the area where, where uh, the most angst is uh, for, for our constituents. Um, and so to hear that you're uh, uh, planning to take an active role, I think, is uh, very encouraging. Um, obviously, as, as Mark just mentioned, the marine environment is different than the terrestrial environment, and I don't think there's anybody better positioned to um, to weigh in on on uh, what should qualify and how to measure progress than uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and, and NOAA. Um, so um, I'm glad to hear that uh, that you are uh, going to take that on, and uh, and I think you'll be hearing from the council. Uh, shortly on our on our thoughts about that as well so um and then uh, as you mentioned we will be uh working with you on uh, talking about our uh plans and uh and progress on um making fisheries more resilient to climate change and look forward to uh working with you through that process as well so thanks very much sam thank you for having me all right and you're always welcome sam thank you all right, uh, well, let us move on with um, our agenda for the day. And we will start with agenda item G1, the NIMS report. And Todd, you have our overview. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So good morning, Council. Uh, this item is the first of all ground fish items for this particular meeting, G1, the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. So under this agenda item, it can be expected that, that the West Coast region will update the council on regulatory developments regu related to groundfish fisheries and other issues relevant to the council. They will, NIPS will also update the council regarding its workload and rulemaking plans for 2021. The Science Center will also discuss current groundfish related science and research activities for the council. So in your packet, you have three reports. You have a National Marine Fisheries Service report. You will have a presentation from Dr. Mosa Haltek um, from the Science Center. And then you have a gap report for your consideration. As usual, the action for the council under this agenda item is to discuss and give guidance as appropriate. And unless there are any questions, Mr. Chair, I am done with my overview. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Are there any questions for Todd on the overview? And not seeing any, so we will start with the NIMS report, and I'll call on Brian Hooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is, uh, this is Brian Hooper. I um, will be presenting uh, G1A under the, uh, the NIMS regulatory activities. So I'll just, give, I'll just give a quick summary of, of our, our regulatory actions and workload. For the 21-22 harvest specifications, those were published 
on December 10th, which, uh, which was record time. Um, this is a very heavy lift and we really appreciate everyone's work in making this uh, a successful action. The proposed rule for 2021 Pacific Whiting harvest specifications and tribal allocations um, is out. And I'll just note that comments are due March 18th. Salmon bycatch minimization measures um, are effective. The, the final rule is published and are effective uh, on March 23rd. For whiting groups interested in submitting salmon mitigation plans, we will be announcing official submission deadlines for 2021 via public notice. Uh, in the meantime, you'll, you can contact me, Brian Hooper. Um, I'm available for questions on, on the salmon mitigation plan requirements and can work with folks on, on draft plans. We also have three Paperwork Reduction Act renewals out for comment, with comments due in March. Um, they're on top of, they're on um, VMS, vessel marking, and gear marking topics. These are not uh, regulatory or enforcement changes. I just want to flag that folks can comment on these information collections and the associated burden estimates. We published our cost recovery fee percentages for 2021 in December. Um, and those are the, the ones that are in the NIMS report, but I have a couple items to flag um, for you all that were not included in this report. So the first being we're working on a correcting amendment for um, specifications package um, to correct some minor errors that were in harvest specifications and management measures final rule. Uh, the main one being uh, a fix to the rockfish conservation area waypoints for the 100 fathom depth contour. Uh, we, a, a waypoint was missing near the Mexican border. Um, we had left that out in the final rule. The waypoint has not changed. The correction is just gonna add it back into the regs. Um, yeah, and, and thanks, in the, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's other, other corrections, including um, uh, some, some corrections to the flatfish gear restrictions in the RCA, as well as the language describing the boundary lines for the depth contours and boundaries of the, the non-ground fish RCA for California halibut, sea cucumber, and ridgeback prawns south of 3427. Um, thanks to CDFW, Louis Sam, and others for bringing these to our attention. Specs was a huge lift, and we're still um, you know, prioritizing these specs-related actions to provide clarity uh, for the industry. And then we have one more correcting amendment to note uh, that's in development. In the emergency rule, we set up um, you know at the end of last year, we had set up temporary temporary regulations in a way um, that when it expired, the original regulation that sets out the season date was deleted. So um, we're working on a correction that would reinstate the original season dates. The retail sale of fish season dates of April 1st to October 31st. And then on page two of the NIMS report under this agenda item is um, our, our ground fish workload chart. And I'm sure we can we can reference that during our G2 discussions. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on this report. And I know um, Ms. Ames from NIMS also has an update on ground fish staffing. All right, thanks for that, Brian. Let's let's go to Kelly Ames, and then we'll take all the NIMS questions at once. So, Kelly. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Um, yes, as Brian noted, I did want to make a few announcements regarding our groundfish branch staffing. Uh, we are pleased to announce that Keely Kent has accepted the offer to be the next groundfish branch chief. Her start date is May 23rd. And in the interim, we wanted to just give you uh, an update on kind of the lay of the land on the staffing. So as you just heard from Brian Hooper, who was the acting branch chief starting in December. And he right now is working to transition the acting branch chief role to Aaron Steiner, uh, who most of you know from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. She'll be our acting branch chief through May. Um, additionally, we were very fortunate to uh, receive Stephanie Warpinski from the Alaska region on detail to be our catch share lead until May 1st. And you might be wondering why we have such a complicated staffing plan. Uh, we took this approach in recognition that the pandemic was exacerbating challenges for everyone who is trying to balance work and family obligations. So we were hopeful that this kind of creative approach in staffing would provide some relief. 
And that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Kelly. So let me see if there are any questions um, of Brian or Kelly on the NIMS report. Marcy Remco. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Brian and Kelly for your report. Um, I wanna reference Brian's discussion on uh, a correction that's not listed in the supplemental NIMS report on the rulemaking activities uh, a correction uh, that's necessary to um, make some fixes in the final specs rule to the RCA waypoints uh, at 100 fathoms, as well as um, a few other corrections uh, related to uh, flat fish provisions and uh, open, ac open access uh, trawl fishing activities south of conception. Um, I just really want to um, acknowledge and thank um, the uh, West Coast Region Regulatory staff for working with us uh, to get these corrections accomplished. Um, it's so important that our final rule uh, for our ground fish specs be accurate and um, have it be, you know, the single source of information for all of us to refer to uh, in our discussions with our commercial and recreational uh, fishery participants. So. Um, I know this was an extra thing to add to the list that was not anticipated by anyone. Uh, and I know um, that <laughs> adding something new to the list, um, even something that might not be too difficult um, in terms of write-up um, or analysis, it, it's still another thing on the list. So um, I really appreciate you prioritizing the specs. Um, it was a huge effort all the way around the last biennium to get as much into that initial package as we did. Uh, so I appreciate you prioritizing these kind of last hanging Chad pieces. Uh, my question is, um, do you have an anticipated publication date for that final correction? Through the chair, Mr. Remco, thank you for the question. We don't have a, an anticipated publication date at this time, but we're, hope, we're hoping soon. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, all right, uh, Marcy, your hand is up. Do you have another question? Nope, sorry. All right, no worries. Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> And uh, thanks, Brian and Kelly, for those uh, updates. Kelly, my question is uh, for you. I was wondering if you could give uh, give us a sense about, in terms of staffing, uh, re relative to the groundfish um, branch. Um, you know where you are. I, 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 there's been a lot of moving parts of you know in the last year or or more. And uh, I've kind of lost, to be honest, I've kind of lost track of, of where the staffing is in, uh, in that division, are you, or branch? Um, are you up to capacity? Do you have some vacancies that need to be filled? Just to give us, give us a sense of, of, of where you are in that. Um, and I know we've also talked about uh, the implications of trying to work within the environment that uh, the pandemic has created and um, and the um, impact it's had on the capacity of of divisions and branches such as this to to do uh, the quantity of work that it would be able to do under normal circumstances. So just, you know, we go through some of these agenda items today, including workload and some of the other ones have that are, are issues associated with the workload wanted to just, if you could give kind of a overview of where we are, where board NIMS is in that regard. Thanks. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Anderson. So. Our branch, chief, our branch for groundfish basically will consist of one branch chief and five staff. So that is 
you know, likely not enough to accommodate all of the workload the council has envisioned. Um, as I look at uh, the, you know, look forward to the G2 agenda item, um, we do not have any additional approved positions for hiring. So I would anticipate that one branch chief and five staff is the model for that branch moving forward. Um, and that, that is my best estimate at this time. Could, could I have a quick follow-up, sure. please? Go ahead, Phil. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, how does that compare to, to the past? I mean, is that is that about the same, or is that, is that the same as staffing levels that uh, that branch has had in the past? Could you think? Through the chair, Phil, th thank you. You know, I have not done a detailed analysis. It seems fairly constant compared to the past levels, um, but I can certainly dig a little bit deeper just to evaluate how that has changed over time. Okay, thanks. I wasn't looking for a detailed analysis. I just, sounds like you got about six staff positions there and just wondered how that compared to past times. Thanks. Through, through the chair. Please. Yes, thanks. I, I guess the one noteworthy part of that is, you know, promoting uh, Keely Kent to be the Groundfish Branch Chief. We are not able to backfill that position. So I suppose if you went back and compared it to a year ago uh, when Ms. Shamillo was the Branch Chief, you know, we would have had six staff positions plus one Branch Chief. So. It, it is a reduction of one uh, staff. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any further questions on the NIMS report? All right, thank you very much, Brian and Kelly. So we'll now, uh, I'll now call on Melissa Haltich for the, for a PowerPoint presentation on the MSC stakeholder outreach. Thank you, can you hear me? I can, we just wait, get, get pause for a moment to let the PowerPoint get loaded and then you can get started. All right, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, council members. Thank you for making time for me this morning. I wanted to provide a brief update on the Northeast Pacific Sablefish Management Strategy Evaluation uh, based on the outcome of the November 2020 meeting. And that is to primarily tell you that we have planned a stakeholder outreach workshop for April 2021, uh, and that's uh, in the works. Next slide, please. So just as a quick review of who we are, um, the Pacific Sablefish Transboundary Assessment Team began during 2016 as a, largely a scientific collaboration that includes Alaska Fishery Science Center, Department of Fishery Oceans Canada, the Northwest Fishery Science Center, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, over the last few months, we've expanded this collaboration to include uh, the Pacific Fishery Management Council and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. And recall that part of the motivation for this group was the concurrent long-term declines uh, in the sablefish stock across all regions. And uh, more recently, the uh, analogous big recruitment events that have been observed across all regions. And the fact that this is a straddling stock managed um, regionally, but we don't really necessarily have a routine mechanism for the exchange of information. So the PSTAT's focus is really looking at reanalysis of Northeast Pacific wide data sets across all regions. Uh, and we are responding in part to 2017 and 2018 discussions with the Council SSC that focused on developing a population model based on the biological stable fish stock structure. And so really our goal with this work is to evaluate any potential bias in the regional scientific advice 
that might be due to the spatial mismatch between the demographic population of the stock and uh, the current management boundaries. Um, and we're really focused on uh, advising regional management with the best scientific information available. Next slide. So with that aim, we've scheduled a MSC stakeholder workshop for April 27th through 29th. And the items in bold on this slide are the topic areas where we're specifically soliciting uh, stakeholder input. We will provide an introduction to MSC and stakeholder engagement so that all participants start with on a level playing field. And we'll also provide an overview of the operating model that we're developing for Sablefish, which is a, essentially a, the best representation of the true uh, biology of the stock as we can uh, come up with. So in response to November uh, council discussions, we have opened this workshop to participants from all regions. Uh, and we have also uh, hired a professional facilitator with council's help. Uh, we will uh, be, but we will be setting up a website that will be live uh, probably in the beginning of April that will be called PacificSableFishScience.org, which will have workshop registration. Uh, and we will allow for uh, varying modes of participation, both to fully participate in the workshop as well as a, kind of a listen-only mode for people that would like to be informed but not necessarily uh, fully participate. And yeah, at that workshop, we will be soliciting stakeholder input on fishery management objectives how we're going to measure those objectives quantitatively with performance metrics. Uh, and then we'll also spend some time discussing the proposed uh, MSC management strategies, as well as future alternatives for management strategy research for Sablefish. Uh, and with that, I'll close out and thank everyone for listening. Thank you very much. Melissa, are there questions for Melissa? So, shit. Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Melissa, for the presentation. It's it's exciting to see these uh, the workshop coming together and and all your efforts um, that you're you all are spending on this. That's great. Maybe just a quick a question on I'm not connecting the dots on how the uh, how your I think you said you're looking you're doing a reanalysis of 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 the North East Pacific wide data. And how does that, in short, how does that relate to what you'll be looking at in the management strategy evaluation? Could you, could you help connect that dot for me? Sure. So in the simplest form, to, to parameterize an operating model or, you know, a model that represents the best knowledge that we have about Sablefish, we need to do some basic reanalysis of data across all regions that have been investigated regionally, but have never been looked at on a Northeast Pacific wide basis. Two examples of those data sets are one for, how, uh, for growth, looking at how growth changes across the range for table fish and looking for biological breaks in growth. And we'll talk about that uh, as part of this operating model discussion. Uh, another is movement and both GFO and um, the Alaska Fishery Science Center have had extensive tagging programs over the years. Those data um, have not necessarily been analyzed as one large data set, and we are in the process of finalizing publications for that kind of work as well. So these basic looks at data across the range of stable fish will go into parameterizing that operating model. That will represent the true state of the system. And then we'll, for example, um, be able to look at how our regional management uh, processes play out given that true state of the system. Is that okay, Corey? Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Sure. Great. Uh, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gerlnick. Um, Melissa, if uh, I see the Workshop is from the 27th and 29th. Are those going to be all day, um, or are they going to be in the morning or afternoon? And, uh, and I ask that just because uh, it's out there a little ways and for planning purposes that people might want to attend. Uh, it'd be kind of good to know uh, what the uh, time frame is. 
Thank you. So the current discussion, and this has not been finalized, is to start the afternoon of April 27th and then uh, have a fuller day on April 28th and the 29th to um, probably the morning. Okay. So if there's feedback on timing, uh, we're certainly open to that. We have not yet finalized the agenda, but we are aiming to do so in the next week. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Corey, your hand, uh, you have another question? No, apologies. No worries. Uh, all right, are there any further questions? Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you. I hope to see or hear many of you at our virtual shop in April. I'm sure you will. Excellent. Um, we do have a gap report. Uh, I understand Jeff Lackey will be providing that. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council members. I'll be reading from agenda item G one C supplemental gap report one. Uh, the ground fish advisory sub panel received an overview from Dr. Kevin Warner, Mr. Craig Russell, Dr. Melissa Haltuck from the Northwest Fishery Science Center, and Mr. Brian Hooper of National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, and offers the following comments on ground fish surveys. The gap noted in our September statement and November statement that completion of all planned 2021 ground fish surveys is critical, particularly given the canceled 2020 surveys and incomplete 2019 ground fish surveys. 2021 is also very critical from the, for the Pacific Whiting Acoustic Survey since it is scheduled only in odd years and has the additional complexity of being coordinated between two government agencies. The September GAP statement requested a plan to be presented at the November Council meeting detailing how 2021 surveys would be completed in full and on time. The September GAP statement also included eight questions, uh, specific uh, questions related to this request. The November GAP statement noted disappointment that there was not a written report from NIMS in November with some responses to our questions. The November GAP statement recommended to the council, the council request a detailed plan and status update <coughs> made publicly by, made public by NIMS in January, and then a written update in report form and supplemental briefing book for the March council meeting. The GAP expresses disappointment that there are again no written responses to these questions and verbal responses are very, very general in nature. The GAP recommends the Council request a detailed update on status of survey plans from NIMS during April Council meetings. The GAP suggests that Council expectation, expectations be discussed in concrete terms during these March Council meetings so that the GAP, the Council, and NIMS all have an idea of what to expect to be presented by NIMS at the April Council meetings. In addition to the eight questions from the September report, it would be helpful to have included in the requested plan for the April Council meeting of what the expectations are for COVID-19 vaccines being offered to personnel involved in survey work. The GAP understands vaccines are being administered at the state and not the federal level, but that does not preclude NIMS from communicating with states in both requesting information and advocating for action. Some Oregon industry members have already been contacted with information that essential frontline workers will become eligible for COVID-19 vaccinations starting March 29th. So there are communications and planning already taking place, and hopefully NIMS can get plugged into that loop. The GAP would also like to know where the co cost savings from Council 2020 surveys, uh, like the payments made to survey vessels, are being applied and if they are being rolled over into 2020. 21 survey budgets. The GAP notes that fishery participants across various sectors are open to help provide context to fishery data to help fill gaps, data gaps from missing 2019 and 2020 survey data. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thanks very much, Jeff, for the GAP report. Let me see if there are any questions from council members on your report. I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. And that takes us to public comment. 
I believe there are uh, two public comments uh, on this agenda item. The first will be Michelle Robinson, followed by Heather Mann. Welcome. Great. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning, uh, Chair Gorelnik and Council members. Uh, my name is Michelle Robinson. I'm formerly uh, Michelle Culver and formerly uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife representative on the Council. I uh, am the principal of Ocean Beat Consulting, and I am testifying today on behalf of my clients, which are the Fishing Vessel Owners Association and uh, Bessaker Company. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. We strongly support the Council's consideration of appropriate conservation measures to ensure a healthy, harvestable sablefish population for the long term uh, and appreciate the initiative of the Council, National Marine Fishery Service, and the Pacific Sablefish Transboundary Assessment Team in moving forward with a management strategy evaluation uh, for sablefish, Northeast sablefish. We have considerable experience with the International Pacific Halibut Commission's MSC process, and we understand that such processes can take considerable time. We also know that there can be a relatively steep learning curve for stakeholder participants as they become familiar with a new process that includes uh, some new terminology, uh, management structure, and a modeling platform. As such, we would encourage the council uh, or NIMPS or the PSTAT uh, or everyone um, involved in this to consider establishing a Sablefish MSC advisory group with balanced stakeholder representation across all sectors, year types, and geographic areas to ensure continuity throughout the process. However, we also recognize that unlike the International Pacific Halibut Commission, there is not a single management entity um, for the Northeast sablefish population. Um, so it's perhaps uh, with the PSTAT, uh, having a structure on the scientific side, uh, there's perhaps lacking a structure for the management side. So no overall management entity to coordinate um, across this broad geographic area. So we would suggest that the council consider how um, it might uh, reach out and coordinate with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council at a minimum, uh, and also consider how to coordinate um, with DFO Canada um, on uh, perhaps the management side um, of the MSC process. So uh, that said, um, regardless of whether a formal advisory group is established, uh, we intend to actively participate in the Sablefish MSC process, and we would encourage any stakeholders who care about the future of Sablefish management to do the same. We have submitted a comment letter for the record that describes our thoughts in more detail about this. And I thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and welcome back to the council. Uh, it's good to hear you. Maybe at some point we'll all meet in person. Um, let me see if there are any questions uh, from the council members on your public comment. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. Um, and then um, Heather Mann, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, council members. My name is Heather Mann. I am uh, here on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. As I said in my public comment um, last week, the inability to get work scheduled and completed was a problem prior to COVID. And now in the last year, it's become even more difficult to get things done um, with the pandemic. And while I know the situation is stressful, you know, for NIMS employees, um, I'm still really troubled by where we're at. I listened carefully to Kelly earlier 
talk about the creative thinking to assist government employees with balancing their family and work. And uh, my observation is that while it might have been providing benefits uh, toward family time and balancing that difficult balance, um, it doesn't seem to be helping with getting you know, work completed. And that's just an observation, it's not a judgment, but many of us in the industry, we don't have that same luxury. You know, we're working overtime during the pandemic, we're working 24 seven, we're balancing our families and home life requirements. Um, honestly, just ask my children about my home skill, uh, homeschooling skills, it's, uh, they're non-existent. Um, at the same time, the industry has taken on huge expense to be safe during COVID from testing and quarantining and putting people in hotels. And I mean, across the industry, it's uh, in the millions of dollars if you include all the sectors, including the processors. Um, and that's above and beyond the usual, you know, trying to make a living in the fishing business. So I have uh, just a couple comments here. Um, in the North Pacific, where I also participate, since my boat's uh, fish in Alaska, they're currently working on four emergency rules, which were recommended by the council in February. At the same time, they have at least three large FMP amendment packages currently in process. Nothing's been delayed. Uh, they haven't said that the council uh, work needs to be delayed because the NIMS workload is too much. You know, they don't force stakeholders to trade off priorities in order to get things done. So my question is, what are they doing in that region that allows them to absorb that workload and produce results? And also in that region, they're doing both ground fish and crab specifications every year. Um, so there's got to be something to learn there. Um, maybe now that Stephanie is down here from up there, she can help uh, figure out what's going on, I, I hope. But, um, you know, there's just a stark difference between that region and this region. Um, and then the second is the spreadsheet that's in G1. Really was excited about that when Asia uh, first introduced it and it was really helpful, but it's becoming less helpful. Um, for example, Justin Kavanaugh is listed as the staff working on EM, EFPs, and it's shaded for 12 months of the year. Well, Justin's on paternity leave. Um, his response on his email doesn't say when he'll be back. Um, and I believe it doesn't take 12 months of work out of the year to do the EMEFPs. I know there are a significant amount of work when they're first being issued, but um, you know, I have a hard time believing that that's 12 months out of the year, a lot of work. Um, and now almost every square in the spreadsheet is shaded. So I'm really wondering how to judge workload. Um, it's helpful to know who's working on what, but it's not giving us a good idea of, of what, the, what the workload is. And then uh, for closing, just bear with me a second. You know, Sam got me thinking in his comments earlier. You know, I and other stakeholders, um, we met with Sam in December of 2012. And one of our messages at that time was the inability to get work done. And I pulled up an email that we had sent him as a, you know, thank you in summarizing the meeting. And it said, quote, even when the council takes final action on an item, NIMS is having trouble implementing these recommendations due to a lack of human and financial resources. And the action is delayed months and sometimes years, equating to an increased and continued burden on the industry. Eight years later, we're still in the exact same place. And I feel like we were here even before COVID. So my message is that I and many other stakeholders, we're really losing confidence in this process. And um, we'd like to help things be better. Um, you know, we thought we were doing that with the mothership uh, issue, doing a lot of the scoping, putting stuff together. Um, it just, everything is taking so long and this is not sustainable and it's just, uh, it's not fair to the industry, not just the trawl industry who has all those additional costs I talked about last week, but across the board to the recreational industry, the fixed gear industry, all of us, um, there's, there's gotta be a better way. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but, uh, you know, I think it's important to know that. People are losing confidence in this process. Thanks for that.
Thank you very much, Heather. Are there questions for Heather? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we all, uh, so that, that concludes uh, the verbal public comment on agenda item G1 and takes us back to our council action here, which is discussion and guidance as appropriate. Um, so I know we'll get more into workload in the next agenda item. Um, so let's talk about any discussion or guidance on G1. I'm not seeing any hands. Does that mean that um, we're fine with the reports and we, we're going to keep our powder dry for now? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It just meant I was slow tapping the mute button. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on actually uh, one of Heather's comments about the table in the NIMS report under this agenda item. And I will say that I had a similar thought uh, when I when I looked at this table that Boy, it sure looks like a lot of a lot of these cells are colored in, and and uh, I I wonder if that is just a, maybe an indication that there could potentially be work done on that item during that month, et cetera. Uh, but I guess I would just maybe say let the National Marine Fisheries Service know that um, I agree if there is some potential in future versions of this to to uh, do any refinement that might help us all understand the workload and the timing of it uh, for NIMS capacity better, I would find that helpful. Thank you, Maggie, for that suggestion. Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to say that uh, the devil's in the details and that we have to continue to really, really read uh, our supporting materials. I, I was actually quite embarrassed uh, when it was brought to my attention by the fishery participants that we had left out that, uh, that one waypoint. We, we should have seen that much earlier. And I really want to thank uh, the department for getting their uh, AIS, whatever it's called, uh, anyway, they're mapping people uh, going on that, and uh, they really pulled out all stops to get it uh, get it done by March 1st for recreational. Uh, we were fortunate that the uh, commercial fleet didn't seem to be affected down here in San Diego. So um, I guess it's my promise to try to, to read in those details that if I had seen that one thing, which was patently obvious, and mapped it out, uh, we would have caught it and, and saved some. So I, my thanks to the... Uh, the California Department of Wildlife, and my thanks to uh, the Northwest, I mean, yeah, Northwest Fishing Fishery Center uh, ground fish staff for getting that done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Louie. As they say, the devil's always in the details. Mercy Remco. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, I, I think the credit really belongs uh, with the West Coast region staff that uh, made the extra effort to. Um, get a plan in place uh, to work on a correction uh, rule. Um, it's a whole extra regulatory workload. And uh, there was no one identified to do it uh, because there was transition in the uh, GMT staffing and uh, the regulatory um, staff load. So um, just a, a big thanks to NIMFs for coming up with a, a solution um, to get that done. And we look forward to its publication. Um, I also want to note that, you know, the work done to get the final rule uh, completed in the first place was a heroic lift. And I want to really make sure we um, send our compliments to NIMFs for getting the rule effective by January 1. Um, that has been 
a longstanding priority for the council and we've conveyed that and made that clear and with all of the content that we put in the specs package um, that was no small lift so um, just want to really acknowledge that um, you know NIMS has has upheld their end of the bargain on that front and um, I think we really need to make sure that we stop and acknowledge that um, I also feel like just generally speaking the rule effectiveness um, has been greatly improved. We aren't waiting two and three years for rules to become effective. We've seen things by and large um, move ahead on time. Um, yes, there are certainly some confounding factors, uh, particularly at headquarters with timing that comes with um, ability to get rules published and implemented and reviewed at the headquarters levels and um, I appreciate West Coast region staff that have really bird dogged the rules that we have asked them to prioritize and get done, um, that they've worked very hard um, with their uh, colleagues in the East Coast to um, essentially have a seamless process to getting those rules um, effectively completed and implemented. Um, we put a lot on the regulatory list last year. When you think back to the in-season actions and the requests for um, significant um, additions to the list and, and emergency rules. Um, there has been, um, I feel like, a very um, concerted effort on the part of NIMS to really respond to what we have told them are our key uh, priorities, especially in light of um, that the changes needed to our priority list in response to the pandemic. So um, I'm not losing confidence in the process. Uh, I appreciate um, all the work that NIMS does to, um, to make our priorities a reality. And I look forward to more discussion on this uh, in the upcoming agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Any further council discussion on this agenda item? All right, uh, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Gromick. Um, I had a long discussion last uh, last night about this very issue with an uh, industry member, and um, and I agree with the comments about the uh, the matrix or the list we have here. Um, when you fill all the boxes, it doesn't do much good. Um, I don't think that the uh, you know, NIP staff is uh, is not working hard, um, but I'm just wondering if there's a way to work. Um, I don't say smarter, but I mean. If we're more maybe more efficient, maybe at um, at uh, how things are done, and I'm uh, I'm wondering if um, it maybe ought to review. Are we doing? Are we over analyzing stuff? I think paralysis by analysis. Um, are we um, are we are we doing more than is needed? And I know we always tend to err on uh, the conservative uh, management and try to cover every box. But sometimes I don't. I don't know if that's necessarily needed, um, and maybe it's maybe a discussion for some time later or a different time. But um, I wonder if we ought to analyze really: um, are we over overthinking this? And uh, because I think that people's time is valuable, and I don't think we should be in you know meetings all day long when we don't have to be. Um, and if there's a way to uh, move things quicker. Um, that'd be great. Um, Listen to Marcy's comments. I think I, I do agree with her. Things are way better than they were uh, because things were pretty bad a few years ago. And I thought the staff did a great job of turning that around. But that doesn't mean it can't be better. And so uh, because uh, um, uh, there's a lot of people working out hard out there. And but I think we need to make sure we're not having people doing things needlessly. And if there's a way to uh, improve the process, I think we ought to be looking at that. So but. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I say I'm not, not going to comment that people aren't working hard because I believe they are, but I think we need to make sure we're limiting the amount of stuff we need to do and uh, by still fulfilling our obligations. So, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Any further discussion around the table? Todd, how are we? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm looking. I believe we're, we've covered all of the reports and public comment, and the council has had some discussion. 
So I would say that uh, you have completed your tasks for this agenda item. All right, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Council. That will conclude agenda item G1. It will take us to agenda item G2. Um, just a short little agenda item, I'm sure. Um, we have got a long day ahead of us. We're a bit behind schedule, so we'll take a 10 minute break here. We'll be back at 9.55.
All right, it's uh, 9.55. Um, we've got uh, no, no time to waste here, so we'll get started on G2. Um, someone's mic is open, and I don't know who's that is, who that is, but I've been hearing noises through my computer, and I know that it's coming from somewhere, somewhere in the ether. Um, but before we get started on G2, I just wanted to check in with uh, Chuck Tracy and see how salmon is looking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, they are. Uh, I haven't heard haven't heard any requests yet for uh, uh, specific timing. So um, uh, I'll check in again here uh, shortly. But um, so so far, no feedback. All right. Um, Thank you. So, all right, G2, workload and new management measure priorities. Todd, please get us started. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning again, Council. So this is agenda item G2, workload and new management measures priorities. Under this agenda item, the Council is scheduled to discuss the 2021 groundfish workload, new management measure pro proposals, and prioritized measures for development as appropriate. This agenda item is intended to provide a dedicated time whereby stakeholders can propose new ground fish management measures to the Council for their consideration. The Council should review and, as appropriate, revise the existing list of proposed ground fish management measures. The GMT has provided a report, which is agenda item G2A, GMT report 1, that includes their current workload, the previously prioritized measures, and an up-to-date list of all groundfish management measure proposals the Council is considering. Additionally, at this meeting, the Council should consider confirming its prioritized measures for development this calendar year. If the Council determines that the 2021 priorities and workload are appropriate, no new items should be prioritized at this meeting. Instead, the Council could consider scheduling work for these items to be completed. Um, for example, uh, on your prioritized list, you have the whiting utilization, which we'll be discussing under the next agenda, or excuse me, G3, and the non trawl scoping item, which will be discussed in April. Noting that this process is still relatively new, I, am, I have provided a summarized version of the process, which is under G2, attachment one, and I'm prepared to give a presentation for it as well. One thing for the council to consider that is not on the situation summary, but is germane to the prioritization process is the open comment letter that was provided by the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative, Aleutian Spray Fisheries, the fishing vessel Linda, Lisa Melinda, Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, and United Catcher Boats, where they have asked the council to consider recommending to National Marine Fisheries Service implementation of an emergency rule to allow at-sea whiting processing platforms to operate both as a mothership and a catchy processor in this calendar year. <clears throat> cost recovery. Based on their concerns with the current cost recovery process, the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel, or GAP, proposed in their September 2020 National Marine Fishery Service Report Statement, which was Agenda Item C1A, GAP Report 1, from September 2020, that the Council should consider re-establishing an ad hoc cost recovery committee and convening a meeting. In that report, the GAP noted specific objectives for the meeting to include establishing a pre-catch share price, pre, excuse me, pre-catch share cost baseline matrix, determining which costs are recoverable, and providing input into cost recovery fee calculations. National Fisheries Service responded to the GAP's request in November 2020, acknowledging their willingness to participate. However, they did request that the Council consider if this task was a ground fish priority for 2021. Under this agenda item, the Council has the opportunity to consider if the GAPS request should become a 2021 ground fish work priority in light of its existing workload. 
If the council pr prioritizes this item, discussion of the committee's membership and charge should occur under the cost recovery agenda item at the 2021, excuse me, April 2021 meeting. <clears throat> In your reference material, you have an attachment which is the basic process of this agenda item, a PowerPoint, which I'm prepared to give. You have a National Marine Fisheries Service report. You have a report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The GMT has provided two reports, and the GAP has one report. Uh, it looks also like a SAS report has come in um, and should be in your packet or in your inbox as well. Um, with that, looking to your action today, your action is to review the list of proposed projects, amendments, and new fishery management measures, consider overall groundfish workload, and provide guidance on groundfish management measure priorities and schedules. And with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my overview. I am happy to take any questions or roll into a PowerPoint. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Todd. And under the uh, list of council action, I guess, uh, in view of uh, what we heard during uh, open public comment will be also consideration of uh, whether to place on the agenda later in the meeting uh, an emergency action. So, um, with that, let's let's see if uh, there are any questions on your overview, and if they're not, we'll move to your staff presentation. So I'm not seeing any hands. Your overview is so comprehensive. Um, so why don't we bring up that PowerPoint presentation and you can give us uh, a refresher here on what we have before us. Okay, you should be seeing a blue screen that says workload and new management measure, proce measure process review. It's there. Oh, good. Just want to make sure. Okay. So my basic goal really is just to reacquaint the, count, reacquaint the council with this particular process, noting that really in terms of the ground fish world, it's still a relatively new method. And obviously the last time that council took this measure uh, or this agenda item up was in September of last year. And hopefully this review will hone in on what needs to happen today and will allow, uh, potentially allow some questions to be asked as well. So, my plan really here is just to give a high level overview of what the objectives are for this, this particular step in the process and finish up um, talking about a little bit about the council tasks today, as well as what the current status is of measures on the proposed list, as well as those measures that were previously prioritized. Okay. So this is what the, the circular nature or the cyclical nature of this process is intended to look like. Um, the original intent really was to create a standalone agenda item where the council could take a holistic look at proposed management measures in light of existing commitments, and then elevate, or I guess a better way to say this, prioritize certain proposals for development. It was also really designed to provide a single agenda item where stakeholders, advisory bodies, council members could all propose new management measures instead of having those ideas coming in under different and multiple agenda items. So I'm just trying here with the slide to, to show this cyclical nature of in March, which is of course this meeting, is the annual prior, prioritization. And then the subsequent um, meetings, the June, September, November meetings would be check-in meetings. Now, in terms of floor time, it was envisioned that the annual prior, prioritization would be the longer agenda, agenda item, where the council would consider updating um, and review, revising the proposed management measure list, prioritize measures for development, and that would be in light of all of the other council uh, groundfish commitments, and then schedule those items for work another year at a glance um, under the future meeting agenda item. And I'll come back here to a little more detailed look at annual prioritization in a second in the next slide. Um, the second step under these other three meetings here, the check-in meetings, is that these were going to be brief check-ins, and it would be where the council could hear new proposals and update the list as necessary, and 
if necessary, reprioritize items to fit into such new items as uh, like an emergency rule. For example, if an emergency rule were, were to come in under one of these check-in meetings, it could be prioritized ahead of all the other elements that the council would be working on for ground fish. So March. So in terms of what is, is envisioned for this particular meeting is that like in all ground fish workload and new management measures priority um, agenda items is that new measures could be proposed. And again, these come from stakeholders, council members, advisory bodies. And we do have several new measures for your consideration um, under this agenda item. And I don't want to steal the thunder of a GMT or GAP, but uh, they are coming. So the task then for the GMT and GAP really are to look at the management measure list from last year and they're in view, revise and update as necessary. So this could include um, removing measures, adding measures of appropriate, um, that sort of thing. And then if new measures did come in, the GMT would do what is considered like a cursory scoping, so which basically just to provides um, an overview of what the project is or the proposal is, excuse me, um, potentially some other information like you know, workload considerations, uh, what tasks would, might need to be done under that particular proposal. So just a, a basic cursory information for the council to consider as they work through um, the item. And then the GMT and GAP would provide recommendations to the council as to should items be added, should items be removed, and other items, other uh, issues related to prioritization. As far as what the council would do under this item is that you would consider then this, these revisions or these potential revisions to the list. You could update the updated, or excuse me, you could adopt the updated list um, that would be provided by the GMT. Um, then you could prioritize items for work if appropriate, noting that um, in light of all the other commitments that prioritization of new measures may not be uh, applicable at that particular time. And then, of course, um, after you've, you've done the first three there, you could direct the gap in GMT to develop measures as appropriate. So, so my final slide here is just to give you um, a current status of where we are. So as the council is probably well aware, we have four items right now on the priority list. So we have the mothership utilization, which we will be scoping later today under G3. At the next meeting in April, we'll be scoping non troll RCA modifications and then moving the Emily Platt EFP into regulation. And then we did have the, a question here about the troll non troll Amendment 21 allocations. When the council set these priorities, this was one of them. However, we did deal with um, several species in, under the specs process for the 21-22 biennium in which uh, we changed, I think, three or four, if I recall correctly, species from Amendment 21 allocations to biennial allocations. So the question to the, before the council is, could we consider this project, this priority project, uh, completed, or should it go back? Uh, should we consider it still a priority? Um, in your list at present, you have 14 proposals that are unprioritized management measures. And then you've completed, since the inception of this particular uh, agenda item, you've completed five measures, and that's included last year, two emergency actions. And with that, it's, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I have additional slides to um, describe the process as necessary to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Todd. Questions uh, for Todd? on the overview of the task ahead of us. I briefly saw a hand, but it went down. Nope. Uh, back up, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation, Todd. Just a question for you on that very last slide on the current status, status prioritized proposals. Um, I think I, I keep running into trouble in that I look at different lists of what is on the work plate right now. And depending on who authors the list, the list looks slightly different. We see a list of ongoing workload, GMT workload uh, 
which has a number of additional items. We see um, then app their appendix two, which you reference um, in agenda item G2A, the, the GMT report one. Um, they have other items on the list as well, in addition to these prioritized proposals. They also list, if I'm looking at their appendix two, table A, the prioritized measures. I see mothership sector utilization. I see non trial RCA modifications, moving Emily Platt, EFP into regulations. I see the gear switching and trawl sablefish area management item, which I don't see on your list. And then I see um, the fixed gear catch share review item on this list on the GMT's list, but also isn't on your list. And then meanwhile, again, the, the GMT has other items on their workload that really aren't part of this prioritization list, like the humpback uh, biop item, which really isn't optional. So I'm hoping you can maybe explain um, why in your list you only have these few items, but yet there are more prioritized items on the list and how, we're, how we should be thinking about that as we move forward through this agenda item. Through the chair. Thank you, Ms. Uranko, for the, the question. Yes, list upon list. Um, I will, the GMT does have a, a discussion about that. But um, to answer your question, the reason I selected the first four, so that would be in this case, looking at appendix two on page two of the GMT report, uh, A1, A2, A3, A4, I guess they're out of sequence there. Is the reason I selected those is that these were the four that the council did prioritize in its original prioritization exercise in 2019. The other two, A4 and A5, are items that have come up or were being developed at the time, and they were um, either one, for example, like the fixed gear, um, which would be A5, the fixed gear catch share review, is an MSA requirement, so that um, it just takes priority um, over uh, other items. And for, as for A4, I believe that process has just been ongoing, so the, the GMT wanted to show that, you know, in terms of workload, this is what they were working on. I do, however, note, Mr. Renko, that um, these lists are confusing, um, and we did discuss this particular issue in the GMT, and we're devising a better strategy so that it can be streamlined and that um, it presents, I guess, information uh, in a, a standardized fashion is what I, I think I, I want to get at. Um, but those are the rationale why I have four, four on listed on my my slide here, and then A four A five are um, they weren't prioritized as part of the priority project or pri the original prioritization process. Um, and yes, so I hope that answers your question. The GMT um, is likely prepared to discuss this as well. Thank you. Okay. Marcy, did you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that explanation, Todd. I, I guess I would just also flag that under your uh, header there titled completed, uh, you're listing five measures, including two emergency actions. And I look at the GMT Appendix 3 table of items completed through the process, and I, I only see four. So I, I think, yeah, there's certainly worth some discussion on this that I think will come will fit better later. So thank you. Uh, Butch Smith. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm being kind of the newer guy, kind of playing catch up on these different things, especially in the ground fish world. But I have been around a, a little bit um, around the council process. and. You know, every year we're asked to to make new lists and new priorities, and uh, but I, I've never really. It would help me if we would see the old list of priorities, kind of like we're we've done here, and how close 
they are to completion. Are they 10% complete? An estimate. Are they 50% complete or they're almost complete? Because if we had a priority of last year at this time to do A, B, and C, and those are far from done, and then we then we add another layer of priorities on the list, it doesn't give us a, a, a good indication how close we are to getting done the 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 lists that um, that we set a, set for the prior year, and so we're compiling lists upon lists upon lists, and you know, are are we are we in ourselves uh, slowing down the process by by doing that? That that's I guess a statement, or there might be a question in there, and you know, and back to to Miss Mann's uh, testimony earlier under the um, prior. Uh, uh, agenda item. Uh, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I heard uh, Mr. Ryan Wolf last year say that, you know, because of COVID and at that time, you know, in September or March or November when he made that statement of the staff being able to work at 60, around 60% because of all the, all the stuff was going. I totally understand because we, we do have a great Great staff all the way through this process. No, no, no doubt about that. Hard work and dedicated. But, but as we're as we're coming out of COVID, you know, we can't meet personally. But there's a lot of things that have been done. You know, inoculations and and different things that have have made uh, it possible. You know, to uh, do things. Um, uh, that we couldn't do last year at this time, or no, excuse me, last uh, April and through November. Uh, and and so I, I'm just wondering, as that starts to loose off stuff, is NOAA staff and staff going to be able to, you know, get back towards that uh, well-oiled machine that they, 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 they were before before COVID? So I guess that's a couple things, but but my my main concern is if we don't see or at least myself. Maybe I'm the only. Maybe I'm the only one on here that 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 uh, is uh, confused by this, or at least would like to like to see uh, how close are we are to completion on some of the things that we've given them in prior years before we add another layer of list. So um, I, I know that that would help me. And and sorry if I uh, sorry if I've accused, confused the situation, but uh, that 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 would really help me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But Todd, do you have a response to anything that uh, Bush said there? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can attempt a response. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the comment. And I perceive a question there, Mr. Smith. Um, so what I'm hearing is you base you would instead of making a new list to show the old list, is you would like to see potential uh, some sort of I don't know column or some sort of description. Uh, that states, you know, of steps one through seven, we are at step two, or something that gives an indication as to how far along we are in the process, when it could be reason potentially even reasonably expected to move forward. Is is that what I'm hearing from you, Mr. Schmidt? Uh, let, let me just let me just interrupt here just for a moment. Uh, perhaps this is a matter that could be saved for council discussion rather than a question on the presentation that Todd just provided. Um, I, I, go ahead, Butch. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I, I will yield the floor if I've, uh, if I've jumped ahead, but, uh, um, and, and I won't say anything more unless, unless you uh, allow me to answer that question. So I, I'm, I'm apologize, Mr. Chair, if I've, if I've made uh, a, no, no, a Butch, mistake. I, you, you raise a very good point, and it's a good question. Why why we don't see that? Um, whether we want to see it, we can we can discuss that, um, and maybe in council discussion. But do you have another question on the presentation? I, I just wanted to say, Mr. Chair, that that uh, um, Todd, Todd was on on the on the right track with my with my question without getting into discussion. So. Um, uh, E e even a simply a, a percentage of Todd, how close you guys are to completion would be be easy because I don't want to compound and slow down progress. But you have to make you know reports on how close we how close you are onto items. So uh, uh, estimation of 
50, 60, 70, 80% complete would be, to me, would be awesome um, and would help me a lot. Um, so, I, and once again, Mr. Chair, I apologize. No, no apology necessary, Butch. Uh, further questions? Um, I, I've got one. Uh, Todd, you indicate that, um, well, you know, the, with the question mark, that uh, perhaps the uh, Amendment 21 issue may be completed. Um, my recollection is that it was deprioritized and not completed. Can you can you help me understand that? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I recall, yes, it was. Now I'm remembering it was deprioritized. However, I think the we were because we it was still on this. <laughs> the list, I guess, is we the GMT and I had questions or whether or not um, the council would consider the entire item complete or if it would were to remain deprioritized, um, meaning it would stay on the list, just ready to move as necessary. So I, I I think I can interpret the deprioritization as not completed, but and ready for future action as necessary. All right, thanks. And we'll we'll obviously take that up during during council discussion. Uh, are there any further questions of Todd? Thank you, Todd, but of course don't go too far away. Uh, our next report uh, is the NIMS report, and I'll ask Brian Hooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council. Good morning again. This is Brian Hooper. I will be uh, reading Supplemental NIMS Report 1. The, the National Marine Fisheries Service offers the following information for consideration under Agenda Item G2. Our focus continues to be meeting, to be meeting our mandates under the Magnuson-Stevens Act and Endangered Species Act, as well as prioritizing actions that keep the fishery running, uh, such as specifications and in-season. The Council previously prioritized mothership sector utilization, exempted fishing permits, stable fish gear switching, and non-trawl actions. We have not yet been able to staff all of these priorities due to our existing workload related to MSA and ESA mandates, as well as staffing changes. And I would point you to our, our report one under P1A. We do not support prioritizing new items at this time unless existing prioritized items are deprioritized. Additionally, with, uh, with new harvest specification cycle starting, as well as an MSA required catch share program review for the primary civil fish fishery, the council will need to carefully consider the timing of continued progress for uh, the, the previously prioritized actions. We would not be able to support all these actions moving forward at this time. We can engage over the summer to support a limited number of items under council consideration in preparation for the September and November council meetings. We recommend the council conduct a holistic workload assessment, including consideration of those items previously identified, along with uh, any, emerging, any emerging issues, taking into account potential Im, uh, implementation timelines, um, which we which, which summarize in table one. In particular, more information is known about uh, the potential pathways and timelines to address mothership sector utilization. That's agenda item G3, uh, since the last prioritization discussion in September 2020. We would appreciate the council guidance on uh, prioritizing of the prioritization of the ad hoc cost recovery committee. We know that there is substantial overlap between the staff that work on catch area priorities, um, the whiting, whiting utilization, SAMTAC, and electronic monitoring. Um, so timing of the committee discussions should be taken into account with the other ground fish priorities. And then in table one here, we summarize uh, the expected rulemaking implementation timelines. And then just a couple of notes for you on table one. The, the timelines are our best guess on what is needed from a rulemaking standpoint after the council takes final action. The ESA consultation process is an unknown factor that may extend the time frame for the actions at the bottom of table one, which consider changing the season start date or whiting. The, the top three rows in table one, uh, that's, that'd be like uh, specifications, non-trial logbooks, and the next steps on the humpback whale biological opinion. Our actions NIMS sees as needing to uh, complete in order to meet our MSA and ESA obligations. On the humpback whale uh, biological opinion next steps, uh, I know we're gonna get more into details um, in April, 
But uh, from a workload planning purposes or standpoint, uh, we anticipate the need for pre-work and coordination with industry and the GAP in 2022. There is a feasibility study that will need to be completed by March 2023, and the findings will need to be given consideration by the council for potential changes to pot gear marking regulations uh, by March 2024. And, and that, Mr. Chair, uh, concludes my, my report. Thank you, Brian. Are there questions for Brian on the NIPS report? Bob Dooley, followed by Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian, I just have a question on the non troll logbooks. You say that they're required by biological opinion. Do you know, are you, are the, is the logbook being developed electronically or how is that being done? I know there was a, a desire to proceed to electronic logbooks, but I just was curious, do you, is, do you know that? Yes, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Um, Yes, we do have. Um, yes, we, yes, we are. We are working on an electronic, an electronic logbook, and we have um, um, FIS funds to do that. Thank you, uh, Marcy Remco, followed by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Brian, for your report. A question on the very last item in your table. It says whiting EFPs, plural. Uh, season start date and processing south of 42. Estimated timeline of 12 months. Uh, you're recommending out of cycle EFPs, meaning do not include the EFPs in the specs action due to the analysis needed. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, we have our regular cycle EFPs scheduled. Uh, to come to us for a first crack in September of 2021. Um, kind of reading the language here, uh, it sounds like you're suggesting that it might take longer to do these EFPs, so they need to come earlier than the normal cycle of EFPs. So I'm hoping you can just kind of clarify a timeline as to when um, those items would be added to a list which I, I don't not confident they're on a list, but if they were added to a list, um, when they would need to be scheduled, um, since you're recommending they not be in cycle. Yes, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Remco. Um, to clarify that that yes, um, I think we'd be looking. Our recommendation would be for um, September. To look at those and prioritize with all the other EFPs desired in the specifications. Uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, I, I believe. Thank you, um, Brian. I believe we have September as the date that the regular cycle EFPs are scheduled to come to us first. So, are you suggesting they come on the same timeline, just in a, a different agenda item, or am I missing something? Yes. Yeah. Thank through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Remco. The yes, a recommendation is uh, is is for September. Um, um, yeah. E even though they will take different tracks, um, some might go in specs and some might go elsewhere, like the whiting EFPs. I think just just with the level of analysis needing, we don't want to bog down the specs with um, yeah with with potential um, yeah whiting EFPs. Okay. Thank you, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to figure out how to ask, ask this question. So, um, and thanks for the presentation, Brian. So, I'm down on the bottom of the table here. Um, it seems like, to me at least, the, the season start date is a, potentially um, the amount of workload involved could well depend on the degree to which the start date is changed. Um, I'll just give an example. You move it back to May 1 is one thing. You move it back to April 1, and it's just, in my mind, an entirely different thing or a, a, a much different thing because of the potential impacts on 
salmon in particular. Um, so there, to me, there's a there's a difference there, and I don't. Uh, so one question is, did it, was that uh, contemplated when you were thinking about the additional work and time that it would take if we were going to engage and talk about the start date? My second question is. The processing south of 42 and the start date are, are and depending on how far back you go, potentially with an analysis on start date, are two very different things in in my mind, and and each carry a a workload issue with them, and when you combine them into the same row of in terms of considering, considering, considering the length of time that a rulemaking might take, um, it's like you know, um, it just it's hard for me to think about it in those terms when we're combining those two. And Frank and and I may be the only one who thinks this, but I thought we had set aside um, table whatever you want to say, the the consideration of of looking at a EFP or anything else for south of 42 at this time. So one question is, did you think about the the start date issue relative to to the degree that to which it was changed, understanding that we haven't had that conversation yet, but hope to with this meeting. And secondly, the the combining of the start date issue and the processing piece. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your thinking about uh, why you combine those two. Thanks. Brian. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Through the through the chair, uh, Mr. Anderson. I think on your for your first question about start date. Um, yes, the further the season start date is, you know, moved up from the current date, the more variability and uncertainty in kind of our projections. Um, I think in table one, we're trying to provide a 12 month estimate um, and, and from the rulemaking side, um, but that is obviously dependent on the, the complexity of the analysis. And then on your 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 second question about um, you know combining combining the potential season start date and, and the south of forty two processing and an EF, EFPs, um, I think I think I think in September I believe the plan was uh, yeah to to look at um, EF or, yeah EFP south of, of forty two in September or consider that. Um, there, there may be some analysis um, savings um, if we have to dig into a, a biological opinion or do some, do some heavy, you know, salmon bycatch type analysis um, to combine those. Um, but that, but we would look to the council to to prioritize um, that workload and 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 have and have the you know under un, and under this discussion at least have the the holistic um, discussion of, of what what priorities to move forward with. Thanks. Any, <clears throat> pardon me, any further questions from Brian? Thank you, Brian. Uh, Marcy Remco, you have a CDFW report? Uh, yes, I do. Give me just a second to pull that no up. Thank you. All right, I will be reading from CDFW report one, supplemental CDFW report one, CDFW report on workload and new management measure priorities. As described in the summarized conceptual design of groundfish workload and priorities process schematic that's shown in agenda item G2 attachment one, the March council meeting is one time to propose new items for inclusion on the management measure list or to revise and update the list accordingly. CDFW recommends including a standalone item on the list identified simply as repeal the CalCod conservation areas. Accordingly, the item currently referred to as non-trawl RCA adjustments, parentheses, including CCA revisions, and Emily Platt EFP, 
that's shown in agenda item G2A GMT report appendix one would be amended to remove reference to the CCA. Further, the item shown on the proposed April 2021 council agenda, which is shown in agenda item C6 attachment two, which currently reads, non troll RCA and Emily Platt EFP into regulations would not include any content in future agenda materials that refer to modifications of CCA boundaries. CDFW now sees the removal of references to the CCAs in the current FMP and regulations, analytical documents, and reference materials as necessary cleanup to bring our materials in line with the current state of biological knowledge of this stock. While discussions under the workload and prioritization agenda item in the last biennium resulted in combining actions related to the CCA with that of non-trawl rockfish conservation area boundaries, that pathway near now appears needlessly complex. Adjustments to the non-trawl RCA lines or amendments to allow select gears or fisheries to operate inside the RCAs is a matter entirely separate from CCAs. And those discussions will involve factors that do not directly address the rebuilt status of cow cod. A giant swath of ocean off Southern California remains off limits to groundfish harvesting by both commercial and recreational sectors. Given workload and other priorities in the 21-22 biennial spec cycle, the cleanups needed to the regulations for consistency with the rebuilt status of the stock did not happen. The regulations governing CCAs are antiquated and no longer necessary yet still convey to the general public that cow cod are in need of special protections in the form of their very own conservation areas. While the council has a history of establishing or endorsing closed area protections for certain species, they have traditionally been limited to those that are endangered or overfished, such as the yellow eye conservation areas and the Pacific leatherback conservation area. In the 21-22 biennial cycle, the council and its advisors gave considerable thought and planning in designing new cow cod specifications and management measures that would allow the stock to continue on the current trajectory of increased biomass. With the support of the council and the ground fish advisory subpanel, cow cod retention in non-trawl recreational and commercial fisheries is still completely prohibited, despite considerable increases in the ACL Fishery Harvest Guideline, and the ACT in the 21-22 biennium. Increases in cow cod bycatch and research fishing are expected, and allowable annual vessel limits in the IQ fishery likewise experience modest increases. However, those management measures in combination are projected to produce annual fishery mortality levels that fall well below the specifications this cycle. Continuing to maintain, implement, and enforce CCA regulations comes at a cost to agencies tasked with this responsibility, including CDFW. It also requires significant outreach and education with the recreational and commercial fishing public. When asked to explain the need for and value of the CCAs, now that the stock is rebuilt, there is not a clear answer. Particularly for recreational fisheries, it makes communications with participants difficult and needlessly complex and also can create challenges with enforcement actions. CDFW has already experienced such circumstances this spring in our effort to depict and communicate closed RCA and CCA fishing areas to the angling public. Waters inside the CCA are closed to groundfish fishing, but so are the adjacent waters as they are part of the recreational RCA. In the event the CCA regulations are repealed, the Southern Groundfish Management Area would still be subject to rockfish conservation area closures, similar to all other areas off the California coast. Having the system of connecting waypoints to form RCAs is a longstanding and effective tool used by the council to establish area closures and depth limits needed to protect these species of groundfish that require special protection. The 20 year old rule establishing the cow cod conservation areas indicated a purpose and need to protect cow cod by reducing interactions from fisheries targeting other stocks. Those areas are closed to both directed ground fish fishing and incidental take and were designed to protect about half of the total area where the spawning biomass of the stock was known to reside at that time. 
That purpose and need no longer exists given the 21-22 harvest specs, management measures, and CalCOD stock status. CDFW views an item to repeal the CCAs as cleanup and does not expect it to have an untenable analytical burden associated with it. While CDFW does not have a recommendation at this time with regard to prioritizing this item, we look forward to hearing input on that issue in future discussions regarding workload and prioritization. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Louis Zim. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much uh, for that, Marcy. That I think that's very excellent uh, forward thinking by uh, by your department. Uh, I've come to expect that and appreciate it. Though I do have one question uh, that I'm sure we'll get more into a discussion. But you did say a giant swath of the ocean off Southern California remains off limits to groundfish harvesting by both commercial and recreational sectors. And what I wanted to ask you is the intent of the department in this. Uh, uh, white paper, I guess you could call it, uh, it's to allow access for both commercial and recreational sectors to the CCA? Mr. Aaron? Chair? If, Marcy, go ahead. Yes, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Louis. Um, as uh, indicated in this report, we have every expectation that the groundfish or the, the rockfish conservation areas uh, would remain intact. And in Southern California, the recreational RCA um, is any waters that are deeper than um, 100 fathoms as defined by um, the RCA boundary, uh, which is uh, established by connecting the necessary waypoints. So in repealing the CCA, uh, there would need to be adjustments made to and, and review of the 100 um, fathom waypoints that would exist in the area that is presently um, covered in the CalCOD conservation areas. So um, yes, that is something that would need to happen in conjunction with um, the scoping and analysis of this item. But in terms of it opening up uh, additional access for sport and commercial fisheries, um, Right now, uh, the CalCOD conservation areas um, in the recreational regulations are, are defined as special closure areas within the Southern groundfish management area. So um, in essence, by removing the CalCOD area regs, it would allow the 100 fathom area to stand, or 100 fathom RCA boundary to stand for um, the entirety of Southern California. Louis, does that answer your question? Yes, I, I I think it does. And thank you very much uh, through the chair. Just one more clarifying. Um, as Marcy knows and referred to in the 100 fathom uh, line discussion that at presently uh, recreational fishing can only take place shoreward. And that's why she has brought up this 100 fathom uh, point. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions on the CDFW report? All right, uh, we'll now go to the groundfish management team. Uh, welcome, Lynn Mattis. Uh, good morning, Mike Check. Uh, loud and clear. All righty. So the, the GMT has two reports. The first one has been in the briefing book, uh, in the events briefing book, so I wasn't going to read through that. This is just our, as Mr. Phillips said, this is our reminder of where we left off the last time we, we participated in this process. Um, we have added columns to some tables and a new table based on requests from the Groundfish Advisory subpanel back in September. Um, this is a column stating whether something is uh, mandated or fishery performance improvement. Um, so th those are now included in tables, Appendix 2, Tables A and B. And then a new Appendix 3 is a table of items that have been completed through this planning and, and prioritization process. Um, appendix 3 does still need some work. Mostly it's been a proof, it was a proof of concept at this point to, to see if this is in the ballpark of what folks were looking for. And I do know that uh, there's a couple of corrections that need to happen to that. 
So with that overview, are there any questions on report one before I delve into report two? Uh, let's see, any questions? All right, Lynn, why don't you go ahead with report two? Will do. So this is agenda item G2A, supplemental GMT report two. Um, we did review all the tables in our report one, and we do have items, uh, updates on a couple of the items below. We also reviewed the public comment letter from Audubon and Oceana, um, and some of our team members were able to view the presentation um, that Anna Weinstein of Audubon staff gave the gap. Uh, and we also heard from uh, Mr. Steve Wilson on behalf of the Salmon Trollers Association. And based on all of that, we have some thoughts. On the potential emergency rule, uh, at the time of this report submission, the GMT did not have the ability to know whether the Pacific Fisheries Management Council would prioritize the emergency rule uh, requested during open public comment. Our preliminary understanding is that the emergency rule, if recommended by the council to move forward, would potentially displace other planned or ongoing work to some degree. As a result of this, we are not able to evaluate whether additional new items could be prioritized under this agenda item, or whether the items currently prioritized would need to be shifted in favor of working on the emergency rule. We also note that if tasked under G2 to advise on the emergency rule sta uh, statements and council floor engagement on G4 in season, G5 electronic monitoring uh, will need to be reduced or eliminated. We expect that any additional recommendations we have on emergency rule may come under the future council meeting agenda and workload planning item C6 later at this meeting. Uh, and updates to appendix two, table B. Um, the last time this count, this came before the council, it was September of 2020. Since then, we have re-examined re the items in Appendix 2, Table B, and we recommend the following changes. Um, update Item B6, remove certain time and area management restrictions for midwater trawl gear targeting non-whiting. Update the progress to date cell to read starting year four of the EFP. With four years of this EFP operating, the GMT looks for council guidance on when to undertake scoping of transitioning the EFP into regulations. We also recommend removing item B11, Sable Fish Harvest Specifications Change Managing with ACTs. We believe that this, what this item was intended to do has been addressed by the new apportionment, apportionment method adopted for 21-22 and the use of the P-STAR of 0.45. Uh, in regards to the CCA issue that Ms. Uremko just uh, spoke about, um, uh, I'm trying to summarize here, uh, we understand that this revision would be added to management measure proposal list as standalone item and prioritized at a later date. Uh, we can provide some additional information on this item at a later meeting as we have done with past other issues such as sort of our mini or preliminary scoping. Short belly rockfish. The GMT considered the proposal by Audubon and Oceana to prohibit a directed fishery for short belly rockfish, uh, as noted in their public comment. Our initial thought is that such an action could follow two potential paths. Number one, amend language in the ground fish FMP to include a prohibition, or two, employ a broader ecosystem approach similar to the 2016 forage fish amendment undertaken within the context of the fishery ecosystem plan. Regardless of path, this action will likely require an amendment to the groundfish FMP. The comment letter suggests including a show belly fishing prohibition as part of the 23-24 harvest specifications and management measures. If considered there, it would likely fall under new management measure category. The council has yet to determine the scope of the 23-24 process and the inclusion of this and or other new management measures may make the implementation of specifications by January 1 more challenging. We note that regardless of the path chosen, path forward chosen by the council, prohibiting fishing for short belly rockfish would warrant similar considerations as were considered during the forage fish action under the FEP. Link cod retention north of 4010 in the salmon troll fishery. We received public comment from Mr. Steve Wilson on behalf of the Salmon Trollers Association in Washington and Oregon, requesting an increase to the incidental lingcod trip limit as salmon trollers are seeking additional opportunities during the 21 salmon season. The salmon troll fishery is considered an incidental open access fishery in the groundfish FMP. Therefore, impacts from the fishery are part of the off the top deductions from the annual catch limit prior to allocating the stock to the directed groundfish fisheries. 
Adjustments to this trip limit would require additional analysis than typical in-season trip limit adjustments, as well as raise questions regarding equity and uncertainty with yellow eye rockfish impacts from an unobserved fishery. Uh, we did suggest uh, to Mr. Wilson that the Salmon Advisor subpanel consider submitting a re this request under this agenda item, which I believe they now have uh, for further consideration. And that concludes the GMT reports. Thank you very much, Lynn. Questions for Lynn on the GMT reports. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. Um, in response to uh, your Appendix 3, this is the table of items completed through the process. I, I appreciate um, in your overview that uh, you understand some corrections are, are needed to that table to make it accurate. And um, then I heard Brian Hooper, or I'm sorry, then I heard Todd Phillips and his overview talk about five items completed through the prioritization process, including two emergency, two, two emergency items. But when I look on Appendix 3 and your list of items on here, I don't see any of the emergency actions. Now I see him reference, reference five items total. You're referencing four. Um, I know that there are some issues with the content here. My question for you is, do we need to have a table of items that have been completed through the workload planning and prioritization process? Do you see value in doing that? Or is this just extra work that is burdening you to have to accurately reflect what did come from this list and what came from some other process? Lynn? Um, Mr. Hronick, Ms. Uremko, uh, this was to address a request by the, from the GAP to have a, a list of things that had been completed through this process. One of the places that uh, Mr. Phillips' list and this Phillips or this list differ is we did not include any emergency actions. We were totally focused on items that were part of this prioritization process. Um, things that have been on the list have been prioritized and addressed. Um, so that's slightly different. As far as the utility of this table, um, we leave that up to the council and industry members. If, if it's useful, it's not now that it's complete and once it gets corrected, it won't be that much work to keep it updated. Um, but we're looking for advice from council members and industry how useful this table is. We were just trying to address the request from the gap. Thank you. Got it. Uh, Pete Hassamer. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, I think this is kind of a strange question, maybe, but underneath the short belly rockfish, the end of the middle paragraph there talks about implementation, difficulty of implementing by January 1. Um, if there's, if we were to pursue something like a short belly rockfish fishing prohibition, is there a GMP workload associated with that? Or do those delays, are they generated outside of what the GMP does? I'm just trying to think of workload implement implications of um, a fishing prohibition. Thanks. Chair Grunick, Mr. Hassner, um, the reference to January 1 is if it's included in the biennial harvest specifications process. Um, that, that's, I, I suspect the implementation of a short belly rockfish prohibition could be implemented at any time, though it would be easier for everybody, I think, if it was a January 1. So that January 1 is specifically referencing um, the specs process. As far as GMT workload, there will be, yes, there will be workload. Um, we did some preliminary scoping back in June 2020 uh, um, about what possible items might be. Uh, I think NIFS provided a report there as well. Uh, it's unknown yet how much workload there will be, but it will be workload on the GMT to, to do this as it is with any groundfish FMP amendment. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. Pete, for the question, thanks, Lynn, for the answer. Uh, any further questions? Maggie Summer. Thanks, Mr. Chair, um, and thanks, Lynn. It's similar, um, you may have answered this or in your response to Pete's question, but uh, I was wondering also on the GMT statements on short belly, uh, it says prohibiting directed fishing would warrant similar considerations as were considered during the forage fish action under the FEP. Um, and um, I, I'm not asking for a lot of detail now, but can you give us some sense of, of what those are so that we can understand the, the workload implications? If you have anything to add to what you just gave us? Chair Gorelnik, Ms. Summer, uh, not a whole lot. It, we would look to um, what was done with forage fish under the FEP to see what would be necessary for short belly rockfish specifically. So it would help that we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. But again, I, I can't say at this time what the workload would be for us. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions for the ground fish management team? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the GAP, Sarah Nayani. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, I'll be reading agenda item G2A, Supplemental GAP Report 1. The GAP received an overview of this item from Council Staff Officer Todd Phillips and discussed the agenda item with the GMT. The GAP agrees with the items contained in GMT Report 1. Based on discussions, we also agree that item B11, stable fish harvest specs change slash managing with annual catch targets from table B of that report has been accomplished through the biennial harvest specs process and recommends it be removed. We also agree that item B6, the EFP relating to removing certain time and area management restrictions for midwater trawl gear targeting non-whiting is in year four of the EFP and the table should reflect that. For CCAs, the GAP discussed the supplemental CDF and W report one suggesting CCAs be removed from the non trawl RCA item. The GAP agrees with CDF and W to repeal the CCAs and make this a standalone item on the ground fish workload schedule. For non trawl RCAs, the GAP recommends this item remain a priority item on the ground fish workload schedule. This will become more important to fishermen as salmon seasons are limited and crab seasons seem to be on a downward trend. Much of the discussion of this item centered around whether to limit the gear types to non-bottom contact gear so fishermen could access the productive stocks within the RCA with several types of midwater gear, including the Emily Platt EFP gear, shrimp flies, and more. These gear types are designed to minimize contact with yellow eye. However, we, we realize that some fixed gear fishermen remain interested in using dingle bar pots or bottom longline gear, for example, within some of the areas of the RCA to access abundant stocks. This may be a consideration for the future. The ultimate goal is for all gear types to access the RCA. Furthermore, the GAP held a work session on this issue in February and council staff are prepared to work on this item in April. More discussion is necessary, but the GAP requests this issue continue to move forward. Mothership utilization. The GAP continues to support this item remaining on the priorities list to improve attainment and flexibility in the mothership sector. Our recommended range of alternatives is in our G3 report and we hope the council will adopt a purpose and need and select a range of alternatives at this meeting. Inclusion of items in the biennial harvest spec slash NEPA review. The GAP also discussed whether new NEPA review guidelines may make it easier for some items to be moved into regs or whether some of the items could be included in biennial harvest specs and management measures. We understand NIMS is in the process of issuing internal NEPA review guidance and that likely fewer or none of these items could be wrapped into the harvest spec. Many GAP members were dismayed that some of the items take so much time for analysis, have no clear path forward for implementation or are scheduled for planning. That is, we take a lot of time discussing the groundfish items, but they remain mired in workload planning with little to no forward movement. We realize the groundfish workload planning item is not working quite as intended, um, intended to add items in March and discuss prioritization, followed by only brief check-ins during subsequent meetings. But at this time, we don't have suggestions for a better process. Similarly, the GAP discussed our frustration with determining when an EFP has sufficient data to be moved into regs. The GMT has voiced similar concerns in the past. 
The GAP recommends as we start the 23-24 biennial harvest specs process, the council consider ways to facilitate movement of EFPs into regulation. Cost Recovery Committee. As outlined in the sit sum for this agenda item, the GAP supports the reformation of the Cost Recovery Committee. The GAP provided extensive comment and a summary of all previous comments in our November 2020 GAP report under the Groundfish Workload Agenda Item, and by this reference incorporates herein. COVID-19 Emergency Rule. The GAP supports the request submitted by PWCC, MGC, UCB, and several catcher vessels requesting the Council recommend NIMS implement an emergency rule to allow at sea specific whiting processing platform to operate as both a mothership and a catcher processor in the same calendar year during the 2021 Pacific whiting fishery. The GAP recommends the Council also support this request. The com comment letter submitted by industry provides compelling rationale for the emergency rule request. The letter also details how the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic, including its lasting and expanding impacts on the fishing industry, add to and exacerbate the problems facing the 2021 whiting fishery relative to 2020. As noted in the letter, while the requested regulatory remedy for this emergency position is similar to the 2020 action, the underlying causes of this emergency are different than those that precipitated the emergency action in 2020. The emergency facing the whiting fishery in 2021 is that catcher vessels delivering to a mothership will strand fish because there is no available replacement mothership processing platform if one experiences a coronavirus outbreak, and B, the company in 2020 that elected to put their vessel in the catcher processor sector and not in the mothership sector will be forced to again make the same operational decision that resulted in loss. Fishing opportunity for mothership catcher vessels again jeopardizing a significant portion of the mothership allocation. Finally, the GAP agrees with the industry letter that because the current regulatory remedy is similar to the 2020 emergency action recommended by the Council and implemented by NIMS, the workload associated with the current request should be reduced because the Council, as advisory bodies and NIMS, already developed a record of decision in support of the action implemented in 2020. To that end, our expectation is that the previous work on a similar action will facilitate Council and NIMS consideration and action on this item. The implementation of an emergency rule will elevate the urgency of finalizing long-term fixes to systemic issues, causing underattainment in the mothership sector without delay, and that shifting of near-term priorities will be minimal. Our anticipation is the Council will fully discuss these agenda items under agenda item G2. Public comments. The GAP would like to acknowledge two public comments received during the agenda item. The first from Anna Weinstein, Audubon, and Dr. Jeff Shuster, Oceana, pertains to short belly rockfish and a potential directed fishery prohibition in the 2324 specs. At this time, the GAP recommends Ms. Weinstein and Dr. Shuster um, continue working with fishery participants and processors for further discussion. The GAP does not see the same urgency as presented by the proponents or the accuracy of representations made in their presentation. Therefore, the GAP does not see the necessity of council action at this time. Secondly, salmon troller Steve Wilson requested a change in the Lincoln incidental catch in salmon troll fisheries north of 42 North Lat recognizing salmon seasons may be restricted again this year, and Lingcod could help supplement salmon trollers' incomes while providing more seafood to the public. The GAP suggested this may be more appropriate for an in-season discussion in April. However, subsequent discussions with the GMT revealed modeling the change may be a heavy lift, and it would be better suited to inclusion in the 23-24 specifications. That concludes the GAP report. Thank you very much, Sarah. Are there questions? on the GAP report. Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, I appreciate the thoughtful report from the GAP here. Um, there are three areas um, that I'm hoping maybe you can clarify um, what the GAP's recommendation is to us regarding um, the inclusion of items on um, on a list and, if appropriate, on the prioritized list. The first question pertains to the SAMTAC item. Um, as uh, we've seen in the GMT's uh, priority uh, table, um, that item is a priority item. Um, it's an ongoing item. Um, but I understood this agenda item to kind of be the chance where we 
um, reassert what our priorities are. So um, I'm wondering why there's no discussion of the SAMTAC item in the GAPS report. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Yaramko, for the question. Um, so there's a little bit of confusion, as you noted earlier in your questions to the um, to Mr. Phillips and the GMT. Um, and so uh, we didn't really have an in-depth discussion about SAMTAC because that item is scheduled for April. And so we assumed the council would take it up then. And then based on your council direction at that time that the gap would come back. Obviously there's people on the gap on both sides of the SAMTAC issue. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult for us to figure out how that would fit into the priorities. Um, so we did not, um, identify, you know, any further input into how that should be prioritized with everything else on the table. Okay, th thank you. Um, second question, similar question. Um, you make reference to the topic of moving the Midwater P EFP into regulation, um, but I believe in order for that to become an item that goes on the list, um, it needs to be recommended to be included on the list. But I'm not seeing a clear recommendation from the GAP to do that at this time. Um, do you have a recommendation on whether that should be added to the list? Or is it something also that you didn't really discuss here? Um, through the chair, thanks, Ms. Yaramko. Um, We did not discuss how that would fit into the priorities. Um, at least my understanding is that because that's been an ongoing EFP for four years, that, that the council needs to move that into regulation um, at some point. But um, the process for how you do that and whether that needs to come back on the list to get priority prioritized among other things is very confusing. And so I don't think that we have a response at that time. My thought is that it's kind of already been through the council process. It's been in an EFP for four years. So I think most of the gap would <laughs> would want to see things that are in that situation, including other EFPs or other topics that have already gone through this prioritized process and, and got into the council and moved through, um, you know, Please, please provide us feedback on how to fit that in and whether we need to put that on the list or not. But this list process is, is certainly a complex and confusing one about what should go where. All right. Thank you. Um, just one more, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair. Same, same line of questioning um, regarding the new request that was identified in the public comments um, from the Sam and Troll representative asking for. Um, adjustments to trip limits. Uh, your report indicates that you acknowledge uh, the public comment received and that um, it looks like um, this may be an in-season discussion or potentially suited for inclusion in the biennial specs, but I, I don't hear a recommendation from the gap here on adding this item to any list. So I just want to clarify that I'm interpreting that correctly. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Ms. Yaremko. Um, Yes, you are interpreting that correctly. We did not add that to the priorities list at this time. Um, I think there was some discussion about could this just be handled through in season and some thought yes. And then we heard from the GMT that more modeling um, may be required. And so it was uncertain the level of workload. And so I think depending on the answer to workload, then it would be easier for the gap to discuss it further and fit it into um, the priorities list or not. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Sarah, and, and to the gap for your report. Uh, I have two, two questions or areas uh, that I want to ask a question about. Um, the first is the Cost Recovery Committee, and I uh, read, readily acknowledge the frustration that industry has expressed uh, with the level of specificity that they've received from National Marine Fisheries Service on items um, 
costs that are paid for with these funds. And I also would acknowledge the efforts that NIMS has made to try and respond uh, to those concerns and, and to those specific questions. But I know it is a, um, um, I have gotten to a point where where there's a, a, a degree of satisfaction in terms of the um, answers to the questions that the industry has raised. Um, so with that as a backdrop, and, and I, as you note, the November 2020 GAP report uh, summarized a lot of the activities that have occurred up to that point in time. So the you know reformation of the cost recovery committee is recommended here, and and you know while I um, uh, I don't know what I think about that, um, it 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 um, it's the then what and the workload associated with the then what uh, that I guess I'm um, thinking about. Uh, understanding that what we heard earlier in the NIMS report is that the level of staffing in the groundfish branch was at seven last year. It's at six now. It is likely to remain at six, so we're down one. We have a um, and, well, we have a list of things that we want to do, uh, and we know that um, digging into some of these questions about cost recovery uh, takes staff time away from other other initiatives. So I'm just trying to understand, I guess, what you see happens next. Okay, we, re we reform the cost recovery committee. Um, how engaged, uh, what is the timeline for engagement? Um, all those things that would go with that in terms of the then what after you reform the committee? And I'm just wondering what kind of conversations took place in the gap when you were thinking about that. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Yes, um, <laughs> the GAP has discussed cost recovery at length over the course of many meetings. And so while at this meeting we didn't um, you know, this meeting, our discussion was somewhat limited to feeling a lot of frustration about how this process has gone, feeling frustration that in order to get answers to the questions that we're seeking that we'll have to, or the way it's sort of been framed is that we may have to choose something else to come off the list in order to figure out, um, you know, what what is being charged for cost recovery or, or what the incremental costs are. And so, um, that was sort of the discussion at this meeting and we decided to incorporate our last statement since we obviously spent a lot of time in November preparing a list of all of our previous statements. Um, so with respect to the cost recovery committee um, and the prior discussions that we've had, we've talked about how this might be a good um, sort of more supported uh, or council supported um, avenue to um, sort of facilitate some of these discussions between the industry and NIMPS in a bit of a more formal setting to try to take some examples. So for example, um, look at the science and um, data, scientific data management team costs and try to understand um, a, a, an explicit example of how that time is being charged, what's considered incremental, um, and, and how NIMPS foresees the workload to diminish over time, if at all. And so the idea was that this could be achieved through a cost recovery committee and or industry could just try to keep doing what we've been doing and hold meetings on the side um, with NIMPS. And so I think the gap um, was supportive of the idea of reconvening the cost recovery committee because that just feels a little bit more of a supported formal process to have these very difficult conversations and um, it would better be reflected um, in the in the council's workload that way. So um, I think most of the discussion we had was about taking specific examples and trying to walk those through so that we can better understand how incremental costs are being um, worked on and then um, to try to come up with a formula together that would be a really clear um, kind of flow chart of how 
incremental costs could be calculated or when a new project comes up, how would that work through the council process and through NIMS? How would it be determined what um, is going to be recoverable and then what would the incremental cost for that be? So I hope that's helpful at answering the questions of what we are seeking to be discussed within the cost recovery committee. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Sarah. And Mr. Chairman, can, can I ask my second question? Of course. Thanks. So my second question is around the the um, is under the public the two the public comment period um, that, that you were re you received, and particularly focusing on the one dealing with short belly rockfish, you know, and and just you know recognizing that. I think we left the June meeting. We had um, there were there were concerns expressed about short belly, and and we worked through a, a, an approach for for this um, biennial cycle. Um, and there was also some expression of an interest in moving forward with um, the potential consideration of a prohibition on a directed fishery. Uh, you know, so so here we are um, talking about that, um, and and I and I readily acknowledge that the industry has repeatedly uh, told us, um, and I believe <laughs> that there isn't a present interest in developing a directed fishery, you know, potentially for things like production and um, or, or whatever other purpose there might be. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's a strong feeling, and I share that strong feeling on the part of the conservation community that putting some protections in place for forage fish such as short belly rockfish is a prudent thing to do. Um, and so, trying to evaluate, you know, when to when to take that on and when to consider those kinds of issues, you know, is always. Uh, um, you're weighing different things as we are here, but what I was struck by is is the 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 use of the word urgency and and um, uh, so I'm just trying to you know think about this a little bit and wondering what the gaps thinking is. If we wait until there is an urgency, um, that would suggest that catches of short barely rockfish have gone up, and that would suggest that there are imminent plans or, or at least plans for creating a directed fishery. And so there would be created this sense of urgency. And it seems to me that if we wait until there is that urgency, that the process of moving forward and the controversy around moving forward becomes much greater than it does if you look at the value of a forage fish such as short belly rockfish and think about taking action before there is an urgent need to take that action. I was wondering if the gap had any discussion around that in terms of do you take this up, you know, when you can do it in a thoughtful way and there aren't uh, pressing issues relative to the potential of a directive fishery, or do you wait until you do have that sense of urgency to act uh, to, to take such an action? Did you have any conversation around that, those thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Um, through the chair, we did have some um, discussion about that. And actually, um, Ms. Weinstein, when she presented, she um, was able to kind of recap some discussions that she had had with Ms. Heather Mann um, in between council meetings. And it seemed like there was some good thought there. Um, and so definitely people are open to continuing the discussion. I think what the gap talked about is that the devil is in the details. And so that um, you just wanted an opportunity before the council sort of like takes this up to work with the conservation community and try to see if there might be some win-wins that we could do that may not take up a lot of council time or if there's further assurance that could be provided. Um, and so the direction that I understood from the gap discussion was that um, there were people who thought there there's merit to what's being requested and that it should move forward for further discussions. We just thought it may be better informed by um, some discussion with industry and processors to kind of understand 
um, because the presentation that we received about fish meal, some of it just didn't seem accurate to what processors' experiences were. Um, and so I think there's just a there's a desire to sort of take this as we've done with other issues and try to work to understand each other better, um, not on the council's time, and then bring it back um, with a developed, um, you know, depending on the outcome of those conversations, um, bring it back to the council with a more, you know, thought through collaborative proposal. Um, because in the presentation we received, there was a lot of open-ended questions about, um, you know, would, would there be a limit, a trip limit, and how would that work with EM and discards? And there was a lot of complexity that we got into in our discussion. And so we just didn't feel like it was ripe for council action at this moment and wanted a chance to kind of work that through together. Okay, thanks for your response, Sharon, and thanks to the GAP for the report. Thanks, back to you, Ms. Thank you very much. Any further questions on the GAP report? Um, Mr. Chair, if I might make a quick correction. Yes. Um, I was texted by Ms. Susan Ch Chambers, and she pointed out in response to Ms. Yaremko's question on the Midwater Trawl EFP that we did list that as B6, that we do want that to stay on the list. Um, and that was at the very beginning of our report. And I'm sorry, I, I failed to answer that question correctly. So we said we also agree that item B6, the uh, EFP, um, is in year four, and the table should reflect that and, and essentially that it should stay on the list. So my apologies there. Well, thank you for the correction. Okay, uh, not having any further uh, questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. And now we'll move to the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report. Uh, I think George Bradshaw is giving that, but I may not have the right name. Hopefully someone will speak up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Ryan Johnson. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel. Um, uh, sorry, I'd like to share the report on workload new management measures. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel offers the following for consideration as a workload new management priority. The SAS asks, that, asks the Council to prioritize the evaluation of an increased incidental lingcod trip limit in the salmon troll fishery as part of the incidental open access fishery. The troll fishery has experienced erratic salmon harvest and the retention of additional lingcod caught incidentally could buffer the adverse effects of variable salmon harvest across the troll fleet. Adding diversity to the troll harvest increases the flow of product and marketing opportunities, adding value to the fleet, processors, and coastal communities. These increases in community effects will be welcome, particularly in Washington, <clears throat> where the coastal counties experience some of the highest poverty rates and are among the most reliant on commercial fishing income. The proposed increase and the incidental link cod trip limit is not intended to change the overall quota available to the open access sector. This proposed increase in link cod retention is limited to vessels with VMS and geographically north of 4010, where link cod are above their population target. The SAS requests that the council prioritize this important new management measure and is interested in further coordination with the council and the ground fish advisory bodies on implementation. That completes the report. Thank you very much. Are there questions on the SAS report? Okay, Bush Smith, followed by Louise M, followed by Marcy Yaremko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, great, great report. Uh, it seems to me that the SAS worked on this very issue in uh, March and April of uh, 2018 with the GMT. Are there any any reports? And there seem to be that there's some some modeling already done on different uh, on different fishing uh, regimes. Uh, has, has those reports been uh, found, or has somebody gone to the GMT and asked them if they uh, recollect that work that has already been done? So we're not reinventing the wheel. Do you, do you know, Mr. Johnson? Uh, thanks for the question. We, we've been um, in contact with them, and you were correct. It was, uh, I guess, analyzed last in 18. And um, there, there's um, 
I guess some hope that depending on the level of work, um, that analysis could be um, used currently with some updated info. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think that's an important point that it doesn't seem like on this issue we'd necessarily be starting from scratch because like I said, there's there's been there's been some work done already on this. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, great report. Thanks, Butch, for that. Um, Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Johnson. I really appreciate that report and I'm very interested in it. Um, and also Butch's uh, remark as to uh, what uh, work has been done on this already. What measures do salmon trollers do to avoid yellow eye impacts? Could you illuminate me on that? Yes, we have a conservation box uh, up in the north coast of Washington to avoid. And then um, I think in past studies, um, just do our best to avoid them and uh, naturally they um, we just avoid them with the gear and the troll speeds. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. That, that's uh, that's informative. I appreciate it. All right. Great. Thanks, Lou, for the question. Thanks, Ryan, for the answer. Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Question on the statement in the report about this uh, increase possibly buffering the adverse effects of variable salmon harvests across the troll fleet. Um, the reason I ask is if the salmon seasons are constricted across that range from Washington <laughs> south to 4010, which it looks like they are likely to be, um, that means there will be um, potentially more closed days uh, that the fishery will be tied up. Um, I am just curious why the proposal to increase the Lincod trip limits um, is coming in conjunction with um, a request to do that only for salmon fishery participants or in conjunction with salmon fishing activities rather than a proposal to uh, provide increased trip limit opportunity to uh, the directed open access ground fish fishery north of 4010. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, I think the SAS had discussed that, um, you know, there's been difficult years and if the fleet could uh, um, find this level of income it could help get us through these difficult years with the and we discussed the link being above target population um there's more of them around and um as to the directed um incidental open um i have not had much discussion with those folks um we didn't intend to uh leave them out or anything it was just a uh, salmon specific topic uh, that came up in the SAS. If I if I may, Chair Roman. Yes, so um, have you consulted with the open access ground fish representative on the gap, which I believe is Harrison Ibach uh, surrounding this request? I, I'm just trying to understand why the request isn't for an open access uh, increase. Um, and why it's a request associated with salmon fishing. So, thank you. Thank you for the question. I haven't directly spoken with him. Um, I, th I think at the bottom of the SAS statement, we kind of just mentioned that we would like to further coordinate with the advisory bodies and the GMT um, moving forward. Thank you. All right, any further, any further questions of the SAS? Uh, I'm not uh, seeing any, so we will move on to public comment. And um, I'd just like to note for uh, the public and for the council members, we're now an hour and a half into a two-hour agenda item, and um, and that's that's okay. We need to take the time we need to 
you know, carefully consider these matters. But I, I would ask uh, uh, commenters uh, as well as council members to try to be as efficient as possible um, when, when offering your public comment. Um, so, cause right now we have the potential to go an hour and a half on public comments if people take all their time. So take the time you need, but preferably not m more than that. And I, I would ask, um, council members to, to be, um, mindful of time, uh, and to make sure any questions you ask are uh, specific and pointed, um, so we can get a, a specific answer and, and move on to uh, either another question or to another public uh, commenter. So with, with that um, request out there, uh, we'll move on to public comment. And first we have Bill James. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we are uh, having trouble locating Bill. Perhaps we could uh, move on and uh, see if we can circle back to Bill. Later. That's that's fine. Uh, Dan Platt, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Please. Okay, good deal. Um, I'll try to be brief, but I just want to um, stress that uh, opening up the RCA to the non-trawl fishermen is still very much... Um, a, uh, still very much a priority for us. And um, you're probably gonna hear that from other people. Uh, I, um, after the uh, GAP had our special meeting, I sent out a uh, survey to the members of the Salmon Trawlers Marketing Association. Uh, we have about 40 members on, on our uh, membership list. And um, it didn't take very long. I got feedback from them. I, the the uh, survey was to ask them if they would be interesting and interested in participating in a uh, <clears throat> fishery out in in the uh, what is now the closed RCA. Um, if uh, they had to have a VMS and um, use legal gear. Um, which uh, it, for the purposes of the survey, we said no long lining, trapping, or dangle bar. And um, I got a lot of feedback from the fishermen. There's a lot of, uh, almost immediately, there's a lot of fishermen that indicated they would be interested in participating. And um, some of you that are on the council probably remember uh, Jim Ponce. He was a GAP member for quite a while. Um, he has not, he was one of, uh, probably the biggest, um, rock cod fishermen prior to the RCA and he has not been active in that fishery at all. But, um, if, um, this fishery was allowed, he, he indicated that he would be interested in starting fishing and, um, several of the other members that, um, contacted me actually have, um, some of the gear, shrimp fly gear, and, and one, one of the members actually has uh, one of those uh, reels with the fly gear, like the, uh, well, like uh, Kathy and Steve Fosmark's EFP that they had a while um, back. And, and so I, um, I just wanted to pass on to you that um, there are, appears to be uh, a lot of interest in, in this fishery happening and uh, it's still very much a priority for, for us. And you'll be hearing more about it in April. All right, and thanks that was that. Thank you. All right, thank uh, you, Dan. Okay. Are there any questions for Dan? I see Bob Dooley has his hand up. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan, just a real quick question. You say a lot. Do you have any quantification of how many people that uh, responded positively they've used this and get an idea of how many people uh, extra more fishermen will be involved in this? Yeah, Bob. So um, 
approximately half of our membership has has already got back to me and it was just uh that was a went in within a few days of sending the survey out and um a few of the fishermen that i talked to weren't aware that there was these are guys that haven't been involved in the um ground fish fishery for many years or salmon and crab fishermen and a few of the uh, fishermen that I talked to weren't even aware that there was any open access rock fish so um it's been kind of a uh kind of a uh, um you know educating those guys on on what's available to them but I would say about 50 percent so far have got back to me and uh, expressed interest. Just to follow up, do you have a number for that? Uh, how many people that would be? Is it 20, 50? What, what is that number? Yeah, we have, there's 40 members, so about 20 people. Thank you. All right, any further questions of Dan Platt? Thank you, Dan. Uh, so uh, is let's call for Bill James and see if he's available. All right, we'll come back to Bill. Uh, Jeff Chester, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the council. This is Jeff Chester representing Oceana. I wanted to speak on the issue of short belly rockfish. Uh, which, as you know, uh, is an important forage species for Chinook salmon, uh, thresher sharks, swordfish, and a whole number of seabirds and marine mammals, uh, and is actually in the uh, HMS uh, EFH, uh, which we'll be talking about in, a, in, an, in another agenda item at this meeting. It, it, this is one of the um, components of essential fish habitat for highly migratory species. And uh, we, uh, we, we have seen over the last decade that um, there were uh, annual catch limits in place that prevented directed fishing and limited incidental catch. However, with the redesignation of this species as an ecosystem component species in Amendment 28, uh, that removed those protections uh, and no longer uh, prevents adverse impacts to essential fish habitat. Um, in our uh, comment letter uh, with, uh, that we submitted along with um, Audubon uh, on this item, uh, we had uh, three basic requests. First, to signal the council's intent to consider a directed fishery prohibition on short belly rockfish. Uh, second, to uh, have the ground fish management team lay out the pathway and the workload uh, to accomplish that. And also, thirdly, to consider management options if the 2000 metric ton trigger is approached or exceeded. And in that letter, we uh, outlined concerns regarding the potential use of short belly as a uh, fish meal for the, a growing uh, aquaculture industry, both uh, here on the West Coast and worldwide. Um, Audubon and Oceana uh, 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 presented to the GAP and the ground fish management team. Uh, we, we appreciated that the GAP sees uh, merit in the approach, and we plan to follow the GAP's recommendation to have further discussions with uh, fishing interests and processors uh, in hopes that we can find a collaborative solution to bring to the council. We also appreciate and support the paths laid out by the GMT uh, with respect to um, the two pathways they lined out, both of which would include a ground fish FMP amendment. Um, and we uh, just to, to follow up on a question that Ms. Summers uh, asked, um, their point about the analysis following uh, a similar pathway to what was done for the Fishery Ecosystem Plan Forage Fish Initiative in 2016, uh, we envision that to be uh, an analysis of previous catches of short belly in various sectors to determine uh, appropriate trip limits, annual limits, and or processing limits uh, to implement the directed fishing prohibition and I think the point is that the GMT ha has done this for a number of other forage species. So using that similar approach uh, would be consistent with that. And we, we, we support that as well as the inclusion of this issue in the 23 and 24 ground fish specification cycle. So we're uh, again reiterating our requests and, and asking the council to uh, please add a directed short belly uh, rockfish fishery prohibition to the list of new management measures under this agenda item. Thank you, and I will take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. 
Are there any questions for Jeff? Not seeing any hands. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next, we're going to go back to Bill James, who I guess was was available, but um, didn't have his mic unmuted. So, Bill, uh, you want to go ahead? Bill, can you hear me? You're muted, it looks like. Um, well, I think we're still having some technical difficulties with Bill. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Steve Wilson uh, next. Steve, are you with us? Steve, if you unmute on your end, you should be able, we should be able to hear you. Yeah, are, are you picking me up now? Got you now. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, uh, Vice Chair Penninger, and uh, Director Tracy and Council members. My name is Steve Wilson. Um, yeah, I'm that one. <laughs> I've been a salmon troller for 32 years, mostly in Washington on the North Coast. I'm also a Secretary of the Coastal Trollers Association. This uh, request, as you've already heard from, from Lynn on the GMT and Sarah on the Gap and, and uh, my friend Ryan from the SAS, is uh, a request to uh, consider the, the, the uh, retention of link cod in the troll industry um, north of the 4010 line. Um, specifically, we would prefer to change from the current one to five ratio of one link cod per five Chinook to a one to two ratio, and also to increase the trip limit from 10 to 15 individual fish. Um, as, as you've heard from, from the GMT and GAP, um, this request may need to be analyzed by, by the groundfish world <laughs> and, and in, a, in the very complex way that they approach new management ideas and suggestions. Um, therefore, it may not be considered as an in-season action for 2021. And that's sad for those of us um, who need the help now. Um, Besides the time needed for study and priority, um, a great concern to that groundfish world is our impacts on the resurgent yellow eye stocks. The, the good news is that the council's rigorous management of our groundfish stocks have seen nine out of 10 stocks rebuilt since 1999. And the yellow eye are rebuilding faster than expected, according to a just released paper by the University of Washington's Michael Melnicek, and I have to check with John DeVore how to pronounce that name since I saw John's name among <laughs> the list of authors. It's uh, titled Identifying Management Actions That Promote Sustainable Fisheries. Um, our fishers have pur purposely trolled away from the LOI encounters as, as we can't keep them. They're, they're beautiful, but bothersome. I particularly appreciated Mr. Zim's question of, of Ryan earlier. Um, how, how are we avoiding them? Um, I would add to Ryan's answers, um, many of us are using new technology to reduce the barotrauma these fish experience when brought to the surface. Encouraging research uh, that's been done by the University of California, Santa Cruz and NOAA Fisheries report success in the Central California Recreational Groundfish Fishery with de descender devices such as the sequelizers I have on my own boat. And a final comment on, on yellow eye impacts. There is also a University of Washington May 20th, 2016 scientific publication authored by Michelle Ma titled, Lincod Meat Rockfish, Catching One Improves Chances for the Other. And it's still available on the internet. In it, she refers to the quote, other unquote, as yellow eye rockfish. And connecting the dots, when we remove ling cod, we improve the survival of yellow eye. So ling cod are abundant and encountered nearly every day, and they're eating the yellow eye. Getting to the purpose for this request, it involves benefits to seek, uh, seafood consumers, to our coastal communities, and selfishly to our own checkbooks. Every year, our seasons feel more constrained and profits harder to see. Again, this year, as was earlier pointed out, um, our third alternative in, in the North of Falcon Salmon meetings is for no fishing. This is the second year in a row. 
Like most all businesses nationwide, our salmon industry has suffered through the COVID issue. With restaurants closed, our catch had few places to go. Access last year to half of Washington's coastal ports were closed as tribes protected their communities from the virus. Many vessels were forced to devote two days running to get to and from the fishing grounds. Fuel costs were just one of our rising costs. And unrelated to the virus, the subscription rates for our vessel monitoring system units went up due to the government mandated increase in ping rates. And now I'm finding that the gear stores have kicked up their prices, most likely due to the supply and demand as many of the shelves are empty. As restaurants and businesses reopen, these additional link cod will help offset our costs. And what does our government recommend to seafood consumers? The EPA and the FDA both released guidance for the recommended consumption of seafood just recently on December 29th. They now recommend that adults eat two to three times more, per, uh, that eat seafood th two to three times per week. Their chart recommends codfish in their list of best choices. Link cod are abundant primarily because of this council's actions. Help us with these few fish to contribute to the rebuilding of yellow eye. Help us to lessen the economic concerns of our coastal communities because to them, every fish delivered to their ports is important. And help some of our fishers to financially hang on a little longer. We're not asking here for tons, but just the possibility to keep five more link cod per trip with a more profitable ratio. Again, we hope this request can be considered prior to the April meeting and in-season action may be taken for this fishing season. I conclude with a thank you to council staff, particularly those on the GMT, the GAP, and the SAS. I'm grateful for your time this morning. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Steve. Let me see if there's questions around the table for you. I, we have questions from Louis Zim and Brad Pettinger. So go ahead, Louis. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson, for a, an excellent presentation and very, very interesting. Um, and that's the first time I've heard mention of using sequelizers, which I use, I wouldn't say daily because I don't get out daily, but every day I'm out, I use them. Um, I have not heard of trollers using sequelizers before. And so I have two questions. One, what speed would you be trolling for link cod or, or salmon at the same time? And what depths would you be doing that uh, activity? Thank you. Um. Thank you, through the chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Zim. Our, our uh, speeds are not directed towards catching lingcod. Uh, they're directed solely for catching salmon. Um, and our speeds, depending upon the currents, as you know, are, are between 2.4 to, to 3.4 knots. Um, I hope that helps. Yes, I do, it does. And, and what depths would you be working in? Um, yeah, through the chair. Thank you. Um, we we fish um, in in shallower waters, twenty five to thirty five fathoms, and we fish all the way out to the Juan de Fuca Canyon, which uh, the edge is at about ninety to ninety five fathoms. So it's it's uh, from the deep area that we encounter most of of the uh, uh, the the other species besides salmon. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I, I may note that uh, it is in the deeper areas that uh, the concern for the efficacy of, of the sending devices arises. So that's why I asked. That. All right, uh, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair, thank you, Chair Gerolnik. Um Steve, um, I'm kind of curious um, about your request. Um, how often do you catch lingcod in a salmon trip? Um, I used to salmon troll uh, many years ago and don't remember uh, catching too many uh, link cod during that period. Um, I never did fish off the Washington coast. And I guess my reason I ask that is that link cod tend to hang around uh, harder bottom or rocky substrate and um, trolling um, salmon gear next to the bottom around rocks usually a lost cannonball. So I'm just kind of curious what, uh, what, what is the interaction amount and, and actually what, uh, what, what allowance are you asking for? Thank you. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Penninger. The the um, the answer to that question obviously would 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 be based upon the depths that we're fishing. Uh, we have few rocky uh, structures in shallower waters. 
the um, the upwelling activity of, of nutrients that comes out of the canyons um, seems to attract not just salmon but but lots of, of uh, ground fish species, in, including halibut and ling cod and so forth. Um, so we we are to to specifically answer the question. We find um, the incidental catch of ling cod to be increasing um, quite dramatically. I've had a federal observer on my boat. Uh, it was probably been 15 years ago now, but it, since then we we seem to be seeing more and more of them. And um, I I would have to say that in my activities it it averages three or four, maybe five a day. Thank you. All right. Uh, further questions for Mr. Wilson. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, now we're going to go back to Bill James, who I understand has had his um, technical difficulties addressed. So, Bill, you are unmuted. You are permitted to talk. So please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Bill James. I'm an open access nearshore fisherman, and I'm representing uh, Port St. Louis Commercial Fishers. Association. Well, again, uh, I would like to see at the highest our uh, deal with getting into the RCA and what gear to use uh, the highest priority. We haven't been in for over 20 years, and there's all kinds of fish in there. And we're currently probably, I guess, if you look at all the open access up and down the coast in California, we're probably what three percent of of uh, what's allowable under the shelf rockfish um, harvest guidelines. So, you know, we're, we just can't get to where they are. So there's lots of guys in open access, um, directed ground fish that want to start. It's probably going to start a little bit slow, but we have to work it and develop the market as we go. Because again, a lot of that uh, stuff ended um, when the ground fish disaster happened. So the local the local communities aren't used to seeing local fish, so um, they want it, and we just have to let them know we have it, and uh, we, we really need access. I really, we, you know, considering even the salmon and crab has been so bad, everybody is going to need a little something to get by, and so the soonest you can get that in, into uh, so we can get in there, be better, and uh, you know, we have ways that we can avoid um, the bottom contact and that the habitat and avoid uh, the yellow light, you know. So I, I can give you all kinds of other reasons, but basically that's it. We got the, the method, we got the desire, we got the boats. There's a lot of us. We're probably the most common, you know, uh, the most boats of uh, vessels of any uh, different uh, grouping in the, in the council as you go through all the different states. So um, the coastal communities need us to fish, then we need to fish. And that about concludes it. I'll have more definitive um, stuff when we go into April, but uh, just general, just keep us high on the priority list. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Bill. Are there any questions of Bill? I'm not seeing any. Thanks very much, Bill. Glad we got Thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, next we'll hear from Lori Steele, and just as a reminder, if you have submitted, timely submitted your request to speak and you're on this list, please raise your hand in the attendee list. It'll make it easier for us to find you. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Lori Steele. I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. Um, I have hesitated to take the council's very limited available time to make my comments, and I certainly struggled with where my comments fit most appropriately on this agenda because these comments are related to the frustrations that we've been experiencing trying to move forward the mothership utilization issue along with other critical management issues. But the frustrations we're feeling are very reflective of a much larger problem we're facing with our ground fish workload issues and our management process in general. I'm actually well beyond frustrated at what is clearly a catastrophic problem in the West Coast region. 
and I'm totally outraged. I've spoken with several council members individually about this issue, so I will try to keep my comments today relatively brief and focused on this agenda item. We are at a breaking point with the groundfish management process in this region, and enough is enough. Based on almost two decades of personal experience working on a council staff, working on management teams, and personally chairing a number of management teams, I am here to tell you 100%, a thousand percent, that it does not have to be like this. And it is not like this in other regions. I promise you that. This culture of saying no first and then wrapping ourselves around the axle in the weeds of the process in this region has to change. It's a huge problem. We're not going to solve it at this council meeting, and we certainly shouldn't take any more of the council's time right now. But for starters, I implore the council to please stop putting ground for groundfish workload and new management measures on the council agenda right now. Stop taking the council's time and the GMT's time and the industry and public's time talking about how there's not enough time to do work. We have to stop giving the region more opportunities to tell us why they can't get things done in a timely and efficient manner. I look at the reports in the briefing book, the discussion, the lists, the tables, the matrices, the work that's been done to lay out all the reasons why there's no time to do work. We've already spent several hours, easily more than a day's worth of time at this meeting, when you add up GMT gap in council time, talking about work that needs to be done. I have never seen anything like this in my life. Stop talking about it and do the work. It is important for everyone on this council to understand without any question that this is not how the management process works in other regions. The culture in the West Coast region of saying no right out of the gate or saying that if we move forward with A, B, and C, we have to drop X, Y, and, B, and Z is unique to the West Coast region. In my experience, and Heather alluded to it this morning in terms of the North Pacific, and I can attest to this for New England and the Mid-Atlantic, the mindset, the culture, and the response from our supporting management agency is not no, you, or is not you have to trade this for that. The answer is, okay, let's figure out how to get this done. Let's get to work on all of this, and let's do the best we can. And then if things can't get done, it's a different story because we're all working as hard as we can. We can adjust accordingly at each council meeting based on where we are, but let's just get on with it. So obviously, one major element of frustration I have is that I don't understand why we spend literally a third to a half of everyone's time at these meetings talking about and preparing documents about the fact that there's not enough time to do work. I've never seen this before in any other region, and what's happening with groundfish has gotten beyond ridiculous. Another major element of my frustration is the level of overthinking and overanalyzing and overdoing everything in this process. Brad alluded to it earlier, paralysis by analysis. I think everybody needs to stop and consider the guidelines that we work under relative to NEPA, MSA, and ESA to get a better understanding of exactly what is required by law in order to support federal fisheries management, council decision-making, and federal rulemaking. I think you will find, for example, that we do not need to spend days of time and work fleshing out a purpose and need for a management action. It's completely unnecessary to spend that kind of time. Another example, the council does not need an EIS worth of analysis in order to pick a range of alternatives to go forward for further analysis. This is mind boggling to me. It is completely unbelievable the amount of unnecessary work that is created in this region. It would be helpful for all of us to gain an understanding, a common understanding of what kind of information and what level of analysis is really necessary and what is required by law to support the council's process. There are protected species in other regions. There are ESA species in other regions. I guarantee you, we are way overdoing things here. And what deeply concerns me <clears throat> is that as new staff comes into the agency and into the region, they're learning right out of the gate that this is the way it has to be. This is how the culture is evolving. The redundancies, the unnecessary bureaucratic red tape, the overanalysis, 
it does not need to be this way. And it's breaking our management system. Excuse me. Let's start by making whatever changes we can right now, today, by not spending any more council time on this kind of agenda item. We all know what the groundfish priorities are. We do not need a separate agenda item to talk about it more and develop more tables and matrices about time. We already do this under future workload planning at the end of every council meeting. Planning out the next three council meetings and a year at a glance at the end of each meeting will lay out our priorities and provide time for people to discuss them. The end. New issues can be brought up under open comment for future or future workload. Beyond that, we need to focus on the work to be done at the next three council meetings and spend all of the time at the GMT and the council getting the work done. So let's make a commitment to changing the culture in this region from saying no and from saying we're too busy to take anything else on and saying we have to spend time horse trading before we can move forward on anything. Let's change this mindset to saying, okay, let's work together and see how we can get it done. It is the responsibility of the agency to support the council's decision-making process. The council just needs to get on with this process. We need to understand what is required by law. We need to change this process and we all need to say enough is enough. This is a long-term issue. And to be perfectly honest, fixing this catastrophic problem really should be the council's priority. In closing, I am happy to share my perspective from my experiences working in other regions with anybody who wants to talk about this further. We are all in this together. We are supposed to be on the same team. And I am committed to doing what I can to help solve this problem. I'm also committed to continuing to push back very hard on this because this is major and it's going to result in a complete failure of our groundfish management process. And changing this is gonna require the entire council to push back along with a strong commitment from a lot of people on all sides of this process. This requires problem solving, creative thinking, and it requires a complete and total shift in the culture of fisheries management in our region. We are at a breaking point, and I am asking the council to please push back. Please do not support this mindset and this culture anymore. Please make this stop. We all have to help NIMS and the agency get out of its own way to get things done. So let's do our part right now to commit to stopping the insanity. Thank you. Okay, Lori, are there any questions of Lori? Thank you, Lori. Uh, next, Dan Waldeck, followed by David Toriumi. Chair Gorelnik, good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, Dan, please go ahead. Thank you, I am Dan Waldeck, Executive Director of the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative. And first off, I thank you for your time this morning. Uh, as I said on my previous testimony, I, I am really miss seeing you all in person and would re looking forward to getting back to in meeting, in-person meetings. So I wanted to again ask you to make a recommendation to National Fishery Service for an emergency rule to allow mothership and catcher processor vessels to operate in either mode during the 2021 whiting season. I hope my comments earlier this meeting and our public comment letter clearly articulated the problem, how it is elevated in terms of COVID uncertainty relative to 2020, and the need for urgent action, an action that should be facilitated by previous council and NIMS action. I recognize that effects on workload is one of the primary issues the council must consider in thinking about this emergency rule request. In this case, we have a clear record of council action, advisory body input, and NIMS rulemaking. The April 2020 GAP and GMT statements about a similar emergency rule request were brief and to the point, concluding that an emergency was warranted. The council agreed with this, and the agency followed suit. So I ask you, in simplest terms, as you consider our request, please account for that context and that precedent. And, and I guess to put a pin in it, I mean, this workload, the workload that will come from this request should be significantly reduced by the rulemaking that preceded it in 2020. 
we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not, we're not plowing new ground. So uh, to, you know, to echo some of what Ms. Steele just mentioned, there is some frustration that the merits of this request are given less consideration than the workload that might be involved in this request. And I, I would like the council to maybe pivot to first thinking about the merits of this request. And so in closing, you know, we don't know what problems may arise in 2021, but if we act today to provide relief, then we know with certainty that fishery participants will benefit from this action. And we know, and we know that extra flexibility, adaptability will be available to other fishery participants as problems arise in the future. So I'll end there and, and I'm open to any questions uh, as they may fit the uh, agenda item here. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Dan. Questions for Dan? Okay, uh, David Toriumi followed by Anna Weinstein. David, it looks like you're muted on your end. Uh, we will come back to David. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, it keeps asking me a bunch of questions on my phone to, to do things, but anyways, yeah, my name is David Toriumi. You guys have heard from me before. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair and Council for listening to me, but I'm just here to beat the drum again on how crucial it is to, to uh, consider the items in the non trawl RCA to, to stay on the highest priority. Um, for you guys, um, there's a, I've talked to everyone down here in Monterey Bay and even up above us and down below us a little bit, and and it's uh, <clears throat> it, it's going to be more crucial than any other year, I believe, this year to actually have that. Unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to be getting that or not, but um, please keep that in mind. I've talked to everybody, and the the 50 fathoms that was given to us down here means absolutely nothing to all of us down here. Um, there's uh, quite a quite a handful of guys that know that area already and have gone out there and and th there's just nothing there and and everyone the big concern here is why does why do we have so much quota and yet we can't access any of this you know it's like looking at <clears throat> looking at you know paychecks and money floating around that we can't even grab to pay our mortgages and bills so um, I, I, I'm gonna keep it short because I got to get back to work um, but uh, thank you guys and if you have any uh, any questions um, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. Uh, any questions for David? All right, thank you, David. Um, Anna Weinstein, followed by Heather Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council members. Um, I'm Anna Weinstein with Audubon, and um, I'll be speaking to the issue of short belly rockfish, um, and I, I will try to keep this pretty short. Um, I appreciate the attention from the GAP and the GMT and the Council on this issue at this meeting and in prior meetings. And I want to emphasize that there, right now there's no measures in the FMP that prevent targeting of short belly rockfish. The species is not subject to catch limits. This doesn't meet the, the standards of, the, of this Council for um, uh, ensuring um, uh, protections for such a foundational forage fish. And um, as a uh, as Mr. Anderson was, was referring to, I mean, the urgency question, if, if we wait for the urgency, when there's a vested interest in, in targeting this, this fish for aquaculture uh, or other purposes, that's too late. It's too late for seabirds, it's too late for bigger predatory fish in the whole ecosystem. And I, I did present, and I appreciate the gap giving, carving out some time to uh, let me present, um, and I did present um, on the growth of global aquaculture, which is very substantial. And we don't have to look any closer than our own backyard here with the NOAA aquaculture opportunity areas and the Pacific Aqua Farms proposal. So there's a big push, push from NOAA and industry uh, in, our, in our area. So um, in conclusion, um, I want to reiterate the ask in our letter and that Dr. Shester referred to as well 
that the council add short belly, uh, a short belly rockfish prohibition to um, scoping it as a list of, uh, to, to its list of new management measures. Um, and also, um, as um, uh, we can, in a complementary way, we can, we can keep that channel of communication open with the GAP uh, on collaborative solutions. And I appreciate um, members of the GAP um, uh, volunteering to put time into that and continuing to um, educate me and keep lines of, of uh, communication open on solutions. So thank you so much. And I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Anna. I, I see we have a question for Louis Zim. Please go ahead, Louis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much uh, for your work on this. Anna, I, like Phil, am concerned about this and, and actually being somebody involved in aquaculture. Um, I share your concern. I've seen this happen other places in the world. I don't see it happening here now. But um, I would like to ask you, what measures do you foresee happening if we do, in fact, hit 2,000 uh, tons, um, which is a, a key to uh, a tripping point that the the council is supposed to look at this again. What 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 do you think we should do if we do get to two thousand here in this year? Well, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Zim, um, and thank you, Mr. Gorelnik, Chair Gorelnik, and um, Mr. Zim. I I don't know the answer to that question, but what I can tell you is that right now there's the um, there's the, there's no public understanding, so there's no um, clear information that the public has about you know what would happen should the uh, incidental catch approach you know the in season for the calendar year approach um, the, the the 2,000 tons. So it's sort of unfinished business, and um, you know we know and acknowledge that the industry is not targeting short belly rockfish, um, the the groundfish industry. Um, but uh, right now, you know, the incidental catch is an important um, safeguard for the, the species. Um, and right now, there's no uh, clarity for the public about that. So the, um, we just, with our request in the letter, are requesting that the council actually scope consideration of what um, the response um, should be from the council should that, um, that trigger be reached. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Anna. All right, any further questions? Thank you very much, Anna. Um, now we'll go to Heather Mann, followed by Trent Harto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, council, council members. Um, hello again, my name is Heather Mann. I'm speaking on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. MTC represents uh, catcher vessels that participate in both the shoreside and at sea whiting fisheries, as well as traditional ground fish. We support prioritizing the mothership utilization issue. This issue was first raised in public hearings for the five year review uh, back during 2016. Some fishermen have had to leave some or even all of their allocation in the water for one or even multiple seasons. Generally, this is due to mothership platforms not being on the grounds for a variety of reasons. Um, you've heard public comment from several boat owners and captains over the last several years, and I would reference the comments from Robert Smith, Justin Johnson, Chris Cooper, Jim Sievers, Jeff Lackey, Mike Story, Kurt Cochran, Mark Cooper, and Alex McQuaw over the last several years for the record. I believe there is enough information in the analytical document to move forward later today with the purpose and need and range of alternatives. And I would hope we could get this item on the agenda for a PPA and the final action before the end of 2021. We also support continuing to prioritize the SAMTAC issues. Participants on all sides deserve to have this topic vetted and paths forward identified. A lot of work has gone into this subject and it's time to resolve it one way or another. I know, Mr. Chairman, that you asked us to be brief, but I believe it bears repeating here that many of the opportunities that sectors are looking to take part in and prioritize are available in great part because of the work of the trawl fleet. I talked about the trawl buyback uh, program, which started the ITQ, uh, made it possible for the ITQ program, uh, that we've paid $40 million on that loan since 2005 and still owe $12 million. Uh, that we have a rationalization program that came with 200% monitoring, 100 on the boat and 100 at the processor, all on the industry's dime. 
Um, and on top of all these expenses, writing checks to the government for cost recovery. And since 2014, we've paid $11 million. Um, and this is all money deducted off the top. Um, so uh, please consider prioritizing the issues that will provide increased access and value for all participants in the trial ITQ program. The fixed gear participants uh, who gear switch are also paying the burden of these financial costs. Uh, we want to um, continue with supporting reconstituting the cost recovery committee. MTC members are unsatisfied with the process that has occurred thus far. Uh, it's raised more questions than answer, provided answers, and it's not a paperwork exercise. There is over 11 million of industry dollars that have been collected so far. We deserve to know more and have input into how these costs are identified especially when we have all the financial burden of a rationalized fishery, but without the associated benefits. So let me repeat, I do think non trawl RCA access is important for that sector. I think Danny Platt and his colleagues, they've worked for years on an EFP that should be scaled out and available to the fleet. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife report stated many of the justifications that the trawl fleet used when we were working to eliminate the trawl RCA, and they are valid. Unfortunately, the capacity issues for management actions are so limited, it's hard to support this as a priority because there is not enough bandwidth to address all the issues our federal, federally managed fisheries face. You know, and honestly, that bothers me. Um, I wanna support Danny, I wanna support those guys getting into that area. Um, there's just not enough bandwidth for everything. So look, I know you're anxious to get to lunch, but I just need to share these last thoughts. Um, I know it isn't popular to point out inadequacies and it makes people uncomfortable and defensive. I get that. I can appreciate that people who have a regular paycheck coming, regardless of what occurs or doesn't occur at the council or NIMS, they may have confidence in this process. But please put yourself in the position of a trawl boat owner someone who's struggling to stay profitable. What if you lost your entire mothership season because you didn't have a market and no alternative place to take the fish? What do you tell your crew of five to six people and the families they support? You try to make it up somehow in shoreside whiting, but then you have to lease more whiting to make it work. You still have six and a half percent of the value of every delivery coming off at the dock. You still have 200% monitoring on your dime and a decision about to be made that increases the cost of EM for all participants beginning in 2021. You sit here this morning and you listen to headquarters, avoid the questions asked about EM costs increasing and instead provide a political answer. You still have another 12 million to be paid off on the buyback loan. So that's hanging over your head for the next five years. Make sure you don't have a disaster tow of small hake or short belly, because if you're carrying a camera, you have to bring that fish to shore, even though you could discard it if you carried a human. And even though the fish has no value and the processor doesn't want it, and now the trip is a financial failure, you still have to bring it in, negating any cost savings from the EM system. At the same time, you're wondering if the surveys really will happen and if they are curtailed or abandoned, uh, how does that impact stock assessments and future tax? I received an email on January 8th from an IMPS employee on the bottom trawl survey asking me how I got my fleet tested for COVID prior to the 2020 Hake opener. And while I'm happy to help <laughs> people get connected, isn't this something that should have been done months ago? So I hope you can understand that when I say participants are losing confidence in the process, it is real and it is valid for those businesses that are reliant on the federal fishery management process for their livelihoods. And if I sound angry, I don't mean to. I hope though that you are hearing how frustrating it is to be in this process seemingly with no relief in sight, seeing everything as a constant battle, literally having to fight for everything against your friends, your colleagues, we don't have the safety net that government workers have. We don't get to work at 60% capacity and get paid 100%. And what if you're a fisherman who's not represented by a trade association, who's trying to navigate this ridiculously complex process, having to take time away from your primary fishing job to participate on the gap or even give public comment? 
It takes years to make needed improvements that result in measurable benefits. I've been in this process for 25 years, and I'm not sure I have ever felt as hopeless in this process as I do right now. I've never seen more polarization, less cooperation, and more digging in as I do right now, and this is not sustainable. There is an urgency for the trawl fleet, for the fixed gear fleet, for the recreational fleet, for all federally managed fisheries to receive the attention they need. And I think you have a difficult job and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Are there questions for Heather? Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Now, now we'll hear from Trent. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Trent Hartill with American Seafoods. <clears throat> we own and operate vessels that participate in the CP and mothership sectors of the whiting fishery. Uh, today, I'd like to speak to the consideration of the emergency rule that was uh, brought up during the open public comment <clears throat> earlier in the meeting. So as you undergo the consideration for this emergency request, and as it relates to this agenda item, I encourage the council to evaluate this emergency request based on its merits and its criteria, and not as a trade-off or a function of the council's workload uh, planning exercise. And in addition, I encourage that the council keep three points at the forefront of your minds as you, as you go through this um, consideration. First is the economic benefits of this request. This emergency action will have direct and immediate impact for the whiting participant. In the absence of an emergency rule, um, it puts thousands of metric tons of whiting at risk of being stranded and the economic benefits being deprived of those participants. Second is why we're asking for this. This emergency action is directly a result of an ongoing global pandemic. That ongoing pandemic creates a risk of a vessel being shut down due to a coronavirus outbreak. The result of which, as, as we know, is approximately a month of lost fishing time. We simply can't make that up or get that time back. Third is the timeliness of the benefit. This emergency request would, would produce an immediate benefit and the, the request provides uh, fast and immediate benefits to participants, as well as it puts in place operational flexibility uh, that is available to others if, the, if additional problems arise during the season. So in conclusion, um, we, I request that, that the council support this action and request that the agency uh, move forward on, on implementing it. Um, and with that, I, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Trent. Are there any questions of Trent? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Trent, for your comment. So that concludes public comment and would take us to council discussion and action, but looking at the clock, uh, it does seem like we're due for a lunch break. Um, prefer to keep that somewhat less than a full hour since we're behind schedule. And also I would expect that when we come back from lunch, we will uh, take up salmon if uh, the salmon folks are ready. So uh, if we were to take a, uh, 47 minute lunch break uh, that would bring us back I think at 110 um, so we'll we'll be back at 110 uh, I'll just let me just ask Chuck if he has uh, any forecasts on whether salmon might be ready by then <clears throat> thanks mr. chair uh, well we're um, I think we're almost there. Uh, we've got uh, two states that are ready. We've got one more that's um, still working on things, but we're hoping that uh, they can be ready by then. So um, we've reached out, but uh, I think they've got their heads down. But um, but I think we should plan on uh, coming back and taking our salmon agenda item uh, at 110. And uh, if things don't work out that way, that's, uh, we'll have to deal with it at that time. All right, very good. All right, thanks, Chuck. Thanks, everyone. We'll uh, see you back here at 110.
Just for those of you that are uh, listening but not looking, uh, we've decided to reconvene at 1:15 uh, and and do Sam and then. So that's our that's our plan now. Stand by. Thank you, Chair.
Okay, we're going to get started here in a minute. Looks like they're going to start with Sam and everybody. You want to move to the council floor. Robin, why don't you hold off on that for a minute? Mark, can you uh, check my messages? Yes, I saw them both. Then, uh, then I would suggest that uh, that we move on to uh, ground fish and right. take salmon after. Uh, Get a logical sounds, breaking point. Logical breaking point sounds good. Uh, so it sounds like salmon has uh, been delayed a little bit more. So, um, so we will move back into council discussion for uh, G two uh, work ground fish workload new management measure priorities. Right, and we delayed our start in order to accommodate SAMA, but unfortunately that didn't work. So it, it's 1.15, we'll resume on agenda item G2, and uh, we have the actions there on the screen, which is to review the list of uh, proposed projects, amendments, and new management measures, consider overall workload, and provide guidance on priorities and schedules. Um, we've heard quite a bit of public comment. We've had, we've heard from many different, um, management entities and advisory bodies. Um, and now it's time for us at the council to, to consider all of this and to start with our discussion. So I'll look for a hand. We also have, by the way, recall the uh, a request uh, for uh, to put an emergency action on uh, the agenda later in the week. So, uh, Bush Smith. Uh, y yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to I'd like maybe ad address a couple things that we heard in public comment, not only under this agenda item, but the the last one also um, for the discussion. I um, I truly think this council process is is a, a great one, and and many of you heard me testify to that fact uh, many times. And actually, when I uh, am representing, go out and MREP and and other places to speak on the PFMC process. But you know, we've heard a couple things um, by people uh, from industries that um, that I think we ought to we had to listen to a little bit and, and take to heart. Um, you know, the, it seems like there's some disconnect, um, on this process that, uh, that, um, blame is on no one, but it's not easy to sit on the other side of that and testify to the fact that, um, things aren't going so well and things aren't working like they used to. And I think every once in a while, no matter how good the process is, we need to look at that and listen to what uh, things are going. I don't think these people are, are, are some people that just get up from the hip and, and start speaking. Um, they've got a trust and a, and a, and a years of working within this process. And, and I, I'd offer that, I, that maybe a subset of the council and the GMT, the leaders, uh, Chuck maybe, um, and Noah, sit in a room and, and, and see how we can make this better. I think that we've had uh, a big overturn, turnover in the last five or six years. It's adding to this uh, workload issue and things not being you know done and hearing no all the time and all the things that we've heard and I think that it would make, you know, this is a partnership and, uh, and, and I think the, the partners should get 
get together and, and see and, and listen to one another and, and see how we can work on this. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I would offer to sit on something like that, but, but there are probably more people, there's probably better people that could do this. Um, but I really think it's time that, uh, alongside this issue that, that, uh, we sit down and see if we can, if we can make this better, because right now it doesn't appear to be working as smooth as it could or maybe has in the past. And, and that, and that's all, Mr. Chair. Th thank you. Thanks for those comments, Butch. <clears throat> well, I imagine we'll, we'll, we may move forward um, here um, with motions. Um, I don't know that we're ready for them yet. Uh, I don't want to shortchange any discussion, but um, Maggie Summer followed by Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, it, you know, and I do want to, uh, I guess, express my thanks for the remarks Butch just made. Uh, I certainly agree with the um, the fact that there are concerns about capacity, uh, particularly in moving items uh, on into regulation after the council has made decisions, but also including just getting them through the council process. Um, it is certainly frustrating for members of the public when they ask me about how long changes will take, and I, I can only reply uh, usually at least several years for almost everything. Um, I certainly understand there are constraints for a variety of reasons, many of which we don't see, uh, but that doesn't make them any less valid. I appreciate Ms. Ames' information on staffing this morning. Um, you know, increased capacity and, and staffing could be one part of a solution, and I'd certainly strongly encourage the West Coast region to, to recognize and seek that, and the rest of us to, to keep that in mind as we have opportunities um, to uh, weigh in and, and potentially help facilitate that. Uh, so certainly, I just wanted to recognize that uh, the, the workload capacity issue. Uh, it, in general, we have, um, you know, I, one of our tasks today is to, uh, to confirm or, or revise our priorities on the items that have already been prioritized. And I just thought I'd, I'd pitch out there that uh, for me, I, I would agree with maintaining a priority on moving forward with the mothership utilization item, the non troll RCA item, and the Emily Platt EFP into regulations, uh, and also that continuing to make progress on gear switching is important. Uh, when we are ready for motions, I'm happy to jump back in with a suggestion for an addition to the list. Thank you very much, Maggie. Kyle Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to speak to the interest in uh, the prohibition for directed fishery for short belly rockfish. Uh, in general, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service supports what has been brought up today, and we, we view that the importance of this species to the ecosystem as a forage fish, fish especially for endangered birds, salmon, and other creatures in the area is very important. And we, much like was said in the public comment, would like to see those sorts of measures put in place before there is a conservation urgency, I believe it was called, because by that time we all know that oftentimes it's too difficult or too far down the road to effectively manage so we just want to speak to our support for uh, having some sort of move forward on the prohibition of that directed fishery. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Louis M. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I asked a question earlier of Ms. Weinstein um, about in-season action and such. And so I did an extended review of our work in June. And, and I, I found that we did discuss doing, if there was a reaching a 2000 ton uh, limit 
or ceiling or whatever you want to call it on uh, short belly that uh, we could act in in season or in a specs management, in a specs thing. And we did spell out uh, in discussion that uh, uh, we would be, uh, could include, but not be limited to area closures, gear prohibitions, bycatch limits, seasonal closures, permits, and then we said, et cetera, whatever that is. And so reviewing that discussion in, in June, um, I think that we have uh, a lot of avenues to take if this problem rears its somewhat ugly head. And though I would like to see a directed, uh, something specific about not having a directed fishery, I, I'm afraid that what we've done already uh, is going to be sufficient at this time, and I don't want it to compete with some of the other very pressing matters. So though, so though I have much sympathy for um, the uh, ecosystem uh, importance and forage importance of short belly, I, I think what we established in June is, is probably enough for us to go on at this time. Now, if catches really start rising up, we're going to have to address it. And that's very clear. It was very clearly stated. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Further discussion? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I thought I would express this, just a couple of thoughts on several different topics that have been raised here in um, the discussion, understanding that we're behind <laughs> um, and in terms of schedule. Um, I guess uh, first off is the, on the short belly rockfish piece. Um, I think the concern um, that, that came out of the discussion relative to the in potential for taking some unspecified in-season management action if 2,000 tons were reached is there is nothing, there was nothing put in regulation. Uh, I remember Asia uh, saying that, that uh, bringing that to our attention that they would not be putting anything uh, into regulation in terms of any specific um, response. Uh, and so the degree to which we have the kind of flexibility uh, that, that um, Louis referenced to me is uncertain. Um, uh, but I, um, you know, given the, the, the history in terms of uh, the bycatch of that species and the desire of the industry to avoid them, um, uh, I, I would not um, advocate in, you know, to take additional steps um, in that direction. Instead, I would rather, uh, relative to short belly rockfish, focus on uh, kind of scoping uh, out the questions that we were asked uh, to answer in terms of what, what a process might look like, what the workload is, timeline associated with prohibiting a directed fishery, uh, exactly what timeline that would be put on in terms of responding to those questions. Uh, I'll leave I'll leave open my uh, my my perspective on that until we get to a motion and see the balance of the things that we need to consider. But I do think it's important. I don't think we should wait until it's that there's an urgent need to do it because I think it'll be harder then than it is taking action to be proactive, which is what I would suggest. Uh, I too, um, like Maggie, support moving forward with the mothership utilization, um, the non troll RCA modifications, the Emily Platt piece, um, and I uh, on the on the emergency rule. Um, I would like to think that we 
as as Mr. Waldeck spoke to in his testimony that while the um, the emergency is a bit different and it is not one we could have anticipated when we looked at this question a year ago, I think the the analysis of the action um, is largely the same, and I'm hoping and anticipating there isn't a big workload associated with moving forward uh, on that proposal. And then lastly, Mr. Chairman, I would just um, speak a bit to what we heard um, from um, some longtime participants in this process, who I, whom I have a great deal of respect for, as I know a lot of us do around the table. Um, and um, and and suggest that we we need to think about this carefully about because if they, they they're I mean what you heard today is a culmination that has been building up over time. And um, I feel some of that frustration too, to be sure. Um, and we've had a lot of change um, in the people that are staffing um, at, at, in terms of at National Marine Fishery Service and at GMT. We've had a, you know, we've had a, you know, some turnover around the council table. Um, and uh, we've had some changes in council um, staff that are supporting brownfish. Um, and I, we need to take what they are saying seriously. And we need to be thinking about, and I would ask our, the members of our groundfish family um, that are in NIMPS, that are in the GMT, that are part of the council staff to be thinking about having a conversation about what they heard um, because um, and and what they might have to bring back to us to address those concerns because they in my mind are the people they don't like to hear that kind of feedback as and neither do we um, but it is a real um, a, a real um, issue and I think we need to be willing to, to talk about it and look for ways uh, to address the concerns that, that were brought forward. And, and I, I mean, I know it's, um, it's not easy to bring those kinds of comments forward to a process that you've been a part of for a long time and, and have a high degree of um, respect for, which I think they do, or they wouldn't, wouldn't have bothered. So I'll, I'll close there, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to the motion and perhaps a further comment on the motion if, if uh, warranted. Thanks. Thanks for those thoughtful comments. Well, Louis Zim. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very impressed by Chair Anderson's comments and and uh, his long-term knowledge of process and what needs to be done. I just went back and, and looked at what uh, Asia pr proposed to us uh, regarding sh short belly. And she did say that there would not be a 2000 metric ton evaluation trigger in the regulations, but she did suggest that we could either include it in a council operating procedure or build it into, the, into an FMP, into the FMP. So if we do go the uh, the route that Phil uh, has suggested, th those are two ways that we could go. Thank you, Louie. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I would be prepared to offer a motion addressing only the short belly item, uh, if that's your pleasure. Yeah, I think that's a discreet matter that it would be good to uh, focus on. It and get us started on all the other matters we have before us. Perfect. So proceed. Sandra. Um, 
I move the council add an item titled prohibition on directed fishing for short belly rockfish to the list of potential ground fish management measures and consider in June of 2021 whether to include it in the 2023-2024 ground fish harvest specifications and management measures. All right, Maggie, the language on the screen is accurate? Yes. All right, I'll look for a second. It looks like Phil Anderson is seconding uh, your motion. Please speak to your motion. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank Audubon and Oceana for their recommendations on this issue and uh, council members for some uh, discussion just now. This council's designation of short belly as an ecosystem component species uh, was a recognition of its value as forage and the fact that it's not currently targeted and that we don't want it to be. Uh, I remain supportive of prohibiting a directed fishery before it's an urgent issue as we have been talking about this morning, afternoon. Uh, and I recall that some of the preliminary work on uh, prohibition included some exploration of ideas and discovery of issues with those that will need further thought and development, uh, including collaboration with industry. And of course, there may be new ideas uh, not contemplated in the prior efforts. So I am anticipating this will take um, a, a sizable amount of time and collaborative work. Um, this motion would add development of a prohibition uh, into the new management measure at this time, management measure list at this time without any priority assigned. Uh, and then it would um, indicate that we plan to discuss in June when we get to planning for our 2023-24 ground fish specs, uh, whether it, it seems appropriate to include this item in the scope of that action or not. So I would ask council staff and the GMT to note that interest uh, and hopefully provide any additional input they can in preparation for that meeting on uh, the implications of including it in the specs pathway or moving it along separately. Um, I just wanted to reiterate as, as we have touched on this morning that based on the extensive information presented uh, in the council's discussions that led to EC designation. Uh, I don't see an interest in directed fishing for short belly is imminent um, and quite the opposite. Our existing fisheries are actively avoiding them. Uh, but we all recognize the, the concerns due to increasing activities and interest in aquaculture in particular, and we don't want to put ourselves in the position of reacting to a problem rather than preventing one. So this motion, uh, again, indicates our intent to address it and explore the best, best path to take. Uh, I also want to, um, to acknowledge and appreciate the collaborative discussions so far between some of the uh, NGO representatives and industry members and encourage continued engagement as we heard um, some suggestions for today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Maggie. Are there questions? Uh, for Maggie on her motion or council discussion. Marcy Remco. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Maggie, for the motion. Um, I certainly agree with the intent. Um, I think I, I have a question for you on the June 2021 or 21 placeholder um, regarding um, making a decision at that time about including it in the brownfish harvest specs. Um, I'm struggling with that only because um, I'm wondering if we need to do that here and now um, because I feel like we haven't had any discussion yet on the content of the upcoming specs package and what room there's going to be in that vehicle um, and what else is going to um, be necessary uh, in response to the new specifications that will emerge from our stock assessments. Um, I agree with you that um, placement for this prohibition is uh, may very naturally pair in the next spec cycle, um, but I'm also feeling like if we signal that that's where we want the short belly item to go. Um, there are a number of other things on the list in table B that might also very naturally pair with the specs cycle too. And so I just 
I have some concern about an early signal that that is going to be the vehicle that we're looking to. Um, at the same time, I um, I appreciate that it's it would be nice to have a vehicle identified, and um, I'm just wondering, you know, if we do it for the short belly item, do we need to do it for the others? So I'm just wondering if um, you've given that some some thought, and maybe you can explain a little more about how we. Um, how we start building that box for the specs when, you know, I think we have yet to learn a lot about the actual stock assessments and what might be needed. So, thanks. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Marcy, thank you for that question. That uh, brings up actually some, some very important points. There may uh, indeed be other items that uh, we will want to put into specs and we will need to evaluate all of the potential candidates together at the same time and, and decide what makes the most sense, what we have capacity for. Uh, and it seemed to me to make the most sense to do that at our June meeting when we begin our planning for specs. So I, I don't intend this motion to give any signal that specs will be the pathway. Uh, it's um, Really, my intent was to do two things here. One is to respond to the uh, suggestion, which I thought was a, a good one, in the public comment letter uh, that we we consider whether specs is a good pathway for this. And two, to signal in, in particular to those who will be involved in preparing for that June meeting. As I, I said earlier, that's certainly council staff and GMT members. Um, perhaps others to um, think about that in advance and bring some information to the council to help us consider in June whether it, it whether we want to include this item in specs or whether a separate pathway seems like the best way to go. Okay, looking for further questions, uh, Marcy Yaremko. Yeah, if I may, um, Mr. Chair, I know we're trying to hurry along, so I'm I'm not going to propose an amendment to this motion to strike the ground for specs item for clarity. I, I think Maggie's discussion on this and and what we're asking of the GMT um, is is clear from this discussion. But I just um, you know in in voting. Uh, in the affirmative on this motion, I, I just do not want it to be suggested that we wouldn't be looking at other things on the table to possibly pair with the specs, um, because I think that is part of the GMT's um, analysis that they will bring to us come June. So um, I appreciate um, that discussion and, and just that um, we all remember what we'll be asking for the GMT in June. Thank you. Brad, you need to unmute. <clears throat> Brad, we're not hearing you if you're talking. Um, Sure. There, now I got you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd just like to say this is quite a different discussion than we had uh, 20 years ago about ground fish. Uh, we're talking about a, a fish that uh, no one wants to catch or process. In fact, it's a nuisance by golly to the fleet that is uh, catching it. Um, you know, bycatch is a function of the abundance. And uh, the fact that this the quota was 50 metric ton uh, for the beginning years of the quota program. Um, and we didn't exceed that. Um, I would say to those folks who are concerned that the, the um, fact that we're catching more probably indicates there's more fish around. Um, and if you look at the recruitment, um, that we, we heard from uh, last year, uh, we're probably gonna have a lot more of that potentially. Um, so uh, with that, I, I'll support the motion, um, especially since it's in the context that we'll have the um, uh, the new, I believe the, the assessment would be 
or would it be? I believe that as long as the assessment, by golly, we know what the, that new assessment is, and so we can really fully understand the the, um, uh, the environment we're working in as far as the uh, amount of fish in the ocean. So anyway, that's all. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I wanted to offer one, one more remark to clarify my request of, of the GMT and staff. And staff. I, I would not be expecting any kind of extensive scoping of uh, a, a short belly directed fishing prohibition in advance of the June meeting. Uh, but I know that the GMT is, is fully subscribed and we have had extensive discussions about workload and capacity today and I, I am not intending uh, you know, this, this signal that we in June we will consider whether the specs is a good pathway for it uh, to really add to that workload burden. And certainly workload will be a big consideration when we have that discussion about specs and which items from the management potential management measures list, if any, should be added to it. Uh, so my my intent is uh, that staff and or the GMT bring us um, really just some, some very preliminary thoughts on um, pros and cons and potentially any, any timing issues related to adding this item to specs in June, but not extensive scoping. Thank you, Maggie. Further discussion on the motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Maggie, thanks so much for getting us started here. So we've got uh, a short belly with something we needed to deal with and have. So uh, we've got, uh, there's the existing priority items. There has been requests to prioritize other items and we have the request for some agenda time to consider um some emergency regulations so marcy remco yes thank you mr chair um i have a second motion on this agenda item oh god bless you go ahead all right sandra thank you i move that the council adopt from reports and agenda item g2 one, the corrections clarifications to Appendix 2, Table B for GMT reports 1 and 2. Number two, decouple the CalCod conservation area piece from the non trawl RCA item as described in the CDFW report and supported by the GAP so that there will be a standalone item to repeal the CCA listed on Table B. Three, Continue to maintain the mothership utilization and non trawl RCA Emily Platt item on table A as priority item as recommended by the GAP. And four, add the following new item to table B Lingcod trip adjustments north of 4010 in the salmon troll fishery. Okay, Marcy, is the language on the screen complete and accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right, may I, I'm gonna look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley, please speak to your motion. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate the work of the GMT and the GAP um, to go through the current priority lists and the current list, uh, as well as the efforts by council staff to um, summarize these lists and present um, a an overview to us on the process forward. Um, I think I just want to preface it by noting that um, there are an awful lot of lists and they aren't exactly the same, um, which is why I felt like we would be, we would benefit from having um, 
some of these items laid out clearly in motion so that um, there was no lack of uh, understanding as to our intent. Um, when I think about the table B list, which is our comprehensive um, list of items on the potential ground fish management measure items um, that are not in priority order, nor are they scheduled on the year to glance. Um, there are quite a number of them. Um, the GMT does a great job to um, make sure that they're all still necessary um, and that they are up to date. Um, but I, I feel like we, um, we do a pretty good job making sure that um, the things on this list are things we all agree are, um, are necessary, that there's been an, an adequate showing of need, but that we're not, um, you know, we have yet to prioritize them. Um, either because we um, haven't had or seen a vehicle for them to move forward in, or it hasn't um, been taken care of in um, some other discussion or, um, an, or the need, you know, hasn't changed in terms of priority. So um, I feel like um, we would be well suited to add um, an item for the Lingcod trip limit adjustments north of 4010 in the salmon troll fishery based on the recommendations that we heard um, today, uh, acknowledging that um, the GMT may evaluate this item and give us some feedback as to um what analysis is needed or if um action is appropriate or possible under an in-season agenda item so I, i'd rather have this item as a placeholder on the list recognizing that we will not be back at this uh, g2 type discussion uh until june um as for the uh item one in my motion, I um, just wanted to um, support the GMT's recommended cleanups on appendix two um, that they've described in their reports. Um, and then on the decoupling the cow cut area piece from the non troll RCA item, um, the CDFW report provides a pretty detailed explanation as to why we see these two items um, being separate. Um, on the lists with the um, non troll RCA Emily Platt item remaining on table A as a priority. Um, the Calcutt area um, <clears throat> piece now appears to kind of not be on the same trajectory or in the same type of um, analysis that um, is taking shape with regard to the other non troll RCA discussions. And meanwhile, um, the cow cod conservation areas um, remain um, a, a part of our regulations. They're something that we need to conduct outreach on, we need to enforce, and we need to uh, be able to um, explain as to um, why the regulations are uh, continue to be necessary. So. Uh, I appreciate adding this item as a standalone uh, item on the list. Um, thinking to Maggie's discussion on short belly and the um, natural pairing of the short belly item or what what we what might be a natural pairing of that item in the specs process, I would say the same might be true uh, for the Calcod conservation area item um, as we are. Uh, viewing this as largely a cleanup item. So um, it may very naturally um, fit in the scope of the specifications package um, when we get to um, looking at that and considering what might fit in that um, box. I, I just didn't want to take the step to presume that at this time, um, but again, felt that um, it's very important that we maintain the CalCod conservation item repealer on um, the table B list. Um, just a few other comments uh, in response to the overall discussion that we've had here today. I'm, I'm a little concerned um, back to the dialogue with NIMFS and their 
table that they have in their workload. I think um, just a bit of the interchange that I had with Brian Hooper and also the interchange that Phil had with Brian, um, you know, that there are items on that list that have yet to be included on the priority list. So I'm, I'm thinking of the widening EFP items um, that are, that appear in the NIMS table. Um, they have yet to be added to the priority list. So um, I likewise had concern with those two EFP concepts being itemized in a single line item on the NIMS table. Um, I think I'd want to have a lot of discussion um, before um, grouping those two concepts together um, in a consideration of, of EFP discussions. Um, I kind of remain unclear about the timeline of such um, EFP proposals that we might receive. Um, if we need to have them on a faster track than specs, then um, I'm not sure what to say or do about that um, because I thought the EFPs for specs were running on a September schedule. So I'll look forward, I guess, to hearing more about that in June. Um, but I would note that, you know, the NIMS report uh, might give an impression that we've agreed to add those items to the list, but I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, on the appendix that is, I think, appendix three right now in the GMT report, which is the table of items completed through the workload planning and prioritization process, I would recommend that we not try to do that right now. Um, I, I know the GMT responded to a request from the GAP to provide a list of the items that had come to completion through this process, but we have an awful lot of other agenda items and processes that are ongoing. And I don't know that we need, that there's any value in trying to partition an action as being an outcome of the prioritization process or an outcome of some other process. I'm thinking about discussions that we might have under say um, electronic monitoring or SAMTAC um, where, um, you know, or specifications. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know that, you know, it's um, necessary to reflect kind of the origin of where an action came from. And just noting that um, the GMT and um, Todd and his overview kind of came up with different answers when asked to recap what actions came out of the prioritization process. They, they came up with different answers. And I'd rather not um, spend time trying to have folks um, partition items in a box as to where the origin was. Um, you know, I think we're much more fluid and organic than that. And um, so I would just, I think, recommend as we try to simplify and try to make headway in this, this uh, very complex process um, upon process that we've built for ourselves, um, that maybe we at least pause on trying to um, compile a table of items completed through the workload planning and prioritization process. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, are there questions for maker of the motion? Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, thank you for the motion, Marcy. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for including the LINCOD trip limit adjustment north of 4010 on the list. Um, I'm gonna, I support the motion and we'll vote in favor of it, but I also want to um, make sure that within this, that we also um, have a request that this that the GMT and council staff look at this and and bring it back in April, um, so we can look at it at relative to whether or not an in season option 
is available um, for the 2021 um, salmon troll season. So I'd like to consider it in both ways. In the event that an in-season action for 2021 isn't available, I think putting it on the, the list for, for um, further prioritization is, is necessary here since there's not a, a ground fish management prioritization in April. Um, but I also want to make it clear that there is, we'd like to make the request to the GMT to come back in April with an exploration of whether or not in season is a, is a doable path. I know there was an analysis in the 2019, 2020 specs that was done looking at this uh, with the hope that we could look at these ran landing ratios in the salmon troll fishery um, on a more in season type approach. So maybe looking at that analysis. And um, anyway, I, I heard you mention that Marcy, I just wanted to make sure that that request was, was clear here. Other, any other questions for maker of the motion or discussion on this motion? I'm not seeing any hands, so I will call the question. All, the, all those in favor say aye. 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 No. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Marcy, for the motion. Okay, we still have business to do here, so I'll look forward to additional discussion or a further motion. We have at the very least the decision whether to make agenda time for uh, the, the requested uh, emergency action. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick, and, and that's that's what I'd like to uh, start the discussion on here, too, is the, the public comment that we heard and the request to add an agenda item to this meeting to consider um, an emergency rule for the whiting fishery. And I guess, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the prioritization issue and um, frustration with workload and, and all of that, and I... I just keep thinking about how we were on a path um, for a streamlined specs process where it would just be um, specs issues and, and management measures would be considered as standalone items. And you know that's where this uh, ground fish workload list kind of came from. And, and so when the time was right, we could look at that list and, and get started on the real work and I feel like we got that process started and were uh, hit by the uh, the freight train of, of the pandemic. And so things really changed and it feels like we're trying to get things on track. And um, I know even just in uh, our own work life at WDFW, it's been a challenging year. So um, in acknowledgement of all of that frustration, you know, I think the issue that the whiting fishery has faced um, really points to um, a need for special consideration or special emergency action. We're still in the midst of a midst of a pandemic. It's it's ongoing. I think beyond where I could have even imagined when we uh, met in person last March. Uh, so, but I think um, appreciate council discussion on this. I know it's a it's a workload issue. Um, would like to understand from NIMS what, what putting an emergency action or approving an emergency action would do uh, to other workload priorities. Um, looking ahead, so uh, just like to tee up that conversation here. All right, thanks for teeing that up, Heather. And I will look to see who wants to join in that discussion? Uh, 
I'm not seeing uh, anyone. Oh, Kelly Ames. Thank you, Kelly. And you'll need to unmute yourself. Still showing us muted here, Kelly. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I, I took that as a question from Ms. Hall, so I'll do my best here to respond. Um, you know, there are certainly some short-term workload implement, impl implications of an emergency rule that, you know, would affect some of our existing workload priorities. Uh, there are multiple pathways to accomplish an emergency rule that have varying levels of workload. Uh, the decision on that regulatory pathway involves multiple groups, and we won't really have a determination on that until after the council meeting. We will certainly seek the most efficient pathway. However, you know, if, if we need to take that more complex pathway to make it a legally defensible action, that would obviously have longer workload implications that could last you know, into the spring, into the summer. Um, but, but these things just simply aren't known. I, I know that you're looking for a level of precision from me exactly how uh, we will balance the workload trade-off if the council makes an emergency rule recommendation to us. Um, I, I cannot provide that to you. Um, what I can say is it is the most important to us to know what your priorities are relative to um, the items that, that I will, you know, refer to in the GMT report one, appendix two, table A. So, so those items that are not required um, by MSA or ESA to be done, those, those options, if we are clear on what the council's priorities are uh, when we are done with the emergency rule, which, which is an all hands on deck approach uh, because it is an emergency rule. Um, you know, when we're done, we would want to know where the council thinks we should best direct our efforts. Thank you, Kelly. Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like at this time to channel my inner Butch Smith and reflect back to the climate and communities uh, meetings that we had and what we took out of that is that we need more flexibility in regulation and our approaches to regulations. Um, I, I th believe that we ascertained during that process that this kind of thing is going to hit us more and more and we didn't even talk about COVID. Uh, so I just want people to start thinking about perhaps some sort of framework to deal with this kind of uh, issue that keeps popping up and not have this become a re regular uh, occurrence that on every meeting or almost every meeting, we have an emergency action that pushes other things apart. So I just want people to think, put their thinking caps on in the long term and try to come up with a framework that would guide us, perhaps a new COP or something. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Uh, uh, Maggie and then Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that, you know, in listening to, to Louie's remarks, I, I think in one way we have one portion of a, a framework to address an aspect of this already in the works, which is our longer term mothership utilization uh, issue that we have we are scoping coming up next at this meeting um, recognizing that does not address the need uh, for proposed for this emergency rule for this year uh, but I, I certainly agree with overall the the concern that uh, whether it's climate change or other factors um, we 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 do need more flexibility in our management approaches um, you know, we have, as we've been saying, we have a number of, of items we have already prioritized. We are looking for uh, lasting solutions to some of these challenges in our fisheries so that we aren't uh, in a position of having to consider emergency rules frequently. 
Um, I, I certainly am, am considering the merits of the request for this emergency rule. Um, I don't think they can be separated from workload considerations, and, and that goes for any action, not just this one. We, we evaluate and prioritize everything based on its merits and how much time and effort it will take to realize those and, and what the trade-offs with other, uh, other things we could be working on are. Um, I, I will say I, I understand from Ms. Ames that, that we, we can't have any certainty right now on specifically what the implications of uh, recommending an emergency rule now to the National Marine Fisheries Service would be. Um, I, I guess I would say that my priorities would remain uh, with the things we have already identified as priority on the list, the table A in GMT report appendix two that uh, Ms. Ames referenced, and I would not want to see this uh, get in the way of making progress on a, a longer term solution for the, the whiting fisheries and the other fisheries affected by items on that list. And I, I will say I am, I, I think like all of us, I, I find it very frustrating to be in this position of, of having to make this kind of choice because I, I certainly don't want to uh, discount the, the needs that have been raised in the request and the potential merits of it. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Maggie, for uh, your remarks. And um, I want to just follow up for a second on um, a comment made by Ms. Ames that um, you know they will do their best to help us prioritize this item or help us figure out where this item fits in the priority list. And I'm hoping that maybe um, she can help me do that because I'm I think still kind of struggling with um, whether this need this new need rises to um, the to to a case where we would make the decision to put it at the very very front of our list. Um, my particular difficulty is with putting it at the front of the list a second time. Um, I think we we spoke pretty clearly um, back last spring when we uh, took. To priority to, to prioritize the need for um, the council to make um, the recommendation it did um, using um, an emergency process and amending its own agenda to take this item up in the queue uh, ahead and in front of other items already agendized and put out for public um, review. So. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a need for us to consider um, whether we displace the efforts of the GMT this week uh, to account for this emergency, as, as they indicated in their statement. Um, it may mean uh, derailing some of their work on statements and, and upcoming items uh, that we have yet to hear about this week um, or uh, result in them not being able to fully participate in discussions on um, things like workload planning and EM and in season. So that's weighing on me. Um, and then there's the piece uh, with regard to NIMFs that's also weighing on me, asking NIMFs to um, undertake um, a second emergency action with content that is uh, remarkably similar to um, the action that was taken last year. So um, Kelly, if you can help me um, in thinking about this, can can you explain um, with regard to the review and approval process? I, I, I know folks are hoping that we're going to get some savings um, in terms of review and approval and preparation of, of documents. Um, but I believe that this would be an action that would need to be reviewed on its own independent merit and separate from the previous action, as the previous action um, not only um, has it expired, but um, it, it had the chance to be renewed for a second 180-day period. So maybe if you can help me understand a little more 
um, about the um, review process that NIMFS will undertake um, should the council make a decision to prioritize this emergency uh, at the top of our list. Kelly. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Remco. If an emergency rule would be recommended by the council, indeed, we would be updating the same regulations as in 2020. However, as you point out, the rationale for the rule would need to be updated and based on the specific circumstances in 2021. And so it's not a direct copy and paste from 2020. Um, in addition, as, as I mentioned, the regulatory pathway in 2021 might need to be different than what was done in 2020 um, based on guidance that we'll receive from general counsel. So there are different things in play here. Um, you know, again, because it is an emergency rule, it would be an all hands on deck approach to get it published as soon as possible. Uh, so there would be some displacement of work. Heather. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Kelly. Um, Marcy asked uh, her question was getting at where where I was headed, and and that was specifically whether or not there's efficiencies to um, the rulemaking, and and like you said, update it would be updating the same regulation but it might need to go on a different pathway. So I was just trying to get more clarity on whether or not um, the, the data and the information that the, the GMT put together for this emergency rule last time would be helpful. I know when we took that action, uh, it was pretty impressive what the GMT put together. And, and even though the specific reasons for this are, are slightly different, there's a lot of similarities. So I um, was just hoping to hear more and I, I think you you touched on it but if there's any hope that there's efficiency created um, in updating this emergency rule um, that would be important to know particularly as you know we're looking at um, at the April agenda and and how it, or if that would change what what we would be looking at for say the the non troll RCA scoping agenda item or the Sablefish um, gear switching agenda item. And anyway, I guess if you have more to add to that, then great. But I, I do realize that Marcy kind of uh, touched on that question. So thanks. So Heather's your question basically would moving forward on the emergency action uh, put in jeopardy any of the regulatory items on the April council agenda. Is that a? Yeah, that's fair. Thank you, Chair. All right. And that's so it, and that's a question to Kelly? Yes. Okay. So Kelly, and then I'll come back to Phil. Uh, through the chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hall. You know, definitely we anticipated to be spending significant time between the end of the March meeting to prepare for the April council meeting. And so, yes, there, you know, that would impact our ability to prepare for those agenda items to what extent, again, that is unknown at this time. Thank you, Kelly. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So my understanding, and um, I know Heather has a good understanding of this, maybe better than mine, as well as Maggie and maybe others around the table, is that um, what's at stake here is the ability of some um, number of um, catcher boats uh, who have a quota in the shoreside co-op, or excuse me, the mothership co-op, uh, be able uh, and have a market for their fish through a mothership operation this year. 
um, and that uh, the communications between uh, the, the one case in particular is such that in order for them to feel, um, um, in order for them to make a wise business decision, um, and that is to operate as a mothership in the first part of the year, they need some assurance that they will have the flexibility to be able to modify that operation and go to and operate as a CP later in the year. And if they're not able, if they don't have that, some level of certainty that that is that same level of flexibility that was provided last year would be in place this year, uh, then that will force them to make the business decision not to operate as a mothership, and it will strand uh, the fish that are, are um, owned and or controlled by those catcher vessels. So it seems it's, if I have that correct, and I'm happy to be corrected, um, then um, this idea that we have to do a bunch of work between now and April, I, I don't uh, believe is necessary. If there is an intent to move forward with the emergency rule, um, uh, and I believe last year it didn't get in place until June, Kelly can or others can correct me, uh, but it is it is uh, to have that um, high degree of certainty or high probability, likelihood, whatever, however you would like to describe it, that we're moving forward with the implementation of the emergency rule such that it gives that flexibility to those vessels that are operating both as, can, can operate both as motherships and, and catcher processors. Uh, the, the, uh, then that allows them to make that business decision and prevents those fish from being stranded and prevents that huge economic loss to those uh, uh, owners of that of those quota pounds. So I, I just put that out there, saying I mean we're 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 acting like we've got to do all this in the next three weeks and or four weeks and we and we don't to accomplish the objective here of the emergency rule, which is to give the flexibility to these vessels that will in turn provide a market for these vessels uh, and uh, not put them in a position where they have to strand or leave on the table these tens of thousands of dollars of fish. Thank you, Phil. I think the time element is really critical to keep in mind. Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I agree with Phil. Phil's got it got it right. I just I think that those uh, it, it we've heard that the that the assurance that the that it's being promulgated the emergency rule would be enough for the that ship to come to the grounds in May when the season starts. We heard that in public testimony and open comment. I think it's important and realize that this amount of fish that's being stranded that this processor typically takes is about 25% of the mothership uh, allocation that I think about four boats share. And I believe that, uh, you know, to if we don't have this in place to go forward, that fish will be stranded because the flexibility for that boat to commit in May um, can't be there if they have a COVID incident like they talked about. So I think it's really important that we do that. I also, I am concerned about all the other issues. And I think they're all, you know, we obviously prioritize them and they're all important even, you know, the, to the entire mothership sector. It's very important. But, you know, uh, there is a... <clears throat> This has been a few years that they've been stranded without without being able to take their fish on some of those vessels, and uh, I think we it, it you know we've we agree we 
thought this was an emergency last year. COVID prevented it from being used because it wasn't done early enough. I think that uh, we can fix that this year, but it's the same basic deal, that I, the same basic request I see. And I guess if we can figure out between now and April whether or not it, that is a, you know, uh, the, the effect of, of, of uh, putting forth an emergency rule and that has been, that is basically was done last year and how much workload that really it, uh, entails. And it, I would assume it would be less than it was, than it was originally that we should go, we should be able to do this. We should be able to, you know, uh, satisfy this. COVID is just wreaking havoc with everyone. And, and, you know, it, we're seeing it every day in everything we do. So um, I would just, I, I would be supportive of, of moving this forward. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Brad Pettinger, followed by Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gorolnik. Um, I go back to what uh, Kelly had to say. Um, see, there was there was a um, a range, a range of um, on what they could do to get a emergency rule in place, and um, it depended on um, a lot of issues, I guess. Uh, one was the rationale. The main one is the you know basically is it is the rationale legal, legally defensible uh, defensible. Um, I'm kind of curious. That doesn't seem like that. Should, this isn't a high priority item as far as um, what the Ed council and IGC involves with. It's, we're talking about a, an issue that isn't ESA related. It's not. We're talking about overfished uh, um, species. You know, resources isn't threatened. We're talking about a closed class of processors um, willing to or wanting to see um, a mothership. Uh, be operated as a mothership and a catcher processor in the same year. And I haven't heard anybody in that closed class speak out against this. So it seems like to me that it would, it would um, the options they have before them, the easier one would kind of rise to the top. I don't know what that is. I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer by any means. Uh, I'm not in their shop, but it just seems to me that, um, uh, this thing should be fairly easy in the grand scheme uh, relative to everything else that is done uh, in, the, in, the, um, in this arena. Um, now, given that, um, I'm with a lot of the folks, well, most of the folks here are talking about, they don't want to see things slip. Um, but uh, I think that uh, as uh, Phil pointed out, um, you know, we're not talking about something needs to be done by May 15th. Um, this could be finished up by later in the summer. And I think that's a, um, that to me stands out like a, uh, you know, a big, big issue to be uh, taken into consideration here. So, um, anyway, but my vote, whatever I we do here, would depend on uh, what um, National Fisheries Service says uh, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Marcy, followed by Maggie Smith. We can't hear you, Marcy. Yes, you can't hear me because my mute button's on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Talking to myself. Um, one more for Kelly, if I may. Um, I'm, I think, having a hard time really understanding with the opportunity to extend the emergency rule um, that was valid for 180 days. Um, I believe that NIMS had the ability to, um, on its own, uh, without a council recommendation, to make the decision to essentially extend the emergency uh, so that it would um, cover um, a second 180-day period. Um, it sounds like there was some discussion about whether there was a need for the emergency to continue. And um, in that discussion, um, it was concluded, and I'm not sure by whom, um, 
that there was no necessity to continue it. And I guess I'm I'm sitting here wondering, thinking, well, did the council weigh in on that? Um, what would we have said? Um, so I guess I'm I'm hoping you can clarify how um, that decision to not extend the emergency for a second period was reached. And in light of that, um, noting that I think ultimately that's a decision that was made by NIMFS, potentially in consultation with others, um, thinking forward to a new emergency, um, even though the council passes on a recommendation to NIMFS and may ask you to take um, emergency action here again. Um, I guess I'm just um, thinking about um, from your, your side of it. I mean, if you propose an emergency rule, then that means that, you know, you are comfortable with the rationale, the, the justification of need and, and meeting the standards of emergency. So that those are things that NIMS internally has to find itself. So um, I'm guessing, I'm hoping you can explain, or I'm, I'd like if you can to kind of talk about that decision with regard to the second 180-day um, period and the decision making that went on, and how that decision has any bearing, or if it has any bearing, on a new proposed emergency that, that NIMFS would promulgate. So that question is posed to Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Or, or NIMFS. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Marcy for the question. So back in August, we did reach out to the APC Whiting representatives to check in about the status of the emergency rule, the upcoming expiration date, and asked whether there was a desire to extend or a need to extend. And at the time, um, we were told no, that, that there was not a, a need to extend through the rest of 2021. I think also I'd, I would refer you to um, under open public comment, the industry letter, you know, submitted by the Pacific Whiting Conservation Co-op and the other entities, they also directly addressed this. At the time, they did not uh, see a need to extend the rule based on the limited number of days um, that the rule could be extended. Um, so that is on page two of their request. And they basically note that the extension um, would have then covered a time period in which the fishery was not operating. So a January to May 14th uh, timeline. Does that answer your question, Marcy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not, not exactly. Um, I guess I'm just looking at the the fact that NIMFS, you know, relying on that information made the decision not to extend the prior emergency rule. And then um, now you're you're in a position, should the council recommend this emergency action, that NIMFS would then be needing to promulgate a new rule that does uh, well um, would need to promulgate a new rule in reliance on the recommendation of the council uh, to do so. And I'm just wondering if you know the decision. Um, if if you're if you are comfortable with it, should the council recommend such an emergency that you you feel that that is the type of emergency action that you will be able to provide um, sufficient justification in in the rulemaking activities to support. Kelly. 
sure that you're Mr. Enko. I'm, I might not be understanding your question exactly, Marcy, but in general, the agency would not have renewed an emergency rule before ex expiration unless there was a request from industry or from the council to do so. We, we would have needed a rationale to do that. We had heard no rationale, so, so we let the rule expire. Um, Maggie Smith followed by Heather Hall. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Um, I wanted to offer a little bit more information um, to follow up on some remarks by Ms. Ains, who uh, spoke to the potential regulatory pathways and um, how we are still evaluating those. Um, specifically, um, you know, we are evaluating whether or not it is appropriate to waive notice and comment rulemaking under the APA for uh, this emergency. Um, I think the council is aware that in addition to ensuring that the criteria um, under 303C are met for an emergency, um, the agency is also, you know, there's a default under the Administrative Procedure Act that all rulemaking go through notice and comment. Um, and it's a very strong presumption. The agency can only waive notice and comment if there is good cause. And you know, part of good cause is determining whether or not there was really sufficient time in order to solicit comment. Um, and so that, and that is something that is not you know, just up to me. It's not just up to the folks who are sitting here at this table. It gets evaluated at other levels of the agency, um, that NIMS will need to, if NIMS decides it would like to try to waive notice and comment, it will need to write up a, um, you know, a justification for that. And that's, um, I just think an important point to consider that if there is, if there is time, then there is likely time to do um, notice and comment rulemaking, um, which means that there will be two rules instead of one. and. You know, this does happen with emergency rules. Um, it's not terribly common um, because generally there is good cause to waive, um, but it's it's not unheard of and it's it's not unheard of even currently. So I just wanted to provide that background on on sort of what what we're talking about when when we say regulatory pathway. We're basically talking about one rule or two rules. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Heather Hall, followed by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. I just wanted to um, follow up on the, the questions about um, renewing the, the emergency rule from 2020 and just refer back to the um, public comments sub submitted at this meeting and really that, you know, an extension of the 2020 emergency rule would have really largely covered the majority of time when the whiting fishery was closed. So, um, you know, even if they had anticipated the need extending into 2021 and, and, and asked for an extension, it would have, you know, not, not been as effective just given that the, the fishery was closed um, from January 1 to May 14th. So just want to make sure that point was uh, clear. Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ms. Terry. I think I, there was just two points I was going to make. Number one, even if it had been extended, we'd still find ourselves in the same place relative to 2021 as we do today. The extension would have would have expired in the middle of the 2021 season, and so the flexibility for those vessels to participate, either as CPs or mother ships, would have expired along with it. I would just also like to say that, um, there, well, at least for me, I don't know about the rest of you, but at this time last year, or certainly even in November of 20, what was that, 2019, um, there was no way to know what set of circumstances would be confronting our fisheries at, in 2021 
we had no one no one could have uh, could have forecast uh, the kinds of experiences that are but in particular our processing sector both the at sea as, the shore, as well as shoreside have experienced in terms of dealing with this pandemic and it is because of that experience that in this case the catcher processors and other ships dealt with when they had outbreaks on their vessels and were forced to tie up for weeks on end that is what is triggering their 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 request for this emergency rule because they know they're still at risk for that to happen in 2021 and they need to have the flexibility to bring alternative vessels into the fishery as processors in this case in the event that something like that happens again and we're despite the state good state of florida and maybe arizona we are not out of the woods yet in this pandemic a long ways from it and so there is a new emergency and it's based on the experience of what happened in 2020 and that's why these companies that have tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up uh, in how this fishery plays out and the degree to which they can be flexible with their with the capacity that they have to get these fish out of the water is so important. So we have a new emergency um, and and um, we're, we're and there is we do have some a little bit of time here to deal with this emergency, but we don't have enough time to go through a full rulemaking process to a, to address it, uh, which will in part, I think, be in, addressed during the, the mothership utilization piece. But so we have a new emergency. It's based on our experience with this pandemic and the experience of the of the of these uh, processors uh, and what it does to them when they have an outbreak on their vessels and how it takes the entire vessel and the entire processing capacity out of the equation and all of the ripple effect that that has on the people who are catching the fish. I urge you to vote for this motion. Phil, we don't have a motion yet. <laughs> Maybe that's oh, coming though. Well, <laughs> okay, well, when it comes and if it's to support moving forward as an emergency <laughs> rule, I would support it. Um, Okay, we have two other hands raised, uh, Heather and Maggie, Heather Hall and Maggie Summer. I don't know if one of those is for a motion or not, but I'll call them in the order they were raised. Uh, Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I, would, I would like to offer a motion, and Sandra has that, I believe. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I move that the council add another agenda item to the March 2021 council meeting agenda to consider an emergency action that would allow an at sea Pacific whiting processing platform to operate as both a mothership and a catcher processor in the same calendar year during the 2021 whiting fishery. And Heather, that language is accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And looking for a second? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, this is Chuck. I think we should uh, consult our parliamentarian on uh, on this, uh, since I think we are uh, adding something uh, to the agenda, which has already been approved. So uh, perhaps just a quick consult to see if this is the proper um, way to approach that. Right. right. This could be a motion to amend, which may have a certain vote threshold required. <clears throat> so, Dr. Hansen, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, you should move to reconsider the agenda and uh, as one motion that passes and it's a simple majority, then you go to an amendment to vote on that and then back to the final. Okay, thank you for that guidance. So, um, Heather. Mr. You... Mr. Chairman, if I could, it's not strictly uh, just a parliamentary the Administrative Procedures Act should be addressed too. I would think by NOAA GC. 
Okay, well, and what shall we do that? Do you recommend that we do that before we have any motion practice? Yeah, I think it could be very simple. If they say they don't have a problem with it, then you can move on. All right, well then, um, I'll look for a hand um, from, I think Maggie is in the seat. Maggie. I, um, I apologize. I think I missed some of the nuance there. I have a problem with what exactly? Dr. Hansen. Uh, there wasn't public notice that this was coming up and whether there's any problem with the Administrator's Procedure Act or how, what they do need to address it. Um, thank you, Chair Gorelnik and uh, Dr. Hansen. Um, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, um, if the council is contemplating an emergency, notice can be given immediately. Um, and I would say that amending the agenda in this way constitutes immediate notice and therefore um, complies with the act. But thank you for the question. Okay, thank you for that, Maggie. Um, so, oh, so we have a motion on the floor, but it's not been seconded. Um, do you wish to withdraw that, Heather? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, maybe just a quick clarification on Maggie's sure. point. So she said <clears throat> um, amending the or changing the agenda in this way. So is that in the way that recommended by Dr. Hansen or the way recommended by Ms. Hall? Maggie? Thank you. Um, uh, as a legal matter, in terms of MSA compliance, um, I, I, it, does, it doesn't matter. Either way would, would be sufficient. Thank you. All right, so it's not a legal issue, it's a parliamentary issue. My, my preference is, even though it's burdensome, is to follow the proper parliamentary procedure. Uh, unless anyone objects to that, since it should be only take a moment to do. Uh, Heather, you have a pending motion. Uh, Chair Grelnick, I'd be happy to withdraw that motion. All right, thank you. And I see uh, Pete Hossamer, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion. Please. Um, Sandra, I'll go slow. Uh, I move the council reconsider its action taken under item, agenda item A4, the approval of the agenda. All right, Pete, is that language complete and accurate? It is complete. I hope I've stated it correctly. Look for a second. Bill's hand is raised. Please speak to your motion as necessary. Uh, based on the testimony we've heard, this is an important issue, and I think it needs to be come up before the council as a separate agenda item. Thanks. All right, is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. <laughs> Abstentions, motion passes unanimously. Um, now I think if I remember correctly, we'll want to entertain um, a motion, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, a motion to amend the agenda. Dave? Well, I'm gonna go, let me call on Heather. Maybe she remembers precisely what Dr. Um, I was just gonna offer my motion all right, offer your motion and Dave will let us know if you screwed up. Okay. 
I move that the council add another agenda item to the March 2021 council meeting agenda to consider an emergency action that would allow an at-sea Pacific whiting processing platform to operate as both a mothership and a catcher processor in the same calendar year during the 2021 whiting fishery. Okay, that language is accurate and complete? Yes. Look for a second, seconded by Phil Anderson. S please speak to your motion as necessary. Thank you. Um, I think we've had a good discussion about this issue. And um, as Pete Hasmer said, it, it's an important issue that um, I think warrants some time on the council agenda. And I, I look forward to having that conversation later this week. All right. Are there any uh, questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? Not seeing any, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. And let me check with our parliamentarian to see if there is anything further required here. Mr. Chairman, you now have the amended made motion in front of you. Uh, you can go ahead and vote on it. All right, so now we need a motion to amend. Well, we passed this motion in front of us right now. So you're saying we now need to uh, a further motion to approve the amended agenda? Correct. Okay, great. All right, so I'll look for a motion. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I move that the council of a um, approve its agenda, agenda item A4, as amended. All right, thank you. Look for a second, seconded by Pete Hassamer. Uh, actually, let me pause for a moment. Is that language uh, correct? Phil? Phil, I just want to confirm get a verbal approval that that language on the screen is accurate and complete. Uh, yes, it is, Mr. Chairman. Right. And then, Pete, is that the uh, motion you want to uh, second? Yes. All right. Uh, Phil, please speak to your motion as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe it's necessary. The amendment, uh, the discussion around the amendment, I was sufficient. All right. All right. I don't see any hands for any discussion, so I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously, so as I understand it, we have now amended our agenda to include an agenda item for um, this uh, proposed emergency rule. And then, uh, Chuck, would you um, mind weighing in when we might have this on the agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so uh, you're right. We have not scheduled uh, a, a time for that. So <clears throat> um, I'm not sure <clears throat> uh, what is uh, going to be necessary for this agenda item. Um, so that will weigh into the council's decision. I will point out <clears throat> that. Um, Tomorrow, the end season adjustment item. Uh, so far, we have had no proposals for um, in season action. I think there's a couple of updates uh, that were contemplated, but uh, but no action. So that agenda item should take considerably less uh, time than the hour and a half that we had hoped for or that we had uh, planned for. <clears throat> so uh, that is one. Uh, possibility that you know it creates some more time uh, on the agenda tomorrow I think uh, HMS international management activities also is probably going to be come in less than those two hours um, so tomorrow if uh, it might be a, might be a possibility I will point out we have electronic monitoring uh, on the agenda which is likely to go along but uh, but in any event <clears throat> tomorrow might be the most uh, obvious uh, date where we might uh, come in under our scheduled agenda time. Um, beyond that, um, 
you know, uh, there's, there's uh, Wednesday and uh, Thursday, of course, is a half day. So, uh, so adding it to Thursday's agenda, uh, you know, might be the other uh, possible solution. Again, I think it depends on what's expected in terms of uh, materials for that, uh, for that agenda item. Um, I think that uh, last year when we did this uh, emergency rule for the uh, same, uh, same action for different reasons, uh, we had a report from the GMT, a report from the GAP, and a situation summary created by staff. Um, so I think uh, it would be relatively easy to dust off the situation summary. I'm not sure about the other two, um, the other two reports. Uh, so uh, in terms of scheduling that, I don't know if, uh, for example, the first thing in the morning would be um, would be good, or uh, if uh, we need to schedule it for later in the day. But uh, um, I will. Uh, I guess that's that's my input on that. Well, I'm just thinking in the interest of public notice, uh, you know, um, letting, you know, letting people know when uh, they, they might want to tune in or uh, submit a, a comment or whatnot. Um, it, it, it might be useful to, you know, at least have a targeted day. Um, and if it's going to be tomorrow, I would suggest later in the day, but um, I, I agree. I think I think that would be a uh, a desire a desire of the council to uh, provide as much notice as possible. I guess I would also <clears throat> point out that groundfish uh, tomorrow is the last day of our uh, scheduled groundfish agenda items, so there might be some um, utility, I guess, in in having uh, having it scheduled in. But again, I'm not sure what this uh, might do in terms of um, impact to the groundfish management team and groundfish advisory sub panel. In, the, in their uh, ongoing work. All right, I see Phil Anderson's hand is up. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just note that the GAP uh, did um, provide a um, comment in their, uh, under their workload item on this emergency rule request. Um, I don't know about the GMT, but I was thinking that we had this as a, I don't know if G6 is the right thing, but under, Following electronic electronic monitoring, that might be a reasonable time to take this on, and you know, if the, but the, I, I know the gap has already talked about it and provided us provided us their perspective. Okay, so uh, Chuck, then maybe um, we can touch <clears throat> base with the GMT and confirm with the gap, and then you know, provide you know determine a time and amend the agenda so folks know yeah I, I think that would be uh i think that would be good perhaps we could do that uh, over the course of the rest of the afternoon and then update people uh at, uh, uh, at the close of the meeting today or or maybe when we get around to the next ground fish item if uh, salmon gives us sufficient time to make those um consultations great um so um, we're still on agenda item G2. Let me see if there's any further business uh, from the council, see if there are any hands that folks want to raise anything else on this agenda item. And not seeing any hands. Oh, Chuck? Thank you. Uh, I guess I would point out that uh, on the situation summary and the, and the uh, as a result of the council's uh, request, I think back in September, uh, that uh, the cost recovery item was also uh, added to this um, added to this agenda item as uh, you know potential for prioritization. So I think it would be appropriate if the council would uh, address the, their desires on uh, on that item. Okay, thank you. So Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair. And and I just wanted to say before we moved off this agenda item, and I I should have said it when I spoke to my motion to add this agenda item and I, I know how the GMT and the gap works and they uh, work themselves to the bone but I, I certainly by adding this agenda item didn't expect to see any big analysis come out of it. I, I think they did that work last year and, and we can look to that. So I, I don't I hope that this doesn't uh, set the GMT up for a late night work session or anything like that. I, I think we can have the the discussion about workload uh, with a good understanding based on, on the, the stuff that they've put together for us before. So I just want to make sure 
I said that so the, the GMT and GAP could hear it. Okay, Heather, thank you. So is there, uh, Chuck had mentioned cost recovery. So is there discussion, motion, adding it? I don't have the GMT list up in front of me right now, but let me look to a council member. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and, and say what I was going to say, and that is, <clears throat> so this would be uh, considering adding this to uh, to one of the tables of uh, prioritized act, prioritized or unprioritized actions. Um, and so uh, I guess I would also remind the council that uh, that is not necessarily required at this time, depending on which table you add it to. Um, if you uh, want to add it to the prioritized table and schedule some action on it, then that's one thing. If you uh, just want to add it to the list, uh, that's another and doesn't necessarily have to occur at this meeting. Okay. Phil Anderson. Um, I may not have followed exactly what Chuck just said. Uh, my suggestion was for us to uh, and I'm doing this without knowledge of just how packed the April agenda is, but the cost recovery committee, according to the roster that I have, uh, has six individuals on it. Um, uh, and um, so some of those are contemporary in terms of their participation in the council process. And, well, one at least is not. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we, might want to think about this a little bit, come back uh, and talk about what the um, um, cost recovery committee, the, the uh, if we want to uh, bring it back into action, um, uh, we, I think we need to think about who's on it, look at the existing um, names, see if some need to be freshened up, uh, and then make some um, decisions on what we're going to ask them to do. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm certainly not prepared to do that today, um, but I, um, but those are a couple of steps we might think about taking uh, to further uh, address this uh, issue. Thank you, Phil. I thought I saw in a report, I can't find it now, someone discussed, uh, suggested having a discussion in April, in April. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, similarly, not, not prepared to make a decision on it today. Um, I, I am not opposed to a discussion in April. Uh, I, I would urge us with thinking about that, but uh, in general, really thinking about potentially reconstituting this committee and moving forward with it uh, to once again think about the the, uh, the time that that would be taking away from the participants working on other items uh, and getting them done. And it, it seems to me that the the real issue with costs in this fishery certainly there there is an issue of understanding uh, what costs are recoverable, et, et cetera, and the number of issues around transparency and what and how information is presented has been raised. But I, I would think that the real issue is is looking for cost savings to the industry. Uh, and I, I would like us to give some serious thought as to what we expect to achieve through this cost recovery committee and whether it is the uh, most valuable thing we can be doing with our time to that end uh, before proceeding with a decision on it. Thank you, Maggie. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not, not really interested in taking up that discussion here and now. Um, I appreciate the interest in the topic and the interest on the part of some to 
reconstitute the committee and get uh, discussions going. But um, I thought this agenda item was where we made decisions on priorities. And I don't see cost recovery committee um, staffing as an item that's currently on the list. And again, this is what is difficult about having four or five different lists compiled by different groups and reports that cover content about uh, items that are aren't on lists and and what you know the culmination of this item is. But um, I I feel like you know this agenda item is where we have those discussions and um, I didn't hear anything in the, the body of the discussion under this agenda item that uh, was a recommendation to add this item onto one of the tables. Now, again, there's some uncertainty about which table is really governing our activities into the future here, but, um, you know, I, I guess um, I'm inclined, you know, to, or I, I, I feel like I have weighed that activity um, among the priorities and accepted advice of some as to what our priorities should be. Um, and I'm just not, uh, I, I'm feeling like if we're going to revisit this discussion on cost recovery committee, um, we should be doing it with the full spectrum of the other items that are on the table um, in our thinking at the time. So. Um, like I said, I thought I thought we heard the the advice. I didn't hear any action in response to the advice, so I was comfortable with leaving it there. So maybe somebody can clarify where it is we'll see this again and how where it will show up on what list. Thanks. Thanks, Marcy. Phil. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I can do that, Marcy. Um, this was in the gaps report. They did have it included in their uh, November 2020 report to us under this agenda item. So I thought it was appropriate to at least discuss it, given that it came from the uh, one of our ground fish, our ground fish advisory panel and reviewing the membership of the committee. It doesn't have any GMT people on it. I don't even think it had any state people on it. Uh, it had a NIMPS and and some industry uh, and PSMFC and industry people on it. There was only five. Uh, so um, I don't frankly think it uh, fits very well under the ground fish workload agenda because I don't think there's interactions between a lot of the entities that are working on ground fish. Uh, I think it's a separate kind of issue that uh, needs to be dealt with by a different composition of the committee much like the, much like it was done back in 2011. Thank you, Phil. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, you know, I followed this quite closely over the years and it seems like every time the cost recovery comes up on the annual uh, agenda, it's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of consternation and has been and a lot of questions and not many answers. And so I think the gap last year suggested we come forward with a different process, try to inform a matrix that could, you know, uh, systematically define how or, you know, uh, identify cost recoverable issues and items and understand the degree when you apply the guidelines to it and how that all goes and with so, you know, hopefully get us to a place where we're not having to uh, have so many questions about this and have more, more, more understanding from the people that are being charged. These costs are very significant to the participants in those sectors. I think that uh, I, don't, I don't know that this is the proper venue today to do that in, but I think it is important that that cost, uh, cost recovery committee be reestablished and work through this bite at a time to, to create a system where we don't have put, put so much time into the cost recovery and, and just have a better understanding of it. And I think that's important. And we've, you know, we've heard that from the gap. I, it came up here, but I, you know, I'm certainly open to where, where it should be appropriately placed 
but I don't think it should be uh, ignored. I think it needs to be something we uh, we look at going into the future because these costs are significant. They they uh, tend to uh, dampen participation, by, particularly by the smaller entities in the fishery. And uh, costs in general are really important to keep track of and be able to justify and be able to have satisfactory um, understandings. I've never heard that the industry is, in the, is, is uh, opposed to paying for it. They just want to understand what it is they're being charged for. So uh, that's, I'll stop there and thank you. Marcy? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Chair Grolnick. Um, just a response to Mr. Anderson's comments. Um, yes, that was a recommendation in the GAP report, but I left my thinking squarely um, or reaching a conclusion after hearing the NIMS report under this agenda item that NIMS is asking for council guidance on prioritizing the ad hoc cost recovery committee because there is substantial overlap between the staff that work on catch share priorities such as whiting utilization, SAMTAC, and EM. So the timing of the committee discussions need to be taken into account with the other priorities. So it is a workload issue. So I feel like we can't separate that topic from the rest that are on the list. So again, you know, the challenge here is we have people with working off of different lists and um, I'm hearing from NIMS that if we add a cost recovery committee meeting, um, that will take away from their other activities that we've already identified as priorities. So I'm struggling here with how to reconcile all of this in this discussion. Okay, well, thank you, Mercy. Uh, let's see if there is a motion to add this as a priority. Um, the comments I've heard so far is folks think this is important, but they're not prepared to discuss it. At this at this meeting, so in the interest of, of moving through this agenda item, I just would like to see if we're going to get a motion on this, um, or if there's any further discussion. I, I'm getting the sense that there isn't a groundswell of support here on cost recovery at at the moment, and I'm not seeing any hands go up. So let me see if there's anything else under this agenda item that the council wishes to discuss. Uh, let me turn to Todd. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. We've had a, uh, a good two hour agenda item here um, in which we have, uh, which the council has addressed all of your actions um, you've made several motions that can uh, push this item forward in terms of uh, better ways to address tables. Um, you've also added several items to uh, the list for further consideration. Um, you've also intimated that um, in terms of cost recovery, there is some interest in a CRC, or, excuse me, a an ad hoc cost recovery committee, but at this point in time, um, it's not a de determined if uh, it would be a priority to have a meeting. Um, noting from the situation summary, it seems likely that uh, this particular item could be revisited in April under the uh, cost recovery agenda item. Um, and yeah, I made a decision essentially made at that time whether or not the ad hoc committee would be a useful entity or not. Um, that's what I have in my notes, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd. Good work, Council, getting through this agenda item. We knew it wasn't going to be easy, and it wasn't, but we got it done. So um, we're going to take a break now until 325, and when we come back, we will have salmon as an agenda item, not as a meal. 
And then we'll move, uh, if that agenda item doesn't take too long, we'll move right into mothership utilization, agenda item G3.
All right, we're going to get started on salmon in a minute. All right, we've made it to salmon. So we're on agenda item E5, and I will turn to Robin Elke for the overview. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to be on the council floor. Yes, this is agenda item E5, uh, recommendations for the 2021 management alternative analysis. So the SDT will present the council with the coordinated coastwide management alternatives, which embody to the extent possible, the management elements identified by the council under agenda item E4 last Friday. At this time, the council may need, excuse me, at this time, the council may need to clarify STT questions and should assure that the alternatives presented are those for which the council desires full STT analysis and consideration for final adoption scheduled on March 11th, 2021. So under this council action, it's just to clarify any questions STT might have and confirm the management alternatives for um, ongoing STT analysis. For your reference materials, you only have the supplemental STT report one, uh, which is the output of their work uh, from what from the uh, alternatives you adopted last Friday. And that concludes my overview. All right, are there any questions for Robin? Uh, and there not being any, uh, we have the uh, Salmon Technical Team report and uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will be referring to agenda item E5A, Supplemental STT Report 1. Um, this is our first time at this meeting going through a, one of these reports. I'll uh, walk through, give a brief overview at each table. Um, table 1 presents the commercial alternatives. Table 2 presents the recreational alternatives. And then we have uh, two table threes, scrolling down as fast as I can right now. Um, table 3A is the, are the treaty troll alternatives for the QTA tribes. And table 3B uh, is the treaty troll alternatives for the Macaw tribe. Uh, the STT analysis, the results of the STT analysis um, of those alternatives is in tables uh, 5A and 5B. Again, table 5A is uh, the QTA tribe, represents the QTA tribe's uh, treaty troll alternatives. Um, going through this for Chinook, um, under all three alternatives, Klamath River Falls Chinook um, do not meet their minimum escapement for 2021. <clears throat> the allow or the exploitation rate exceeds the maximum allowable rate of 25% under all three alternatives. And the H4 ocean harvest rate is greater than 16%, which means it's um, it is not in compliance with all three alternatives. Moving down to Sacramento River Falls Chinook. All three alternatives do not meet the minimum escapement of 122,000 um, adults, and the exploitation rate um, exceeds the maximum allowable of 55% um, under all three alternatives as well. Moving to Coho, um, under all three alternatives, Queets Coho does not uh, meet its uh, spawner estimate. These are estimates of, um, of uh, ocean escapement and uh, do not include um, in-river fisheries. 
for the Washington coastal stocks. Okay, moving to table uh, 5B, uh, represents the results from the, um, including the, uh, the treaty troll alternatives from Macaw tribe. Under alternative one for Columbia Lower River Natural Tules, uh, the 38% uh, exploitation rate is exceeded. Um, and the, the results for Klamath River Falls Chinook and Sacramento River Falls Chinook are identical um, to the previous uh, table and the ones that I already went over. So um, there's work to do in all three alternatives for both um, Klamath and Sacramento Falls Chinook. And moving um, down into uh, Coho, again, um, Cleats uh, Wild Coho, um, uh, all three alternatives are bolded as the um, uh, ocean escapement estimate um, is not uh, high enough to meet the spawner estimate um, um, goal for the 5.8 thousand fish. Okay. Um, Table 7A and 7B uh, show the breakdown of uh, LCN Coho, OCN Coho, Road Klamath Coho, and Lower Columbia River Tule Chinook uh, exploitation rates by fishery and area. Again, uh, 7A uh, captures the QTA tribes uh, uh, treaty troll alternatives and 7B um, as Macaw, Macaw tribe alternatives. And then uh, appended to the end of our uh, our statement or our um, report here are three appendix tables. Um, uh, table A1 shows the distribution of uh, impact rate for Sacramento River winter Chinook across uh, fisheries and areas and months. Table A2 um, shows impacts of Klamath River fall Chinook uh, by time area fishery under the three alternatives. And table A3 provides the same information for Sacramento River Fall Chinook. And uh, that concludes my um, overview of the STT report. I, I guess I would ask um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I, I would also like to very briefly uh, uh, respond to a question that I, we got a few days ago at the beginning part of the council meeting that I wasn't able to answer, but I do have an answer to now, um, however you'd like to proceed. Yes. Yeah, repeat the question okay. and what's the answer, because we may not remember what the question was. I, I will do that. Um, yes, let me uh, grab my notes here. Okay, under agenda item E3, uh, there was a question from uh, Council Member Anderson regarding Table 5-6 in the uh, preseason one report. Now, the question was whether the uh, exploitation rates reported in that table were total ERs or ocean ERs. And after discussion with other members of the ASTT, that can confirm that uh, the exploitation rates are indeed uh, total exploitation rates. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Does that complete your uh, report under E5? Yes, it does, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Let me see if there are any questions from council members. I heard a voice there. Was that you, Chuck or Mike? Okay. Uh, that, that was me uh, coughing, but I think Chris Kern has his hand up. If he doesn't get, the, get my question, I will... Uh, Turn. I've, again, one thing I've got to learn is if I scroll down in my list of panelists, I will not see the hands at the top. So Chris Kern, please go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Farrell, I'm looking at the, it doesn't really matter which of the tables, uh, but they're the table fives uh, relative to killer whale prey abundance. And I just, this may be too detailed of a question for the moment, but if you can answer it, that will help me. If not, I'll follow up later. I see different numbers in the different alternatives, and and given that those are supposed to be pre-season starting abundances in those areas, I wondered if you could give me a quick explanation of why there are differences in some of those numbers. 
They're very small differences. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Kern. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. I will maybe see if uh, John Kerry uh, is on the line and um, he might be able to, well, he certainly will be able to answer it better than I could. And John has his hand up, so please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Mr. Kern, for that question. You're right about that. Um, it, it is a very small difference, and what it is is it's a nuance in the way the, calcu uh, the abundances are calculated for the Sacramento stock. They're actually kind of that calculated from a river run, um, and then natural mortality and harvest is added in. So as the harvest changes um, by month and the river run size changes, the natural mortality amount changes too when you back it in. Uh, so it's a very small difference in the starting abundances there. Does that answer your question, Chris? It does. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks, John and Mike. I've got a follow-up question, actually, on that point. Um, so does that suggest that the Sacramento Fall Chinook abundance has a relatively low impact on prey abundance? Uh, thanks again, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it does. Well, it depends on which area you're looking in. If you're looking at the north of Falcon one, which is what we're comparing to the threshold, then yes, it has a pretty small, uh, maybe 5% of the total abundance out there is made up of Sacramento fish based on the modeling. All right. Thanks very much. Yep. Are there any other questions on the report by the salmon technical team? All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike and John. All right, um, I don't have any other reports. Um, so now, do we, do we have any public comment? Uh, no, no, we do not. All right, with no public comment, that takes us to council discussion and action. Before turning to each of the states and the tribes, let me first see if there's any general council discussion on this. And not seeing any hands, uh, Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I thought I would just take the opportunity to give an update on a question that Phil, uh, Mr. Anderson asked the other day with regard to the emergency rule. Yes, one of the salmon alternatives. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, we don't have a definitive answer yet. Um, we are investigating that um, uh, within NOAA, but also working very closely with the state of Washington um, as we uh, explore those questions and also make sure that we very we clearly understand what is being proposed as we move forward. That's all I have uh, right now. Thank you, Susan. Okay, uh, any other general discussion on this agenda item? <clears throat> well, I will start in the north and work south um, and I'll probably uh, ask Joe Oatman about any tribal changes between uh, Washington and Oregon. So, um, Kyle, do you have any any additional guidance to offer? I do have a small piece of guidance, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I believe Sandra has it so she can put it on the screen. So I'll, I'll read this and then give a little context. Um, it's a change to the language on page four of the STT report and it's addition of some language in the middle of this paragraph. Vessels fishing or in possession of salmon north of Ledbetter Point must land and deliver all species of fish in a Washington port and must possess a Washington troll and or salmon delivery license. In 2021, vessels may not land fish east of Port Angeles or east of the Megler Astoria Bridge. For delivery to Washington ports east of the CQ River, vessels must notify WDFW at 360-249-1215 prior to crossing the Bonilla Tatouche line with area fish, total Chinook, coho, and halibut catch aboard and destination with approximate time of delivery. 
in 2022, vessels may not land fish east of the Sikiu River or east of the Megalorostoria Bridge. So last year, um, the the standard line is the Sikiu River line. Last year, we took in season action to allow delivery farther to the east because the ports of Lapush and Nia Bay were closed, so troll fishermen could not land. Um, in that area, they would have either had to go all the way south to Westport, or since we changed the rule, they could go into Port Angeles. So this is um, putting in what we did by in-season action just for 2021. For the early May season in 2022, we would anticipate going back to the old um, CQ River landing line. Um, obviously, we'd have to take in-season action as this season started to put this in for the first 15 days of May as well but um, thinks it, think it makes sense to do this. We don't think those ports are gonna be re reopened. And so wanna give this option to um, fishermen as we go into 2021 fisheries. Thanks very much, Kyle. Uh, any discussion on Kyle's guidance? I don't think we need a vote, uh, but I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. Um, Joe Oatman, are there, is there any additional guidance on tribal fisheries? Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this point, I do not have any additional guidance uh, regarding the Treaty Indian Troll Management Alternatives for the Council. Thank you, Joe, for that. <clears throat> Oregon, Mr. Kern. Yes, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, a few modifications to make today. Thank you. Um, let me find my version, and I hopefully Sandra has it. Uh, okay, and I apologize. There are quite a few, but I'll try to be clear, uh, and we do have it here in writing. Um, okay, first, uh, modifications to the alternatives as described in Agenda Item E5, Supplemental SDT Report 1. Uh, relative to commercial troll, starting on page uh, five or six, I think it's actually six, um, in the Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain area, alternative one, add March 20 through April 30 for Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank Line and closed Hecata Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. For the May dates, strike the May 1 through 3, but leave the remainder of those dates in place. For August, replace all the dates present with August 1 through 3, 7 through 9, and 13 through 15. Then moving, uh, oh, uh, sorry. And then in the first paragraph, uh, strike the section that reads open five days per week through August 16th and seven days per week beginning September 1. Then I will move to alternative two. Uh, same area, Cape Falcon to Humbug. Uh, add March 20 through April 30. Strike May 1 through 3, but leave the remainder of the May dates in place. Strike all of the current August days and replace with August 1 through 3, 7 through 9, and 13 through 15. Strike the section that reads open five days per week through August 16th and seven days per week beginning September 1. And then moving to alternative three, there is some more text, so I'll try to slow down a little bit. Um, strike all of the dates that are currently in that option, except for those from September 1 through 31. Insert March 20 through April 30 for Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank Line, closed to Hecata, Hecata Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. Add May 1 through 30. Add June 1 through 30 from Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank Line. Add June 3 through 6, 9 through 12, 15 through 18, and 26 through 29 for Hecata Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. Add July 5 through 27 for Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank Line. 
add July 8 through 11 and 23 through 26 for Hecate Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. Add August 1 through 7, 11 through 14, and 18 through 21 for Cape Falcon to Hecate Bank Line. And add August 1 through 7 for Hecate Bank Line to Humbug Mountain. Additionally, where uh, the language for open four days per week, uh, strike that section that reads open four days per week through August 23rd and seven days per week beginning September 1. And that's the modifications for that section. And then I have some for the uh, Oregon KMZ as well on the following page. So commercial troll Humbug Mountain to the Oregon California border. Starting with alternative one, add March 20 through April 30. Replace all days in June with June 1 through the earlier of June 30 or 700 Chinook quota. Replace all the days that are in July with July 1 through the earlier of July 31 or 300 Chinook quota. And add August 1 through the earlier of August 28th or a 100 Chinook quota. In the first paragraph, strike open five days per week, Thursday through Monday. And in the second paragraph, replace the language referring to the June 3 through July 31 weekly landing limit with the following, June 1 through August 28 weekly landing and possession limit of 40 Chinook per open period, Thursday through Monday. And I believe that may not be reflected in the document Sandra has, uh, the July, it says July 31, that not, sorry, the one below that, the very, that one right there should read August 28. Thank you. Apologies for missing that. Uh, that completes that alternative, so I will move to alternative two. Add March 20 through April 30. Strike May 1 through 3, but leave the remainder of the May dates in place. Then moving to alternative three, uh, same area. Add March 20 through April 30. Add June 1 through the earlier of June 30 or 300 Chinook quota. And add July 1 through the earlier of July 31 or 200 Chinook quota. And in the first paragraph, strike the language open four days per week, Friday through Monday. And add June 1 through July 31 weekly landing and possession limit of 20 Chinook per week, Thursday through Wednesday. Uh, I will move to the recreational measures now, uh, starting uh, with um, the Falcon to Oregon, California border, Oregon KMZ. Uh, in alternative two, strike July 25 and replace with August 15th. Well, sorry, let me refer, let me look at that again. Apologies, give me just one second. Okay, correct. Uh, yes, that would be the end date. Um, strike the July 25th end date in alternative two and replace it with August 15. Um, let's see, in the... I apologize. I've got something that just doesn't look right here. You, you want to take a moment, Chris? And um, yes, I, unfortunately, help. I do. I've I've got the commercial measures the way I the way I need them, but I there's a question here on the on the sport. Well, how about uh, if I go to California and then come back to you with that? Yeah, I will. Be, uh, I will get that resolved. Thank you. All right. So apologies. No, no worries. It's it's a complicated matter. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn to Brett Cormos uh, for California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I'll preface this by saying I also have a fairly lengthy uh, guidance document here. Um, we'll be sure to communicate this uh, to the STT, both verbally and in writing. Um, and hopefully this, since it's going to take me a little while to work through this, it will help uh, Mr. Kern give him time to resolve the outstanding issues in Oregon. <clears throat> and of course, I will be speaking from agenda item E5A, supplemental STT report one dated March 8, beginning with the commercial management alternatives on page eight and starting in the Fort Bragg management zone. In alternative one, add June 11 to 17 and 24 to 30. Add July 20 to 31 and replace August 1 to 10 with, with August 1 to 12. Moving to alternative two, remove May 1 to 12 and 20 to 31. Remove June 1 to 6 and 18 to 30. Replace July 13 to 31 with July 20 to 31. Replace August 1 to 28 with August 1 to 16. And finally, replace September 1 to 30 with September 1 to 15. Moving south to the San Francisco management area and beginning in alternative one, Remove May 6 to 12 and 18 to 31. Replace June 1 to 6 and 14 to 30 with June 11 to 17 and 24 to 30. Replace July 13 to 31 with July 20 to 31. Replace August 1 to 28 with August 1 to 12. Moving over to alternative two, remove May 1 to 12 and 20 to 31. Remove June 1 to 6. Replace June 18 to 30 with June 20 to 30. Replace July 13 to 31 with July 20 to 31. Replace August 1 to 28 with August 1 to 16. Replace September 1 to 30 with September 6 to 9, 13 to 16, 20 to 23, and 27 to 30. Under the Point Raise to Point San Pedro Fall Area Target Zone section, replace same as alternative one, with closed. Moving on to alternative three, <clears throat> remove May 1 to 12 and 20 to 31. Remove June 1 to 6. Replace June 18 to 30 with June 17 to 30, replace July 12 to 31 with July 19 to 31, 
replace August 1 to 25 with August 1 to 20 and remove September 1 to 30. In the regulatory language that references alternative one, remove during September, all salmon must be landed south of Point Arena. Under the Point Reyes to Point San Pedro fall area target zone section, replace same as alternative one with September 1 to 30, in October 1, 4 to 8, and 11 to 15. And finally, replace open five days per week, Monday to Friday, with open seven days per week during September, and five days per week, Monday to Friday during October. Moving south to the Monterey management area, beginning with alternative one, replace May 1 to 12 with May 1 to 15, replace June 1 to 6 and 14 to 30 with June 11 to 17. Remove July 13 to 31 and August 1 to 28. Moving to alternative two, replace May 20 to 31 with May 18 to 31. Replace June 1 to 6 and 18 to 30 with June 1 to 12 and 20 to 30. Remove July 13 to 31 and August 1 to 28. In alternative three, Replace May 1 to 31 with May 1 to 20. Replace June 1 to 30 with June 7 to 30. Replace July 12 to 31 with July 15 to 31. And finally, remove August 1 to 25. That does it for the commercial changes. I'm now going to move on to recreational management alternatives beginning on page 20. Starting in the California KMZ. In alternative one, replace May 1 to August 31 with May 29 to August 15. In alternative two, replace June 12 to July 31 with June 19 to July 31. And in alternative three, in the regulatory language that references alternative one, replace Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length with Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. Moving south to Fort Bragg, in alternative one, replace April 3 to November 7 with May 16 to October 31. In alternative two, Replace April 10 to November 7 with May 22 to October 17. In alternative three, 
replace April 17 to October 31 with May 22 to October 17. And again, in the regulatory language that references alternative one, replace Chinook minimum size limit of 20 in inches total length with Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. Moving south again to San Francisco management area <clears throat> and beginning in alternative one, replace April 3 to November 7 with May 16 to October 31. Replace Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length through May 15 and 20 inches total length thereafter with Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. Moving to alternative two, replace April 10 to November 7 with May 22 to October 17. In the regulatory language that references alternative one, replace Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length through May 15 and 20 inches total length thereafter with Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. Moving on to alternative three, replace April 17 to October 31 with May 22 to October 17. And in the regulatory language that references alternative one, replace Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length through May 15 and 20 inches total length length thereafter with Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. And moving south for the final time here in this guidance in the Monterey management area and in alternative two, replace April 3 to August 29 with April 3 to September 19. And in alternative three, replace April 3 to August 22 with April 3 to September 19. And that concludes our lengthy guidance for today in California. Thank you very much, Brett. Are there any questions of Brett? Um, on his guidance. Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, so now I'm going to ask Chris Kern if he is prepared to return to his guidance on the recreational uh, season alternatives for Oregon. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I am, and I hope so. Um, I think <laughs> we've got it sorted. Do you get that over to, to Sandra have that? Um, actually, yes. It's I'm going to have to tweak a few things, but um, she okay. does have, uh, I was reading part of it incorrectly, so what she has is, is very close. We can make okay. some adjustments. So we'll bring that up on the screen so we can follow along as you read. Yeah. And it's, it's starting at that very uppermost yellow block there, that one, yes. Uh, and so this would be the recreational fishery uh, from Cape Falcon to the Oregon California border slash Humbug Mountain in alternative two. Uh, and that option reads all salmon mark selected coho fishery. And we are gonna strike, uh, I'll read it, it should say June 19th. It says currently June 19th through July 25. We're gonna strike July 25 and replace that with August 15. And so that is reflected in that sentence right there. 
What isn't reflected in there is we're also going to strike the July 26th in the sentence right below it uh, that starts July 26th through August 28th. And that July 26th should be stricken and replaced with June 19. That one right there, yes. So you want to line out July 26 and put in Correct. I, I would like to replace July 26 with June 19. Do you want to help Sandra out there, maybe? Well, I'm just trying to figure out how she's capturing it. Uh, so uh, so uh, I would backspace back over June 19. And then you've got strike July 26th. Uh, after, after the 26th, put a space, replace with June 19. And maybe make it a bold. That looks like it works to me. And I appreciate it, Sandra. Sorry for the hassle. Uh, the next ones are, uh, should be relatively straightforward. So moving to the California, uh, the Oregon KMZ alternative one, uh, currently reads May 16th through August 1. We're gonna strike August 1 and replace with July 23. And it additionally in the um, bullet underneath, that reads August 2nd to the earlier of August 28th or the Cape Falcon to Oregon, California border quota, uh, replace August 2 with July 24. I believe that's already reflected. Uh, second alternative in the same area. Um, uh, that one, yes. Uh, replace May 29 through July 15 with June 19 through August 15. And that is correct. And then in the um, paragraph below, there is a reference to the period uh, for the Mark Selective Coho Fishery that reads June 19 through July 25. Uh, that July 25 needs to be replaced with August 15, which is reflected in that text. So that captures that. And then finally, alternative three, which thankfully is straightforward and simple. Strike everything, replace with July 1 through, strike all the dates and replace with July 1 through August 28. And that completes my um, changes for today. I appreciate right. it. Thank you, Chris, for that. Are there any questions of Chris on the, on the changes he's, uh, on the guidance he's offering there? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, let me see if there's any other council input under this agenda item E5. And I'm not seeing any. Um, Mr. Robin? Mr. I did have one, Chris. Oh, Chuck. Go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Sorry, just a clarification. Chris, I, I, on the back on the commercial stuff, you replaced the, some of the five day. Uh, periods with seven day periods and uh i didn't i saw one where you specified thursday through wednesday um but i didn't see it for all so just just curious are all of your weekly landing limit periods associated with a thursday through wednesday week um i yeah uh mr chair uh and um uh, Chuck, uh, I th think what the issue was is that we had 
a consistent for several alternatives. We initially had a consistent block of five or four days per week in a couple of places. We have uh, trimmed the days to the point where those are variable and not the same number of days every week. So relative to many of those, it doesn't affect the landing limit. Um, but for the other ones where we do have landing week language, our intent is for it to reflect uh, a Thursday to Wednesday landing week. So if we have overlooked some of those, we will need to go in and fix them. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, anything else for Chris or anyone else on this agenda item? Robin, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we're doing well. We have some changes from all three states and uh, the STT will uh, work to plug those into their model and come back to you tomorrow afternoon with the results. All right, thanks. A lot of work uh, yet to be done by the STT. Yep. Thank, thanks everyone for their hard work. And that will conclude this agenda item. And I will now hand the virtual gavel over to Vice Chair Pettinger and apologize that it, I'm handing it over at such a late hour, but there you go. Uh, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, it happens to the best of us. Um, we have a three hour um, session and we're two hours late, so let's see what we can do. And uh, yeah, let's look to, uh, to Brett to uh, kick us off here. Brett? Uh, good, good afternoon. Vice Chair, uh, this is agenda item G3, Pacific Whiting Utilization and Mothership Sector. We do have a uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, for you. I know it's a little long, but uh, we will uh, expedite that and get through that. There's a lot of information in our scoping document. So I do have a uh, Jesse Dorpinghouse here as well. She's going to help me with this presentation, and we're going to turn over uh, control for her to share that presentation and then I'll give you an overview, and then we'll start right into this agenda item. So uh, if we could give uh, Jesse that ability to share that presentation now, I'd appreciate that. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, just making sure y'all can hear me okay. Yes, we can, thanks. And are you seeing the right screen? We are. Thank you, Jesse. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so we'll go to the next slide, Jesse. So just as an overview here, uh, we have uh, multiple reports into the briefing book. We started out with a, a gen, uh, attachment one. That's the scoping document, the main piece of information that we're going to go over here on this agenda item. Uh, we have a supplemental attachment two. That's just a one pager that has some corrections, uh, some data that needed to be updated and corrected. And then we wanted to put one, we missed one word in our proposed revised purpose and need statement. So that's in that document. There's a supplemental NIFS report in the briefing book. There's also a joint WDFW ODFW report, a supplemental GMT report, and a supplemental GAP report. And I think we have two common public comments set up. Uh, so just to next slide, please. The council action under this item is to continue scoping the whiting fishery utilization issues and adopt final purpose and need with a range of alternatives. Uh, we wrote this first part to widen the scoping action to more than just the mothership sector since some of the initial proposals put forward by the industry that was adopted uh, for pur the purpose and need that was adopted for public review uh, really could affect all sectors. So. We wanted to widen that just a little bit. And we also reviewed the purpose and need statement to see if it is really focused on one sector, the mothership fishery, or all sectors. So since the industry felt they had solid options at the council uh, level when they adopted their purpose and need statement for public review, we thought it may be possible to adopt a range of alternatives and a final purpose and need statement at this meeting. So a little bit of background on this. Next slide, please. Um, the issue, uh, you know, under this agenda item, uh, well, this topic is cited in the scoping document, uh, you know, some background, but we wanted to give a little more detail on where this issue had first started 
And so we wanted to give you the ability to see and click on some of these documents within the PowerPoint so you can get to this information. Um, these issues were brought up several times by the industry and discussed on several forums. So it first kind of came up in 2016 during some public meetings trying to assess the five-year cash share review. Uh, the CAB at that time uh, didn't really prioritize the alternatives that were related to this issue. So uh, in 2018, the Arctic Storm uh, Group brought a letter to the Pacific Council requesting a processor cap increased uh, increase. And, and so the council heard some public testimony, had some discussion, and decided that it was a little too late uh, in the five-year review process to add this information, but wanted the industry to really look at some of the solutions for the issues they're citing. So the sector-wide meeting was held in Portland to kind of bring everybody together and think about what are the problems here and how can we come up with some solutions. Next slide, please. And so in uh, November 2018, then the gap in GMT uh, started to think about prioritizing the workload and on this thing and, and under the new management measures. And, and the council discussed this stuff and, and knew that it was an important issue. It wanted to really look at all the, the ground fish items that were competing for prioritization and wanted to kind of scope it out in March 2019. So in 2019, there was a sector-wide document that was created by the industry and submitted to the briefing book with a little more background and detail on it. And then the GMT and the GAP and the council prioritized these things. Next slide, please. Then in uh, November, the council tasked the GAP with scoping the purpose and need in the proposals, which is a little different process as we normally do where council tip staff typically hear the issues and start to develop a purpose in each statement, try to get at the heart of the matter and what the problems might be and develop these things usually in concert with uh, the industry or inside the gap or wherever it is coming from. This was a little bit different. So the council took a different tack by having the, the gap and the industry come together and scope this out. So we did that in March and April of 2020. They developed a purpose in each statement and a few proposals. And I do want to say that the industry did a nice job balancing all this information, trying to work with all the industry uh, representatives and find a, and strike a good balance about what would best meet their needs and how to move forward. So they developed the gap informational report in 2020, and we provided that to you for consideration. So when you want to continue the scoping process. So next slide, please. So then in September 2020, NIMS staff and council staff got together, started thinking about the issues that were identified in the info report and put out a scoping paper, things to think about. Maybe EFPs are a better route. Uh, is the purpose and need sufficient? Those kinds of things. The GMT did provide a report on a preliminary look at the data and, and just trying to think about the potential causes and the issues and, and had a lot of discussion in September trying to wrestle with this. Uh, the council did adopt a purpose and need statement and moved it further uh, for scoping. And uh, only four of the proposals, though, moved forward. At that time, there was some concerns about opening up processing south of 42. So they thought maybe uh, that might warrant an EFP. So took that proposal out and separated it and just start thinking about maybe that's best for the 23-24 specifications process. Next slide, please. So the council adopted purpose and need statement is here. Uh, I underlined and just trying to highlight the issues and the concerns. Really, the mothership sector has been experiencing lower than average attainment than the other non-tribal whiting sectors. And the purpose of the action, as they cited, was to improve the mothership sector utilization and flexibility, and really to try to provide for full utilization of the trawl sector's allocation. On the floor, we did some wordsmithing, trying to figure out how to incorporate this purpose and needs uh, desire that there's, there was multiple proposals on the table that were germane to not just the mothership sector, but also the other sectors. So the, the council came up with a sentence that looked like th this at the end. So however, alternatives such as an earlier start date may apply to all whiting sectors through participants and comments. So just trying to, just trying to see that the whole picture and see what the issues might be uh, for not just the mothership sector, but also the other sectors. So with that, then we moved over to try to think about the assessment of the purpose and need. And I'm going to turn this over to Jesse because she started to take a deep dive into all this information and really tried to pull apart what the issues that were being identified. She worked with the industry and, and reached out, uh, which I appreciate all of her help here, uh, to really kind of look at the key issues. So I'm going to turn it over for her for a little bit to look at that assessment. 
Thanks, Brett. Um, good afternoon or evening, I guess, starting to be there, um, <laughs> council members. So I'm gonna walk through our assessment of the purpose and need from the scoping document. Uh, if it's okay with the vice chair, I might stop for questions periodically in here just to make sure we don't get too far past uh, sections and have to go quite far back because I know it can be a little detailed. Oh, okay, sounds good. So there were five key issues noted around the need for action for this item as Brett just discussed. And so we try to evaluate these five general themes in order to better understand the current situation in the mothership sector and all whiting fisheries, as well to further inform a potential selection of a range of alternatives that could address those needs. So um, the first, the pr proposed purpose and need identifies that the mothership sector is experiencing lower than average attainment than the other whiting sectors during the trawl rationalization program. From 2017 to 2019, the mothership sector has underattained their, their post reapportionment allocations by over 36% compared to the CP sector, which had a 90% attainment average, and the shoreside IFQ sector had an 83% attainment average. However, it's important to consider these attainment trends in concert with the recent total allowable catches, or tax. So recently, tax have been increasing yet the change in catch in terms of actual metric tons has varied. So the figure on your screen summarizes the percent change in catch and allocations from 2011 to 2013 compared to 2014 to 2016, and that's on the left panel. And then you have 2014 to 2016 compared to 2017 to 2019 on the right panel. And this is based on table two on page five of attachment one. So, as allocations, which are shown in the light green bars, have increased um, in the first period by 51%, and in our second comparison period by 29%, the CP sector, which is shown in dark green, appears to be capturing a majority of the allocation increases over the nine-year period. And you can tell that by um, looking at the, oh, excuse me, the dark gray bars, not the dark green bars. Um, she can tell the difference between the light green and the dark gray bars. And in fact, the change in catch for the CP sector outgrew the allocation in um, when comparing 2017 to 2019 compared to 2014 to 2016. For the shoreside sector, which is shown in the light gray, they did not see concurrent landings growth from um, in the first period and actually saw a decline by 4%. However, they saw a 73% increase in landings in 2017 to 2019 compared to 2014 to 2016, suggesting the ability to utilize the higher whiting allocations. With the mothership sector, however, which is shown in dark green, growth in landings is unequal to the growth in allocations in both comparison periods, suggesting there are limits to attainment. And in fact, if you were to remove 2015 from the catch estimates, um, in 2014 to 2016, and compare that to 2017 to 2019, the average catch actually declines by two and a half percent. Next, we'll move on to some economic rationale. Uh, the proposed purpose and need identifies that under attainment has led to economic losses for both the fleet and individual catcher vessels. The GMT noted in their September statement that mothership revenue is growing at a slower rate than the other sectors since 2014. In the purpose and need, it also states that the council's five-year review of the TIQ program confirmed that mothership sector participants were not realizing the same economic gains as their counterparts in the shoreside and CP whiting sectors. So one of the metrics used as an indicator of economic performance in the five-year review was efficiency which can be defined as net revenue over total revenue. And you can think about it as, um, it's a broad term to denote the state of best possible operations of a product or a service market. And I wanna take a quick second to say a special thank you to Marie Gilden and Ashley Vizek at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, they helped to update that original analysis um, on efficiency while addressing some concerns from that analysis about it being able to un about it being able to being unable to capture the effects of vertical integration in the mothership and the shoreside sectors. Therefore, we shifted to a more holistic look, looking at the entire supply chain from harvesting to processing. 
So instead of looking at motherships and catcher vessels individually, we looked at them as a whole. Now there is a downside to this is that we can't pinpoint if increases or decreases in efficiency are being driven by delivering vessels, the motherships or processors, or both. Um, but overall, some highlights from this analysis, um, and there's more in the document, the CP sectors has the highest efficiency of the three, and there's been no real significant change since before catch shares. And the mothership and shoreside sectors have declined in efficiency since catch shares. We also took a brief look at the product types um, that occur by sector and the price trends of those products. So each sector has a different portfolio of products from surimi to fillets. And alternatives selected, um, and I'm specifically looking at the start date alternative um, being considered here, could potentially give a market advantage to one sector over another if they're competing in the same product market. Next, moving on to some economic rationale around catcher vessels. So given that a majority of catcher vessels in the mothership sector also participate in the shoreside fishery, it is important to consider if changes in attainment seen in the shoreside sector um, in 2017 to 2019 are impacting the mothership sector and how it's affecting vessels overall. So on your screen, you'll see a summary table of table six from page nine of the scoping document. And just to walk you through it, you have your, um, three year um, periods that we've been discussing previously, the percent of revenue uh, coming from the mothership and shoreside sectors for those vessels that participate in both fisheries in a given year, the average revenue, and that is adjusted for inflation, and then the average whiting landings during those periods for those vessels. So, Overall, we've seen a shift in the potential uh, in the percent of total revenue for these vessels in the last three years, shifting from the mothership sector to the shoreside sector. Um, so you can see the decline in about three percent. It's being shifted over to the shoreside sector, which occurred at the same time that shoreside catch increased by over seventy percent from the previous three years, as I discussed um, a few slides ago, and attainment by twenty one percent. So this does support um, that vessels, the idea that ves this may suggest that vessels that cross over between fisheries may be participating more in the shoreside sector to the detriment of the mothership sector. The reason behind this shift um, does support the um, notions of a lack of processor capacity, um, the prioritization of Alaska Pollock over Pacific Whiting, and other factors. Also, some entities may have interest across multiple whiting sectors, which may affect the prioritization in one fishery over another. Further analyses would need to be uh, would be needed to understand these connections and the potential impacts of various alternatives. So, looking at catcher vessel harvest opportunities, one cause of underattainment identified in the proposed purpose and need is the inability for mothership catcher vessels to harvest their full allocations or even harvest any fish at all due to lack of a processor. And in certain cases, catcher vessels have been stranded without a mothership processor to deliver to for a season, a year, or even multiple years. So, we took a look at the mothership catcher vessel harvest history compared to their. CHAs or catch history assignments. And this is simply the percent of allocation allocated to those mothership catcher vessel endorsed permits. And you can see the details on table seven on page 12. So overall, an average of 47% of mothership catcher vessels harvested 0% of their catch history assignment from 2011 through 2019. Now, CHAs may be harvested by other vessels, and um, these vessels may be compensated in some manner. Uh, compensation could be monetary or other quota, but it's likely not the same as it would be harvesting the product themselves. I will note that during the gap discussion, it was stated that some of these CHAs are very small and might not actually be economical for them to actually harvest them, or for companies with multiple permits may have one boat harvest all the CHAs for that company. So that'd be something we'd want to dig into a little bit more um, if you choose to move forward with this action. Looking at processor availability, mothership participation does appear to vary by season compared to the CP sector, 
but we do typically see fewer mothership processors processors on the ground as we progress through the season. And I'm going to take a quick break because I know that was a lot of detail and see if there are any questions over those few slides. Hey, thanks, Jesse. Questions for Jesse? Okay, seeing none. Awesome. Okay. Moving on to Alaska Pollock interactions. So the purpose and need states that a majority of the ATSI processors and a large portion of catcher vessels participate in the Alaska Pollock fishery. Recent high catch limits for Alaska Pollock are thought to have limited available processor vessels during the primary season. So just a couple of facts. Um, so all processors registered to fish Pacific Whiting from 2011 through 2020 were also registered to fish Alaska Pollock in the same year with 93% actually fishing both. And I'll note that since last week in the discussions with the GAP and the GMT, we were able to get a little bit of additional information um, thanks to Pacific States on some seasonal patterns of participation for those vessels. Um, and in general, for the motherships and CPs, all processors typically are active in both A and B seasons um, overall. In terms of catcher vessels though, um, over half of mothership catcher vessels and shoreside whiting catcher vessels are registered to fish or participate in both whiting and Alaska pollock. In terms of seasonality, with that new analysis, we'll note that there's actually um, a significant drop off in the number of catcher vessels that participate in A season, which has been 21 from 2017 to 2019, compared to only 11 participating in B season. Um, and we do believe these are about the same groups of vessels. They tend to be the same group year to year that participate. Therefore, the overall participation of catcher vessels that participate in Alaska declines from A season to B season as they stay on the West Coast to fish whiting. And finally, there does appear to be an inverse relationship between mothership attainment and the Alaska tag. Next, the last thing we're gonna look at is uh, a little bit of a regulatory overview. So in the proposed purpose and need, regulatory barriers are noted as a potential factor affecting utilization. This phrase can potentially encompass several issues and therefore the document attempted to characterize the operations of each of the widening sectors and the limits impacting each of the sectors harvest, ownership and participation with an in-depth focus on the mothership sector. Note that while the current season start date of May 15th could be discussed as a barrier, we're going to talk about that a little later on in looking at the um, potential range of alternatives. Also, I want to say this is a 100,000 foot overview and I would really refer you to the scoping document, um, the annual co-op reports that are um, submitted by the CP and Mothership co-ops, um, and other reference documents for more details. In terms of operations, the CP and mothership sectors operate under a co-op structure, while the shoreside whiting sector operates within the shore-based IFQ program. The majority of shoreside whiting vessels do also participate voluntarily in the shoreside whiting cooperative. In terms of participation, the at sea sectors are limited in participation by the number of sector endorsed permits. So six MS endorsed permits, 34 mothership catcher vessel endorsed permits, and 10 CP endorsed permits. While participants in the shoreside whiting fishery are limited only by the requirements of the shore-based IFQ program, which is simply a trawl endorsed permit, and you need to have quota to cover your catch. I will note that um, while the number of participants in the whiting fishery could be up to the number of trawl permits, it's been pretty stable in recent years. Moving on, for catch limits, catcher vessels are limited to harvesting 30% of the mothership whiting allocation and 15% of the shoreside whiting allocation, and there are no harvest limits for the CP sector. The mothership sector is the only sector with a processing limit at 45%. And finally, for ownership, each sector is subject to ownership limits determined by the individual and collective rule. Um, as follows. So an entity can own no more than 20% of a catch history assignment for the mothership sector. The CP sector only has ownership limits if the CP co-op were to dissolve, and then it would be an IFQ program in which no entity could own more than five CP endorsed permits. And for the shoreside sector, um, participants are limited by the quota share limits, which is 10% for whiting. 
And um, I'll stop here to uh, take any questions and then we'll turn it back over to Brett. Okay, questions for uh, Jesse? Oh, thanks, Jesse. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Just a uh, quick, after we really digested all this information and started to think about the purpose and need as it was drafted by the industry, we went back to uh, our pencil and paper and started thinking about uh, what are the needs and what are the problems? And and so this team that we developed this paper, which is identified at the end of the scoping paper, started to take a look at the purpose and need and see, uh, are we hitting the mark? And so we drafted something up that we thought maybe would be more pointed. And so what we see here is really we're thinking about the mothership sector was really under attaining its post reapportionment allocation for whiting. And thinking about the causes of underattainment uh, after conversations in the GMT and outside with the industry, uh, we've really kind of found that there was some problems with the mothership's um, issues was you know, trying to deliver their catch. And there's some seasonal overlap with the Alaska pollock fishery. And, and then trying to t dive into, well, what else is there? And it's the existing regulations may be limiting uh, some of the catchers' of vessels' abilities to harvest or deliver fish. And so we wanted to kind of identify those problems clearly and then just focus on the purpose of the action is to really to improve the mothership sector's ability to utilize their whiting allocation. So by just trying to identify and revise the regulations that may be constraining to the fishery. So that was really trying to focus in on the mothership's concerns and try to see maybe some of those proposals on paper would meet that, uh, that, that purpose and need statement. Next slide. So then we took a step back and started to look at the whole fishery and thought, well, what do they need? And so we thought maybe it's to create flexibility and harvest opportunities for all sectors in the IFQ, uh, in the Troll Catch Show program. And that the purpose of the action is to balance the use of the whiting fishery resource. And, and while maintaining a fair and equitable allocation of the resource, I know that we had a lot of discussion in the gap about that term fair and equitable allocation. And, and so there was some concern about the use of a revised purpose and need. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit. The actions then also we figured as they identified in the gap um, info report and the purpose and need that was adopted by the council really did capture some of these elements as well of the trawl catcher program. And the goal is to create and implement a capacity rationalization plan. You know, just, just trying to focus in on, on the plan and the goals there. And then specifically the action may meet the management goals two and three of the FMP, uh, which seek to maximize the value of the ground fish resource as a whole and to achieve the maximum biological yield. So, and also meeting a national standard one. So we're trying to retool it a little bit to provide the council an opportunity to either in part take just the mothership sector purpose and need statement and take cherry pick if needed any any proposals that were on paper that would be just meet that purpose and need statement. But if there was other things such as a season changing this widening season start date that we'd want to widen the action and widen the pur purpose and need statement to to fit that proposal in. So then we also took a look at what else might be outside of what the count the uh, pardon me the industry developed what other options are out there that might meet the purpose and need statement and so some of these things that we identified in the paper were heard in in public forums with the industry options kicked in around but we thought we should just at least put them on paper to just think about a range of alternatives so we'll just quickly take a look at those as well and a preliminary assessment of those options and so i'll turn over to jesse on that okay jesse thanks so yes i'm going to go over um hit the high points of our preliminary assessment of the four options that the council forwarded in september 2020. So first up is the proposal to look at the primary widen season start date to something earlier than May 15th. There were three sub options proposed by industry, April 1, April 15th, and May 1st. One thing I do want to note here is that one option was not explicitly made clear in the document was that the council could choose to have different start dates for the mothership sector compared to the other sectors. 
However, the discussions presented in the document and in this PowerPoint will discuss some of the things that would need to be considered if the council chose that option. So speaking of that point, so historically sectors have had different start dates and most recently the shoreside fishery operated with two different start dates, June 15th and April 15th until it was changed in 2015 to May 15th for the fishery north of 43 to 4030. So just putting that in some context of limiting this action just to the mothership sector or all three sectors. Um, with the changing of the start date, there will there are potential biop implications as the ITS states that the duration for the duration of the biop, the earliest the whiting season north of 4030 can start is May 15th. So I'm going to give a brief highlight of the information presented in the document um, on some various uh, areas. And if this is adopted into an ROA, further discussion and analysis would of course occur. First off, looking at salmon impacts, as this is one of the biggest concerns with the changing of the start date. So overall, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of impacts outside of the primary whiting season, both in terms of total bycatch and of specific ESA listed stocks. Prior analyses showed gr the greatest risk of salmon bycatch in April to May, but there's been significant management changes since that time and it, the available data sample was small. And so for example, this was really in the uh, most recent rule to change that whiting season start date for the shoreside fishery in 2015. The data used to assess the impacts was based on shoreside whiting samples from 1995 to 2004 from Oregon only, didn't include at sea data, and doesn't consider all the changes that have occurred since manage with management since that time, such as shifting to co-op management and our IFQ program. Um, in order to see if we could assess, um, given the data that we do have within the um, whiting season, we started to look at trends. So overall, bycatch rates and salmon counts are up in the fall and the winter months, even though haul counts are actually greater in the spring um, for the Etsy fisheries and into the summer for the shoreside fisheries. Individual haul level data show similar bycatch patterns in May and June, which could suggest that bycatch estimates would be similar um, if the start date would move, were moved earlier. Next, we started to look at what the potential economic impacts would be to the fleets if the start date uh, were moved earlier by again looking at some seasonal trends. The Yatsi fisheries harvest 40 to 50% of all of their whiting in May and June, with all sectors seeing a general increase in that percent taken prior to June since 2011, um, noting that the shoreside fleet tends to pick up after the Yatsi processors leave for Alaska. Uh, and a special thank you here to Sea State and the Whiting Mothership Cooperative. They were able to provide us with some graphics that uh, we would have never been able to produce. Um, that showed that the catch per unit effort for whiting is uh, higher than the other months um, on average for May and June. So given that for some processors, there are only a few weeks to process whiting before heading to Alaska, an earlier start date could provide additional opportunity between the Alaska pollock seasons, leading to increased utilization and profit for the sectors. A few other considerations here. Um, that we looked at were the whiting treaty interactions and some fair and equitable considerations. So looking at the whiting treaty, typically NIMPS publishes regulations with the proposed rule um, coming in March and the final rule being published right before the season starts. Uh, if in 2020 though, interim allocations were published due to the JMC AP's inability to meet a consensus. And um, I know the NIPS report, uh, they'll be speaking to that soon and there's more details there. However, if a start date were moved earlier, uh, we may need to look at a more formal interim allocation process um, may be needed. For the fair and equitable uh, standards and national standard four, so in considering your determination of whether this action would be limited to just the mothership sector or would apply to all three sectors, um, it all the standards are laid out in the document, so I'd point you to that. And um, just noting that we have heard that if you allow one to start earlier, it could create a market um, advantage for one sector. 
And I might go ahead and stop there um, and see if there are any questions on the start date before continuing on to the other three proposals. Okay, questions for Jesse? Marcy Rumko, Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, back on slide 22, I did not understand what is meant by this bullet that says bycatch rates and salmon count is up in fall and winter, but the haul counts are greatest in the spring and into summer. Can you break that down for me? I, I'm, I think I'm missing your point. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Grimko, absolutely. Yeah, this is what you get when trying to shove a bunch of stuff into a bullet, I guess. So the big thing here that we're wanting to point out is that generally, and there's some great graphics in the document, I'd have to find the reference to them, but it shows that the um, bycatch rates in terms of number of Chinook per, um, I believe it's a thousand metric tons of whiting. I forgot the denominator at this late hour. Um, and the actual count of Chinook salmon, um, they're actually higher in the fall and winter months for all three whiting fisheries. But we actually see the greatest number of hauls in terms of effort for our greatest in the spring and in the summer. So um, we're really seeing these high bycatch rates, these high salmon counts when the fisheries aren't as active. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks so much. Okay, anyone else? Questions? Okay, Jesse, proceed. Perfect. Okay, moving to proposal two, the processor obligation deadline. Uh, this is looking at changing the date in which a mothership catcher vessel must obligate their CHA to a mothership. The current deadline is November 30th, the prior year, and there were four sub options proposed by industry on the um, date change, as you can see on your screen. Considerations here. So the initial purpose was to provide some short-term certainty for mothership companies and business planning without having to do what was um, kind of known as the linkage provision. And, and that idea was based um, when in the development of the IFQ program was based on the Alaska model in which a catcher vessel would be tied to a processor. And then in order to change processors, that vessel would have to enter the open access or non-co-op fishery for a year. So instead, um, with a lot of complicated history around this, the council chose to go with this obligation deadline to provide that certainty for mothership companies. So with this proposal, it could provide flexibility for catcher vessels in finding a mothership to take their catch while removing the discomfort of obligating during the current year, as noted in informational report four from the gap. Overall here, um, we're thinking there's not a lot of bio there's no biological impacts, probably little analytical burden. This is mostly an administrative action. Um, I will note that there was two other ideas brought forward in the document. One was looking at a reciprocal clause between catcher vessels and motherships. So not only having catcher vessels commit to motherships, but having that um, the other direction as well. This has been previously discussed since this was brought back to the council's agenda um, since 2017, but there was no consensus during that mothership meeting in October 2018 on this idea. Um, so, and it wasn't brought forward by the gap in their proposals. There is also another option to remove the obligation deadline. And so this is the idea, this is a new idea. Um, so right now there is an administrative need by NIMPS um, that you have to, every time a catcher vessel needs to shift to a mothership processor. And this can actually even occur within a company. So if a catcher vessel is delivering to one mothership, it has to, um, there has to be a form filled out before they can go and deliver to another mothership, even within the same company. So um, this idea would let co-ops manage or through contractual obligation. And I believe the gap is going to speak to this idea in their report. Moving on to the processing cap, proposal three. So here we're looking at increasing the processing cap to something higher than 45%. As I discussed at the top of the presentation, the mothership sector is the only whiting sector with a processing cap. Considerations here, 
Currently, there's a minimum of three mothership processors needed to harvest the allocation. In other words, it two took, uh, were able to process 45%, you would need an um, additional third vessel to come in to take the remaining 10% of the allocation. However, we typically have between five and six motherships active in a given year. So with, uh, we have seen ownership structures since um, changes since the program was implemented. And with these new structures, it can limit the ability for certain processing companies um, to actually process what they could process because of the way the ownership structure is set up. So the council here should consider, do you wanna maintain the three mothership minimum to harvest the allocation? And what other processing limits could be analyzed? Here we had a couple of new options for, um, for consideration in the document. The first off would be divisible uh, catch history assignments. This was a new idea. Um, in which catcher vessels could, uh, it would become more like an IFQ program where catcher vessels could split their catch history assignments amongst multiple motherships. And then there's an idea of a tack dependent cap where um, the processing limit would increase if the tack fell below a certain level to provide more incentive for processors. Again, I know the gap in GMT, I think both are speaking to these um, other options. And finally, proposal four, um, mothership catcher vessel permit transfers. There's two pieces to this um, proposal. So the first one is that a vessel could be registered and participate as a CP and a mothership in the same year. And the second part would be it would increase the number of transfers for mothership and catcher per processor permits annually. So looking at these two elements, just kind of break this down. So for the idea to change it so a mothership and catcher processor could, um, a vessel could operate as both in the same year, the initial regulation was intended to provide market stability within the sectors. And um, I know we've had extensive discussion on the emergency rule today um, about this agenda item. So I won't uh, go into detail much there. Uh, but on the permit transfer limit, we'll note that currently you're allowed two transfers within a sector per year of a permit. And that second transfer must be back to the original vessel. So the Amendment 20 EIS stated that the idea was to provide flexibility if the mothership sector wasn't able to process or other opportunities arose, such as Alaska Pollock. Um, and the idea here was like they could give it to another vessel um, if they weren't able to come back down. Uh, the thought was a, to also maintain stable relationships between catcher vessels and motherships. Okay, a few more considerations. Um, overall, this proposal may provide for additional processing capacity, and this is especially if you consider this with changes in the start date. For example, a vessel could operate as a CP early in the year, go to fish uh, Pollock in Alaska, and then come back for uh, to the West Coast for the fall whiting fishery as a mothership. Now, um, under the proposal, we just wanted to point out that while a, a lot of people are considering this in the uh, catcher processor operating as a mothership, um, this could theoretically go the other direction. So a typical mothership vessel could operate as a CP uh, if the permit was available. Now note there are, um, I think there's only been one latent permit in the CP sector since 2011. So how possible this would be is pretty limited um, given recent um, trends. And also for the council's consideration of the six mothership vessels on the West Coast, only three would really be able to take advantage of this as they are operate as CPs in Alaska. The other three vessels, as we understand it, are motherships on both uh, in Alaska and on the West Coast, and so they wouldn't be able to take advantage of this per, uh, this provision. So, under this proposal, the council should consider what number of permit transfers um, they would want to consider in a range. Um, we did note that another option would be to open up the closed class of mothership processors. As I stated at the beginning of the um, presentation, there are six mothership endorsed permits. Um, we initially had seven back under Amendment 15. 
Uh, however, one vessel was eliminated in the development of Amendment 20. But overall, we're not sure about the how many vessels would actually be willing and able to actually operate as a processor, um, just overall. So that'd be something to consider. And I'll stop here and take any questions. And then I think Brett has one thing to wrap it all up. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Uh, questions? Um, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Yeah, thanks, Jesse. And, and thanks to you and Brett so much for this presentation. It's very helpful. Um, question on the, the permit transfers, and this may actually be a question for the National Marine Fisheries Service, which I can ask them in discussion, but thought I'd see if you know uh, how much administrative burden there is with each permit transfer, each time a permit is transferred. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Summers, yes, I'm definitely going to uh, phone a, a friend at NIMPS to answer that one, or you might want to wait till they give their report, either one. <laughs> Happy to wait. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil? Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Hi, Jesse. Good to hear your voice. Um, thanks for all the work and putting the, uh, this together and you and Brett. Um, back on uh, slide 28, there was a, a top, um, the first bullet, the min minimum of three mother ships is needed to harvest the allocation. How, how was that calculation made? Or Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Anderson, uh, so this was the idea when the council, like looking back through some history, and there's actually a WDFW report back on this from 2017, I want to say. So um, the idea was that if two, at a minimum, if two vessels took the full 45% um, processing limit, that would equal 90%. And then you would need a third processor to come in and take the 10% in order to fully harvest the allocation. I got it, thank you. Yep. So, um, Pete Hasselberg, Pete? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions. I know everyone's happy to hear that. Um, and they're more related, not to the presentation and overview, but um, additional detail that wasn't covered that's in the report. And if it's best to just let uh, Brett finish up with the last slide. Um, it, it's not getting in the discussion, but some more clarification on the report itself when the best time is to ask that. Mr. Vice Mr. Vice Chair, I would say maybe now if Brett agrees. Agreed. Okay. All right, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, um, it, it's not a lot of questions. It's um, a couple of sequential things, though. So, and thanks, Jesse and Brett, for that re um, presentation and the scoping document you you put together. Um, it's very informative, and I'm not being critical of it. I just want to clarify because we have these issues about which sectors are affected and how various things are analyzed. So let me start um, with table one in your report. And I'm not going to go through every table, but in table one, um, it, it has lines for pre and post reapportionment. And the, the question I have is when does reapportionment occur um, in, in your presentation? Slide 23 said 40 to 50 percent of the whiting is harvested in May and June. I read the regulations on on reapportionment, and it appears that there's quite a range of dates. So, this in general, does the reapportionment occur later in the season, or maybe a different, similar question is when do the sectors become aware of what their more or less final allocation is? Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Hassemer, uh, I will answer that to the best of my ability, and then I might have uh, NIMS clarify a little bit. I do know that it, it does vary by year. You are correct in terms of the tribal reapportionment. Um, it typically occurs later on in the season after the tribal 
fisheries, you know, kind of determine what their season is going to look like. And then they determine if it's no, like they do not um, plan on utilizing some of their allocation. Uh, and then I will also note that it's it's been fairly consistent in terms of the amount of quota that has been re, um, reapportioned at the end of each year. But I may look to Ms. Ames, I believe, who's sitting in the NIMP seat, if she has some specifics on that date. Um, Peggy or Kelly? Through the vice chair, uh, thanks, Jesse. I, I don't at this time, but I can certainly be prepared to go into greater detail for the NIMS report. Okay. All right. Well, well thanks. Um, I, I think that, you know, it is important to understand what amounts of fish are available. So, um, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, my next question. Please. Um, then, Jesse, in table seven in the in the scoping paper, um, there's the counts, well, there's a count of vessels that goes from the bottom, how many um, mothership catcher vessel LEPs there are to the top row is the vessels with zero mm -hmm. harvest. So we talked about how many have zero harvest. In your presentation, um, something complicated my assessment of that when you said uh, some of the, I believe you said some of the companies may have one vessel harvest several of the vessels catch history assignments. But my question was, you know, I, I understand the math here. There's 34 LEPs. Um, I'm looking at the 2020 column. There was one latent permit. There were 33 registered vessels. 18 had zero harvest and 15, which 18 and 15 adds to 33, said vessels participating. And I'm wondering what the definition of participation is here, because we've heard uh, some vessels never had an opportunity to, to fish or deliver catch. So were the 33 registered vessels actually in some sense participating? I mean, it was a vessel tied up to the dock, the motor was running, the nets were ready. They never had an opportunity. Um, so they were all participating, but a, a group of those never had an opportunity, or was there a decision that they weren't going to participate? Um, because, because participation is used differently than when, or possibly when we look at the Pollock fishery and different things. So how was participating in the fishery defined here? Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Hassemer, yes, um, definitely can see the little bit of confusion there. So in this table, we really wanted to look at um, the vessels that were registered to a limited entry permit with some kind of catch history assignment. And so this is our best metric of saying, okay, who is harvesting their limited entry permit, because each of one of those has a vessel assigned to it, except for those latent permits um, that are noted in that second from the bottom row. And so I compared those vessels and their catch history to what actually their assignment on their limited entry permit was in a given year. So in 2020, as in your example, there were 15 vessels who were registered to a catch history assignment into an LE permit that actively fished some amount of fish. There are some that took, you know, 200% of their CHA, and there were some that took maybe like half of their CHA. What I cannot tell, though, and is something, um, it's just because of the inner workings of the co-op, and I'm sure you could ask them all sorts of questions, but I can't tell of those vessels that may be harvested more than they were initially allocated. I don't know whose catch history that they took. And so that's kind of one of those examples that I talked about where maybe a company owns two vessels and two limited entry permits with catch history assignments, but one of them, you know, maybe they just say, I only want this one vessel to harvest both of their CHAs. So that would put one vessel in the participating column and one vessel into the zero harvest column. Does that answer your question? Does that help? Yes, that that helps. There's there's still some confusion there. 
I guess, but I I had asked because um, my next question, I, at the bottom of page seven, this gets to the effort shift that the, the uh, scoping paper talks about effort appears to be steadily shifting from the mothership to the shore side fishery. And I'm trying to make sure that um, that effort shift wasn't an artifact of calculation or wasn't implied or wasn't um, unnecessarily implying a decision to shift effort versus a re the shift is occurring of, as a result of the problem. And so maybe just a clarification on those effort shift calculations. Um, in the time periods that they're looking at, um, I'm not sure from 2008 to 2010, because the tables in this report didn't have it, how many vessels had zero um, catch in the fishery, and, and based on your explanation for the previous question, maybe the number of vessels participating doesn't influence that if the, if the number of vessels wasn't the denominator to get at those differences there. But the other thing that occurred is um, since 2011, the allocations have increased and although the, the proportional increases were the same across each sector, you know, one was the, the 50 some percent and the other 29 percent, when you look at the starting point, the absolute pounds that went into the sectors was different. Um, the absolute pounds into the shoreside and catcher processor were much greater than what went into the mothership. And I just wanna make sure that that effect there wouldn't skew or bias um, that calculation and make it appear as an effort shift, which um, since there were just more pounds available to them. So I, I don't know if that, that's very clear, but um, if, if the calculation of the um, mother sector boats catching 0.85 pounds in the shoreside sector for every pound in the mother ship catch versus the 2.3, the flip in the ratio, if that's truly reflective of an effort shift or there are some other complicating factors, the number of vessels that are actually participating in the two time periods and the fact that the absolute pounds available in the allocation changed much to a much greater extent for the shoreside and catcher processor sectors than it did for the mothership. Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Hasmer, I, I'm not 100% sure of if there was a question. I think I got the intent of what you were saying. Um, obviously, this was just a scoping document, and I think there are always we can make improvements here. Um, a couple of things, I guess, just in response um, on your point of actual like pound allocations and things like that in those comparisons. That's definitely why we really wanted to focus on that. I started out with, you know, we've been talking about attainment but we really had to look at like how have their catch trends taken. And that's why we looked at it on a percentage basis as opposed to just a pound basis, because it does provide a little bit more of that apples to apples comparison of how much of their actual allocation are they taking and how that's changing. Um, and in terms of catch as well, it just kind of uh, equalizes that. Um, I also, one other point, um, I think you had mentioned looking back to table seven, it didn't go back past 2011. Um, that's because mothership uh, catcher vessel permits weren't in place until 2011. So we wouldn't, uh, it would have to be a slightly different analysis uh, on how that would work because they were under a different uh, fishery structure prior to 2011. So we couldn't make that same uh, type of analysis. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll, I'll stand down for now. <laughs> okay, Pete, thank you. Um, Maggie Summer. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, 
Jesse, actually, it was just on the bottom of the last slide, the concept of a uh, whiting tack dependent processing cap. I just wanted to make sure I understood that concept uh, correctly. That that would be where we could set up a uh, a mechanism by by which the if the whiting tack was lower than a certain specified threshold, the cap would be uh, would would rise to a higher, also pre-specified level. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Simmers, yes, that's correct. And and really, the rationale behind that was because the idea was if the tack were to get low enough, the actual poundage in what is equatable to a forty-five percent limit might not be um, economically uh, beneficial for every mothership. And so if it's, you know, might be a better situation for the fleet as a whole, or if you bumped up the processing cap to let's say like 60%, then maybe two mothership processors could go out there and, and act as platforms for the uh, all of the catcher vessels as opposed to, um, you know, separating it amongst five to six. Thank you. Okay, um, Kelly Ames, Kelly? Thanks, Vice Chair. Jesse, I just want to note as you're going through the details of the analysis that I do have some concerns with the inclusion of tribal reapportionment being included in, you know, what is considered the total allocation to the sectors. To me, when I think about considering whiting utilization, we should be expecting and anticipating that tribal utilization will also increase and thus reapportionment would no longer be necessary. So, so just something to think about as, as we move forward considering the framing of the analysis. Oh, okay. A good point, Kelly. All right. Any further questions or are we waiting for an answer or a comment from Jesse? Oh, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Ames, duly noted on the allocations. Okay. Kelly, do you have another question or your hand's still up? Okay. Further questions before we go to Brett? Thank you, Jesse. Very informative. Um, great presentation. Uh, Brett? Okay. Thanks. Just one slide to wrap up here. Uh, I, as you know, we're continuing to scoping the whiting fishery utilization issues, just repeating the action here, the adopt the purpose and need statement and the range of alternatives. I do want to note that there are multiple purpose and need statements. I didn't know that uh, recrafting the original one that was adopted by the council for public review would uh, draw so much attention. So we do have uh, the original purpose and need statement out there. We have the staff's presentation and their revised purpose and need. The GAP has revised their purpose and need, so there's a third purpose and need statement. Uh, the GMT has weighed in and gave their thoughts on some changes as well. And then uh, the ODFW slash WDFW report has a purpose and need statement. And I do want to say uh, the ODFW WDFW joint report does seem to synthesize most of the concerns, I think, and the, and the things that all of us have identified and, and has, I think, crafted a, a purpose and need statement that might meet everybody's uh, expectations or thoughts on this. So I just want to point that out. Uh, and I think it is helpful uh, to have that report in the briefing book. So I do appreciate that from the two states. Uh, there are some timeline considerations here, of course. Uh, do you move this forward in a rulemaking package as a whole, uh, as, as we think? And or do we go ahead and take the EFP route on maybe one or two items? And so uh, those are things that have been kicked around and swirled uh, in in this forum and even in the past in our scoping document, the joint NIMS report that state council staff created last in 2019, I believe. So there's looks like some different ways to go about this uh, and different timelines that might be considered. We've talked a little bit about that under G2, but I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and that's all I really had for this uh, to wrap up. If there are no questions for myself or Jesse, we could go ahead and move to the NIMS report, which we have Kelly Ames and Stephanie Warpinski, I believe, that would give that report. 
and then we can move on uh, to the state reports and then the other advisory body reports. Well, thank you, Brett. Appreciate uh, the, the uh, presentation here from, from you both. Um, questions before we move on to the NIPS report? Okay. And I guess uh, Stephanie uh, Orpinski, um, I believe the, welcome. And I believe it's your first time at the council floor and uh, great to have you. Through the chair, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Stephanie Orpinski and I'm working with the NIMS West Coast Region Groundfish Branch. I'm on detail from Alaska. And I'm gonna briefly walk through the NIMS report associated with G3 as quickly as I can for what the hour is and try to answer any questions. Stacy Miller, the co-lead, and a few others for NIMS are on the line as well. Uh, the purpose and needs statement adopted for public review in September identified the need for the action as utter utilization in the mothership sector and the purpose of the action to improve the mothership sector utilization and flexibility. And for this action, if the NIMS, or I'm sorry, for this action, if the council expands the scope to multiple sectors, they need to consider revising the purpose and need of this action beyond just mothership utilization or discuss how changing the season date in other sectors addresses mothership utilization issues. Um, so for um, in, in adopting a purpose and needs statement, NIMS recommends that the council be specific on which sectors of the fishery are included in this action, the need for this action for those sectors. Um, moving on to cost recovery, NIMS has determined that staff time present spent on these proposals is recoverable under the cost recovery program. The first proposal would modify the start of the primary whiting season. NIMS has preliminarily determined that this proposal is not an incremental task as the season date predated the rationalization of the fishery and was established to address salmon bycatch. <clears throat> the remaining proposals would modify program elements created as part of the trawl rationalization program under Amendment 20. Of those three cost recoverable proposals, one proposal, the permit transfers between catcher processors and mother ships, is incremental to both the catcher processor and mothership sectors, while the other two recoverable proposals are incremental to just the mothership sector. Staff time spent on these recoverable proposals will be charged using a ratio-based approach. Um, I'm going to continue on to the BIOP considerations, and under the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, NIMS is mandated to protect, to protect, conserve, and recover ESA listed species, including salmon stocks. A concern with moving the start date earlier in the season is the change in stock composition that increases impacts to spring Chinook stocks in the earlier time periods in northern areas. If the council includes a change to an earlier season start date as part of the range of alternatives considered for this action, it would require a determination of whether the change would require reinitiation of ESA consultation. Upon receiving the council's recommendation for the final preferred alternatives for this action, NIMS would then evaluate the proposed action um, and make a determination whether reinitiation of the, of the consultation is required. NIMS cautions and stresses that early coordination, determination of whether the alternative selected as part of the ROA for this action would trigger reinitiation and a potential resulting ESA consultation would require time and resources of multiple, multiple NIMS divisions and branches. As NIMS reported previously, the West Coast region staff in both of these, in, in these branches are fully prescribed with current workload, particularly through the implementation of the 2021 Salmon and Pacific Whiting Harvest Specifications. Um, and so uh, in the report, NIMS sees a potential path forward for the proposal to change the season date using an EFP with the purpose to collect data on the effects of an earlier season start date on the ESA listed salmon and other bycatch species. Um, the council should discuss prioritization of this EFP with regards to the rest of the groundfish workload and new management measure priorities, including this action with the remaining three proposals since an EFP would also require analyses and consultations. And if this EFP is prioritized, NIMS would recommend utilize the count, utilizing the council process to develop the scope and details of the EFP, including articulating the date for the start of the season and to whom the exemption would extend. Um, lastly, um, as part of the NIMS report for wedding treaty implications, um, changing the primary Pacific whiting season start date earlier than May 15th could have implica implications on the U.S.-Canada bilateral process that sets the overall TAC and the subsequent rulemaking process to establish the U.S. TAC and the annual harvest specifications. Uh, 
If the council selects a change in season start date as per the alternatives, NIMS would engage with members of the agreements, joint management committee, and other treaty bodies to discuss potential impacts to the bilateral stock assessment and tax setting process. Given the timing of the GMC meeting and the subsequent rulemaking process, it would be unlikely that a final rule would be in place for all proposed earlier season start dates, and the Council and NIMS would have to explore formalizing a process to issue interim allocations in advance of the final rule publication. And with that, I open the NIMS report up to questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, very, very good. Questions for Stephanie on the NIMS report? Thank you, Summer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Stephanie, for the report. Um, let's, uh, on the start date issue, I think we we touched briefly on earlier um, the assumption that the earlier the the start date the earlier start date alternatives uh, proposed in the range, so some of the April alternatives. Uh, would probably require a more complex uh, ESA related analysis and potentially be more likely to trigger reinitiation of consultation um, compared to the March, pardon me, the May 1st date. Um, can you can you comment on that assumption? Do you have a sense of, of whether that's I'm on the right track there? Um, through chair, I think that the NIMS stands on ESA consultations and I'm going to talk and hope that somebody else in the line can add more. Um, what we're trying to not do is pre-commit to a conclusion of the in the ESA process and so trying to move around dates is not what we're trying to do and so I think you're asking for what would happen if we just changed the date just two weeks and I think we would have to um, we can't pre-commit to a conclusion at that time at this time. Okay, uh, further questions? Okay, seeing none, Stephanie, thank you. And next up um, is uh, Maggie Summer with the uh, WDFW, ODFW uh, report. Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this is agenda item G3A supplemental WDFW ODFW report uh, and I will summarize the introduction and then read through the proposed purpose and need. I'll say um, certainly recognize the almost baker's dozen of them out there now uh, but several of us uh, and this would be uh, WDFW and ODFW and, and we were also joined in this effort by Pete Hassamer um, took a look at the original purpose and need statement that was adopted last December for further, pardon me, last fall for further consideration. And then the new one proposed in the scoping document and we saw some, um, what we thought were needs for adjustments to both of those. So we had started working on this. Uh, we really were focused partly on the uh, questions that NIMS framed, it up, framed up for us in their report. Um, and thought there were some areas to, to strengthen the statement. Uh, we understood as, as we got toward the end of our process that the gap and the GMT were also going to be um, providing uh, recommended purpose and need statements, but we thought there was probably still some value in ours. And I will say that we, we had the benefit of seeing some early drafts of those and, and really tried to incorporate what we felt were the, the best and, and the most important elements of those uh, as well as our own thinking to present here. Uh, I will read through the purpose and needs statement um, and then just highlight a couple areas of uh, difference from the, the gap in the GMT statements. So this action is needed because the mothership sector of the Pacific Coast Groundfish Trawl Catch Share Program is under attaining its allocations for whiting and has experienced lower average attainment than the other non-tribal whiting sectors since the start of the Trawl Catch Share Program, particularly since 2017. Causes of under attainment may include limited availability of motherships for delivery of catch due to seasonal overlap with the Alaska Pollock fishery. In addition, existing regulations may be hindering some catcher vessels' opportunity to harvest or deliver fish to mothership processors, 
by limiting the ability for the available processors to accept fish from catcher vessels. In some cases, catcher vessels have been stranded without a mothership processor to deliver to for a season or years. These obstacles to harvest and processing in the mothership sector have led to social and economic losses for participants. The purpose of this action is to identify and revise regulations that may be unnecessarily constraining in order to provide increased operational flexibility in the Pacific whiting fishery and increase the mothership sector's ability to utilize its whiting allocation while maintaining fair and equitable access to Pacific whiting by all sectors of the program. The actions identified support the economic and utilization elements of the trawl catch share program goal to create and implement a capacity rationalization plan that increases net economic benefits, creates individual economic stability, provides for full utilization of the trawl sector allocation, considers environmental impacts, and achieves individual accountability of catch and bycatch. In addition, the action supports management goals two and three of the Pacific Coast Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan which respectively seek to maximize the value of the groundfish resource as a whole and to achieve the maximum biological yield of the overall groundfish fishery. In addition, this action supports National Standard 1 of the Magnuson-Stevens Act to achieve the optimum yield from the fishery. So the, the few things I'll just highlight here um, were really our, our starting sentence in the first paragraph, uh, really framing the need, which we saw as based on the um, relative underattainment of the mothership sector compared to the other sectors, as we just heard about in the um, staff presentation. Uh, we did remove some of the detailed information uh, on the causes and impacts of that underattainment from the gap statement. Uh, we thought that was very valuable information but not necessary in the purpose and need statement, um, and in fact is, can be more impactful in supporting analytical documentation when there can be more context provided around it to really understand uh, the specific figures that were there. In the middle paragraph at the top of page two, uh, this was our statement of the purpose of this action. Uh, again, really focusing on increased flexibility in the fishery uh, and increasing the mothership sector's ability to utilize uh, that sector's whiting allocation. Uh, and then finally, the, the change from the gap, uh, GAP's recommended statement in the third paragraph was simply to uh, quote the full catch share program goal rather than uh, cut it off after the utilization phrase of it. Uh, I think with that, um, I would conclude and respond to any questions. Uh, one more thing, if I may, which was just that, again, in recognition of the, the multiple versions and the fact that this was not a book until late uh, Friday afternoon, we, we um, regret that there was not an opportunity for the full gap to review and comment, uh, but we certainly hope that anybody who would like to indicate a preference among the statements or a concern about any elements of them uh, can let us know during public testimony. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Questions for Maggie? Okay, oh, Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I'm just hoping that in the, the very last paragraph, you speak toward, or you speak about the goal for full utilization of the trawl sector allocation. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if full utilization is um, really the goal or if what we're really talking about here is improved utilization. Um, and if you thought about that in crafting the purpose and need, and, and I raise that because um, while mothership may be the lowest of the widening sector uh, attainment statistics that we've seen, um, there are so many other trawl species and groups of stocks that are um, far, far uh, less attained than these. So I guess I was just um, wondering if you gave that concept any thought in crafting the language of the purpose of need. 
Thanks uh, to the vice chair. Thank you. Yeah, Marcy. Yes, um, I, I uh, that full utilization is part of the statement, uh, the goal of the trawl catch share program. Um, our intent here was to describe that the actions uh, contemplated here support uh, I support that goal. Our, our intent was to indicate that they, they support um, progress toward that goal. I, I certainly will admit to a, a lot of reservations about identification of full utilization as a goal because it is uh, not realistic in many cases for a number of reasons outside the control of the council. So it is certainly an aspirational goal. But in this purpose and need statement, the in intent um, was to recognize that uh, these actions might um, support progress toward that goal. And we kept that section in because it was in the um, the gaps recommended purpose and need. And we, we didn't want to do more, uh, more changing to the other versions out there that had really gone through a lot of um, collaborative work and vetting to develop than we thought were necessary. So we were okay with leaving that in. Okay. Right. Uh, further questions for uh, for Maggie? Okay. Seeing none, I will go to the GMT report and uh, Whitney Roberts. Whitney? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a sound check to make sure everyone can hear me. You're good. Great. Okay. Um, Whitney Roberts here, and I will be reading agenda item G3A, the supplemental GMT report one. Um, the ground fish management team's report on Pacific whiting utilization in the mothership sector. And I have to pause and apologize if you hear any whining in the background. It's my dog's, uh, he's ready for a walk. So um, <laughs> that's that noise if you hear it. And um, I, um, I hesitate to try to paraphrase a document whose crucial argument is that words matter. So I will read it, but I will read it fast as possible. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the materials in the advanced briefing book, including the scoping of the draft purpose and need and a range of alternatives, and received a briefing from Mr. Brett Weedoff and Ms. Jesse Dorbinghouse from the Pacific Fishery Management Council staff. The GMT provided a preliminary analysis and comments on this issue during the September 2020 council meeting and now provides the following additional comments on the revised draft purpose and need, along with a potential range of alternatives. As the National Marine Fishery Service notes, one of the questions a purpose and need statement strives to answer is what are we trying to achieve? An effective purpose and need statement not only clearly lists the, ex the existing conditions that justifies the need for a proposed action, but is also measurable in a way that the analysis of the range of alternatives can be used as a metric when determining which alternative is most likely to reasonably solve the problem. The council staff drafted purpose and need statement states that the purpose of this action is to improve the mothership sector's ability to utilize their writing allocation. The level of improvement sufficient to label this action achieved is not clear in either the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel proposed purpose statement in their March 2020 report or the Council staff drafted purpose statement. A measurable indicator need not necessarily be a quantitative metric, but could qualitatively highlight a specific actionable goal. The GMT attempted to incorporate such an indicator into the team's recommended purpose statement. The GMT understands the term attainment to mean an absolute percentage harvested of a fishery or sector's allocation. Full attainment is unlikely due to market, market constraints, improbability, and other factors outside of the council or industry influence. There is little helpful guidance, however, in either the Groundfish FMP, the Amendment 20 Trial Rationalization Program, or the MSA, or defining the for defining the term utilization when referring to utilization of a sector's allocation. The GMT feels that these terms, attainment and utilization, are not equivalent as implied in the council staff revised purpose and need. Merriam-Webster defines utilization as to make use of or to turn to practical use or account. Thus, the GMT interprets full util utilization to mean making complete use of or processing and selling to market the Pacific whiting that is within the fleet's operational capacity to harvest and process. The GMT also acknowledges that some of the proposed regulatory revisions outlined in the Attachment 1 scoping document may provide flexibility beyond the mothership sector in, in addition to the intended result of improving the mothership sector's ability to utilize their allocation. Therefore, the GMT recommends the following purpose statement, 
where we replace attainment with utilization and consciously include all whiting sectors as potential beneficiaries of actions designed to aid the mothership sector. And here I read our proposed purpose statement. The purpose of this action is to identify and potentially revise regulations that could provide additional flexibility in the Pacific whiting fishery to optimize the mothership sector's ability to utilize their allocation while maintaining fair and equitable access to Pacific whiting amongst all sectors of the program. And this purpose statement is also provided in Appendix 1, which includes the entire GMT recommended purpose and need statement. The industry proposed need statement clearly outlines the need to improve Pacific whiting utilization in the mothership sector. So the GMT recommends combining our revised purpose statement with the GAP proposed need statement in their March 2021 statement. Together, these statements fully encompass the need to improve mothership utilization and the purpose to seek regulatory flexibility that could address this need. The GMT's recommended full purpose and need statement can be found in Appendix 1. Range of alternatives. The GMT offers the following comments on the current list of proposals in the Attachment 1 scoping document. These comments are largely intended to ensure a sufficient range is included in the alternatives. The team intends to comment on the specifics of the alternatives at a later meeting when the Council schedules adoption of a preliminary preferred alternative. The GMT recommends adopting the GAP proposed range of alternatives with the following modifications described below at this meeting. Regarding the Pacific Whiting season start date, the proposal under this option is to change the Pacific Whiting season start date to earlier than May 15 for all Pacific Whiting sectors with sub options of April 1, April 15, and May 1. The NIMS report indicates that starting the season before May 15 may require reconsultation on the salmon biological opinion. This action may also trigger reinitiation of consultation on other ESA listed species. Given the range of sub options, in other words, from two weeks earlier to 1.5 months earlier, under this proposal and the associated wide range of potential impacts, the Council may wish to determine which of the sub-options are most likely to optimize both benefit to industry and analytical and administrative workload for both NIMS and the GMT. Given that mothership activity and catch per unit effort are high and increasing in the pace of activity during the earlier months of May through June, a start date of even just two weeks earlier than May 15 could provide significant improvement for utilization. The GMT notes that the ratio of salmon bycatch to Pacific whiting has been lower in the start of the season than in earlier in later months. However, bycatch and bycatch rates prior to May 15th remain unknown for this fishery. Nonetheless, there are measures in place to help mitigate impacts to Chinook and Coho salmon, including optional salmon mitigation plans, in-season monitoring, and in-season management tools. The GMT can further discuss these tools in the future if this proposal is included in the range of alternatives. Furthermore, it has been suggested that the proposal to change the Pacific Whiting season start date could be explored through an EFP. An EFP could allow some of the fleet to fish earlier than May 15 and may provide some data to assess potential impacts on ESA listed salmon evolutionarily significant units. However, even over several years, the EFP may not provide sufficient data to fully assess these impacts. The Council should consider whether an EFP is the most efficient way to explore changing the season start date, especially given the associated GMT workload. More generally, the process of transitioning EFPs into regulations remains ambiguous as has been identified as challenging by the GMT in previous statements. If the Council considers an EFP to explore altering the Pacific Whiting season start date, the GMT recommends including benchmarks or indicators for when the Council would either move forward with recommending a regulatory change or otherwise end the EFP. Regarding the mothership processor cap, included in the proposed options is a request to increase the mothership processing cap above 45% with an industry suggested range of 45 status quo, 65 or 65% or removal from regulation. Regardless of the council's selected range of processing caps for analysis, the GMT recommends that the council include the tax dependent cap as a sub option in the range of alternatives and specify that this sub option be applicable only to the status quo option 45%. The attachment one scoping document states that since the development and implementation of the cat shares program, industry has noted that ownership of the mothership permits and vessels has changed. These changes could result in companies being more limited in the ability to process fish and therefore be restricted by the 45% limit. In a lower whiting tack year, it is possible that the benefit of acting as a mothership processor may not be sufficient enough to cover that cost. For example, if only two companies processors participated under the current regulations, it would result in the inability to harvest the full allocation. The scoping document and the September 2020 GMT report both clearly outline the significant interactions between the Alaska Pollock fishery and the Pacific Whiting fishery, and the GMT sees merit in analyzing any potential flexibility 
that could pertain to this interaction. The intended flexibility provided, provided by the suboption was contingent on the council preferring to maintain a 45% cap that sets boundaries on participation. Increasing the processing cap above 45% could create flexibility that no longer warrants tax dependent flexibility. Other considerations. In table one below, the GMT provides expected workload for the industry proposed options that were highlighted in both the gap informational report and the March 2020 scoping document. If the council wishes to include the Pacific Whiting season start date option in the range of alternatives, NIMS would need to de determine whether ESA reconsultation is needed. NIMS may be unable to begin the process of making this determination until fall 2021 at the earliest, and so should indicate the likelihood that an EFP related to this action could be in place for the 2022 season. And in table one, you see the GMT anticipated workload for each proposal. Um, and then a list of the summary of recommendations that the GMT provides. And I stated all of those in the body of the document. And then appendix one, as I said, provides the full GMT recommended purpose and need statement combining um, the gap need and then um, the GMT's proposed purpose statement at the very end. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, questions for uh, Whitney? Uh, Maggie Summer. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks very much, Whitney. Appreciate it. Um, just having looked ahead at the GAP report, uh, I think one of the differences between the GAP and the GMT recommendations uh, was that the GMT recommended including a tech dependent processing cap option. Um, at least with a, the 45% level. And can you, can, uh, can you speak to the, uh, with any discussions the GMT had on the, the need or the value of keeping that in a range for further analysis at this point? Is, is that, I guess what I'm asking, is that something that uh, you guys had much discussion about and it, it seemed like a, a potentially important thing to at least explore further. Hey, the Vice Chair, thank you, Ms. Summer, for the question. Um, yes, there was some EMT discussion around this, um, although I will clarify that um, this, the tax dependent option idea was formulated last year around July, um, and it has uh, sort of developed and changed since then, and um, there seems to have been a little bit of confusion um, both outside of the GMT and within the GMT as to um, the intent of this option. Um, and when the option was formulated last year, it came up as uh, potentially a Pollock, an Alaska Pollock tax dependent option um, in which a higher Alaska Pollock tax um, would trigger a higher, potentially higher processing limit that would allow um, vessels to prioritize Pollock um, and not constrain any remaining platforms uh, by their processing limit. And so um, that idea has um, changed into a whiting tax uh, dependent processing cap. Um, as you see in the scoping document. And um, they're essentially at the, to answer your question, um, yes, the GMT had some discussion around this and um, we do see merit in a, um, in a Pollock dependent tax, although that doesn't seem to be the sub option proposed in the scoping document. Um, and regarding a whiting tax, um, there may also be merit in including it uh, but again, as we say, if that's included, the, the primary recommendation here is that if it is included, um, that it only apply to the, the status quo option if it is a whiting tax, um, because, or if it's a poly tax, either way, because at, at the end of the day, our recommendation is that um, it, the flexibility under a tax dependent suboption is only applicable um, if the council decides that um, a 45% processor cap is still required to, um, as Jesse said, maintain that initial intent of uh, 
a minimum amount of participation in the mothership processing um, fleet or sector. Um, and I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, further questions of Whitney? Okay. Uh, next up is the gap report, but we're going to um, stop right now for a break. Um, 10 minutes. And um, our plan is to get to the gap statement. Um, and it is 10 pages long. Uh, and hopefully get through public comment. But regardless, we're going to have a hard stop at 630. So people can plan for that. So um, anyway, we're back here at uh, 6 or 543. A 53, 553.
Okay, we're about ready to get started here. Okay, Sarah, look to you for the gap report. Are you there? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, for the record, I'll be reading agenda item G3A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. The GAP received an overview of this agenda item from Mr. Brett Weedoff and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse, Council staff, and an overview of the Supplemental NIMS report from Ms. Stephanie Warpinski and Mr. Brian Hooper, NIMS staff. The GAP wishes to acknowledge and thank the authors of the scoping document for their hard work in providing so much information for this meeting. Please find the GAP's outlined recommendations for this action below with discussions of each element provided in later sections. So to take you quickly through, we tried to provide a, um, an overview here so it would be easier to see the whole thing up front and then we go into detail later in the document. So for the purpose and need, although the council staff had prevent, presented a new purpose and need statement for council consideration, the GAP recommends adoption of the purpose and need statement from, that the council collected selected for public review in September 2020 as revised in the section below. For the range of alternatives, the GAP recommends that the council adopt the following range of alternatives for analysis. For the waiting season start date for all waiting sectors, status quo May 15th, and then alternatives of April 1, April 15, and May 1. For the mother <coughs> processor obligation, status quo of an obligation made by November 30th, alternative to remove the mothership processor obligation from regulation. For the mothership processor cap, status quo of 45%, and then alternatives of 65%, 85%, and removing the cap from regulation. For the mothership processor and catcher processor permit transfer, status quo that a vessel cannot be registered to a mothership permit and a CP permit in the same calendar year, and an alternative that a vessel could be registered to SCP and mothership permit in the same year. And we provide sub options for that, which are two transfers, four transfers, and unlimited transfers. For the purpose and need statement, the GAP recommends the council adopt the purpose and need statement developed by the council in September 2020 with the following revisions. I'm going to read through this very quickly. The MS sector of the Pacific whiting fishery has experienced lower average attainment than the other non tribal whiting sector since the start of the trawl catch share program, particularly since 2017, leading to social and economic losses for participants. The council's five-year review of the TRAP program confirmed that mothership sector participants were not realizing the same economic gains as their counterparts in the shoreside and catcher processor whiting sectors. During 2016 to 2020, more than 350 million pounds of whiting worth more than 28 million in ex vessel revenue has been left unharvested in the MS sector. Some catcher vessels have been unable to harvest and deliver their full MS sector allocations, and in certain cases, catcher vessels have been stranded without a mothership processor to deliver to for a season or years. Many MS waiting sector participants, including all six MS processor vessels and several MS catcher vessels, participate in the Alaska Pollock fishery. The Pollock fishery's record high catch limits in recent years has limited the availability of processor vessels and some catcher vessels to participate in the Pacific whiting fishery during the primary whiting season between May 15 and December 31. This reduced availability has coincided with record high catch limits and insufficient bycatch in the Pacific whiting fishery. These factors combined with regulatory barriers that have hindered flexibility have contributed to decreased utilization rates in the MS sector. The purpose of this action is to improve MS sector utilization and flexibility to better meet the national standards of Magnuson-Stevens Act and elements of the council's TRAP program goals that have not been fully realized to create and implement a capacity rationalization plan that increases net economic benefits, creates individual economic stability and provides for full utilization of the trial sector allocation. This is the part that we change the most. While the purpose of the action is to address the underutilization in the MS sector, some of the actions identified include other whiting sectors in order to ensure we maintain a common start date for all whiting sectors and where an action involving another whiting sector may improve MS sector utilization. The GAP appreciates the alternate purpose and need statement that was proposed by council staff but finds the purpose and need statement developed by the council as modified above to more clearly and specifically identify the problem and the urgent need for action. 
In addition, the original purpose and needs statement had already made its way through industry, the gap, and had been adopted for public review by the council. We advise revising the last paragraph of the council's purpose and needs statement in order to clearly and directly describe why other whiting sectors are involved in this action as recommended by NIPS. Lastly, the gap included the following minor changes for council review and red line above. Abbreviating mothership to MS throughout, although I just caught a few more that we missed. Providing specific years for the unharvested amount of whiting to be clear about which five years are referenced in case the action comes later. Adding an S to year since some catcher vessels did not deliver to a mothership for multiple years. Range of alternatives. For the whiting season start date, the GAP recommends um, the range that I previously described to include April 1, April 15, and May 1. As discussed in the scoping document, moving the start of the whiting season to an earlier date could provide significant improvements in mothership sector utilization because it would allow additional days for whiting operations between pollock seasons. It would also have benefits for the CP and shoreside sectors, and the GAP recommends retaining a common start date for all whiting sectors, which is consistent with the rationale and record of decision supporting the implementation of a common May 15 start date that was selected in 2015. Most at sea processors, MS, motherships, and catcher processors, and some catcher vessels head north to Alaska in January for Pollock A season, return to the West Coast in March or April for shipyard and spring hake, head north again in June or July for Pollock B season, and return to the West Coast in September or October for fall hake and or winter shipyard. At present, the primary whiting season starts on May 15th each year, while the B season Pollock fishery starts on June 10th. With a minimum seven-day transit north to Alaska, there is a very small window where the spring hake fishery does not overlap with bee season pollock. And that's from about May 15th to June 3rd, if you factor in the transit time, or about 20 days, not including time for offloads and crew changes. When motherships and catcher processors choose to have a longer participation in the spring hake fishery and arrive late for bee season pollock, it also delays their return for fall hake. For example, if a mothership or catcher processor participates in the Hake fishery until June 30th, heads to Seattle to offload and then crew up and backload for departure to Alaska a few days later, they would likely reach Dutch Harbor, Alaska around July 10th, a month into bee season. This is also true for the few catcher vessels who participate in bee season pollock. The later start for bee season means a later return to the West Coast for fall. Limited days in the current spring fishery often results in large amounts of the at-sea sector's respective allocations remaining to be harvested in the fall, where vessels face trade-offs between finishing the Pollock B season and returning to fall hake, where fishing conditions deteriorate later in the season, shipyard schedules are imminent, and crews are fatigued from the lengthy season. An earlier start for whiting could have beneficial impacts across the whole year for motherships and the catcher vessels that deliver to them, as well as for catcher processors by providing more operational days that do not overlap with pollock, allowing for more hake to come out of the water and potentially for an earlier return in fall. In simplest terms, a longer season would provide more time for each sector to prosecute their fisheries optimally and rationally. Shoreside processors would likewise benefit from an extended whiting season with additional days to optimize operations during the year. Because many of the CVs participate in both the shoreside and mothership fishery, and because the motherships are only available for a limited period, many catcher vessels com complete their mothership activities first when the whiting season opens and then move shoreside for the summer once their mothership processor has gone north to Alaska. This means that the shoreside processors may sometimes run short when mothership processors are operating in the hake fishery. A season date change may help to spread some of the catcher vessel effort out between sectors. For example, most mothership fleets start right on May 15th to get as many offshore days in as possible before the processors head north. Depending on the start date the council might select, there could be differential start times for mothership fleets that more naturally align with the processors return from Alaska reducing the pressure to all start on the same day and spreading effort between the shoreside and mothership sectors. As noted above, the gap highlights that the whiting season start date was most recently changed in 2015 to align the whiting sectors north of 4030 north latitude. And so if you see table one 
the season start date rule that changed in 2015 was a little bit confusing. So we just provided a table to show what the dates were from 97 to 2014 and what the dates have been from 2015 to present for each sector. Biological opinions. Over the past three years, the GAP and at times the council has expressed concerns with the way that 2017 salmon biop for groundfish fisheries was finalized. While all groundfish sectors recognize and acknowledge the need to minimize incidental take of salmon, some members of the GAP found the biop to be overly prescriptive such that it would significantly reduce management flexibility and efficiency. We are seeing the consequences of that today. For example, just six years ago when NIMS published the proposed rule to better align the season start date for the whiting sectors, the expected impact section of the preamble included statements like this. NIMS will be monitoring the take of salmon in season and expects industry to take measures to reduce salmon bycatch if needed. All midwater trawl fisheries have 100% monitoring and are required to track the catch of prohibited and protected species such as salmon. However, catch of salmon and groundfish trawl fisheries is highly variable from year to year, including in years where the season start um, was as early as April 15th and as late as June 15th. For salmon listed under the ESA, NIMS expects the bycatch of Chinook to remain with the amount considered in the 99 biological opinion for groundfish trawl fisheries um, combined, even if harvest limits for target groundfish species increase. These 2015 statements not only acknowledge industry actions to reduce salmon bycatch, but indicate that at the time, even with the change in season start date and the potential for increased harvest of whiting, NIMS expected Chinook bycatch to stay within the guidelines and that industry would take um, measures to reduce salmon bycatch as necessary. Today, despite operating under a rationalized program with cooperative bycatch management, 200% observer coverage, hard caps for Chinook and forthcoming salmon mitigation plans from the whiting cooperatives, NIMS concluded that changing the season start date may require reinitiation of the 2017 biop due to term and condition 2D in the incidental take statement. The gap requests further information from NIMS on how to proceed most efficiently with an earlier whiting season start date. For example, if an amended biop would be possible rather than full reinitiation, especially in light of the information provided in the scoping document. For example, the document found the following. Even with the potential for increased bycatch with extending the season by a couple weeks to a month, the overall risk of exceeding the Chinook salmon threshold is likely low as the whiting sectors as a whole have taken less than 6,000 Chinook salmon in each of the last three years. While bycatch rates in the southern latitudes are typically higher than northern, supporting the BIOPS conclusion that there is an increased risk, risk of bycatch with a more southern distribution, the interannual variation present within even these six years is important to consider. In 2020, both sectors saw the greatest number of hauls south of 4250 North Lat, but the bycatch ratios were close to 40, 400 times lower for the MS sector and five times lower for the CP sector than 2018 to 2019 average. Therefore, while bycatch impacts may be similar to the start of the season, the location of that effort will be another determining factor. However, given the management of the co-ops and the record of salmon avoidance, the risk level could be further mitigated. If NIMS determines that the biop does not need to be reopened in full, the GAP recommends that the at-sea processing south of 42 element that was previously removed from the main package be included for consideration in the reinitiation. EFP. The NIMS report states that there could be a potential path forward for the proposal to change the season date using an EFP with the purpose to collect data. Sorry, my lights went out in my office. <laughs> Let me get back to this. Um, collect data on the effects of an earlier season start date north of 42 North Lat on ESA listed salmonate and other bycatch species. This is a great solution in theory, but the GAP discussed some potential downsides. The GAP noted that moving the season start date proposal to an EFP would split away yet another crucial element from the main package. Note, as previously mentioned, that processing south of 42 was previously removed from the main package by the council. In addition, an EFP could be difficult to implement in terms of determining eligibility for participation. The vessels and or processors who were selected would have a competitive advantage over other whiting fishery participants because they would be operating at a time when others could not. 
In addition, for the mothership and shoreside whiting sectors, participation may need to be consolidated around processors in order to work, but could create further strife. For example, if three shoreside vessels were selected that all delivered to separate shoreside processors, it may be very difficult for each plant to hire enough crew to handle whiting offloads that were only coming in every couple of days from a single vessel. It would make more economic sense for one processor to receive deliveries from multiple vessels, but may not be fair to other processors. Likewise, the cost to other operate a mothership platform with a single catcher vessel delivering would not be economical, but allowing only one group of vessels with their mothership to participate in the EFP may not be fair. The same trade-offs would be forced upon catcher processors where 10 CP endorsed permits are held by three companies and sector participants would be forced to determine who gets the potential advantages of an early start date. There would also be implications for all of the waiting cooperatives to consider in terms of how to temporarily structure cooperative agreements um, to fairly account for differential start dates between members. Length of the EFP is also a concern. For example, if the EFP went on for years, like we've seen with other EFPs, it could exacerbate the fairness concerns unless the participants were switched each year. Overall, the gap supports the common season start date change as one of the most impactful elements of the package and seeks further guidance on the most expedient way for this element to proceed. For um, <laughs> the second piece, mothership processor obligation. The gap recommends that the council adopt the following range of alternatives. Um, so it would be the status quo, which is that the obligation is made by November 30th through MSCV endorsed limited entry permit renewals or alternative one, remove the mothership processor obligation from regulation. While the GAP had previously recommended an alternative that would consider the processor obligation deadline, at this meeting, we moved that alternative to our considered but rejected file discussed below. Instead, we recommend that the council include an alternative to remove the processor obligation from regulation. The processor obligation is a unique feature of this fishery that does not occur in other fisheries, and the GAP agreed that this could instead be handled through private arrangements between catcher vessels and processors or within the Whiting Mothership Cooperative outside of the government purview. The NIMS report supports this conclusion. The GAP notes that alternative one could reduce cost recovery for the MS sector since the processor obligations would no longer need to be collected through limited entry permit renewals and participants would no longer need to submit mutual agreement exception paperwork to change the processor obligations within the calendar year. Mothership processor cap. The GAP recommends the council adopt the following range of alternatives for the maximum amount of the annual mothership sector's specific whiting allocation that a person owning a mothership permit may cumulatively process. That's the language from the regulation. Um, so the status quo is 45, and then we are recommending alts one and two and three be 65%, 85%, or remove the mothership processor cap from regulation. The processor cap is a unique feature to the mothership sector and does not apply to other sectors. While the original intent was to ensure that at least three entities participate, in reality, the cap does nothing to ensure participation. However, it could serve to limit participation if a catcher vessel um, was prevented from delivering to a mothership processor who had capped out. Ownership among processors has changed signif significantly since the start of the TRAP program. The GAP recommends analysis of a range of alternatives that include status quo up to removal of the cap altogether, since it is unique to this sector, and by analyzing this range, the council could choose any value between status quo and the cap, and no cap. The GAP selected 65% and 85% based on industry recommendations. Public commenters stated that 65% had originally been chosen as a reasonable value between status quo and no cap, and that 85% had been added because some catcher vessel participants wanted to look at higher values where a vertically integrated processor could take on additional catcher vessels beyond their company affiliated catcher vessels. D, mothership processor and catcher processor permit transfer. So as I mentioned before, um, status quo is that a vessel cannot be registered to a mothership permit and a CP permit in the same calendar year. Alternative one is that a vessel could be registered to a mothership and CP permit in the ca same calendar year with three sub options, 
A being that a vessel could switch between a mothership sector and CP sector up to two times during the calendar year. B that a vessel could switch um, up to four times during the calendar year through permit transfer. And then um, sub option C would be unlimited transfers. Currently, a vessel cannot be registered as an MS and CP in the same calendar year through the TRAP program development. This prohibition was intended to keep the sectors separated and not create potentially unfair advantages. However, because the pool of available at sea Hague processors is essentially limited to the current mothership and catcher processor participants, the most likely entrant to the mothership sector in the case that a traditional mothership vessel is not able to participate would be a vessel that participates as a CP through registration to a mothership permit. The scoping paper points out that the action alternative as written would both allow a vessel that had been a CP to enter the mothership sector by becoming registered to a mothership permit in the same calendar year and allow a vessel that had been a mothership permit to enter the CP sector by becoming registered to a CP permit in the same calendar year. The gap discussed whether the provision might have the unintended consequence of traditional mothership processor vessels exiting the mothership sector to participate in the CP sector. Ultimately, the gap determined that the transfer provision would need to work both ways for the following reasons. First, depending on operational plans, a vessel may want to start the year as a mothership and move to a CP sector for the fall fishery. If they could not move to the CP sector in the fall, they may not use the provision at all. Second, creating a one-way avenue where a vessel that had been used as a CP in the CP fishery could come into the mothership fishery, but not the other way around would create fairness and equity concerns and an advantage for a sector that is already the most efficient. Also, the gap found it unlikely that many MS processors would, can, would choose to participate in the CP sector if they didn't already own a CP permit because there are so few latent CP permits annually. The cost of entry would be so high and some mothership processors are not set up to fish which could create another set of inequities and is discussed in the scoping document. With respect to the number of transfers, the GAP recommends the three sub-options above for the number of times a vessel could move between sectors. And to explain an example of what we mean by a transfer, in a two-way transfer scenario, for example, in sub-option A, a vessel would start the year registered to a CP permit, transfer to be registered to an MS permit, that would be transfer one, and then transfer two would be transferring back to be registered to a CP permit and so on under the other sub options. We just wanted to clarify what we meant by a transfer. Um, some members of the GAP and public advocated for unlimited transfers in order to prevent unnecessary barriers, while others did not support unlimited transfers, but were fine with including it in the analysis to ensure an adequate range is analyzed to provide the council with necessary information to select a preferred alternative. Last, considered but rejected. The following ideas were considered but rejected by the GAP and we do not recommend further consideration of these items by the council. First, earlier whiting season start date for the mothership sector only. As described in the scoping document, the GAP does not wish to consider an option that could have a market advantage for one whiting sector and not the others. Changing the mothership processor obligation deadline. While the affected industry and GAP had previously included this in our recommended range of alternatives, the GAP does not think this measure warrants further consideration since it could be difficult to analyze in concert with the waiting season start date and would not significantly improve conditions for sector utilization or flexibility. Instead, the GAP recommends analyzing the removal of the processor obligation as discussed above. Third, reciprocal obligation between catcher vessels and mothership processors. This option was discussed at the October 2018 industry meeting and by the council. However, industry members in the GAP agree that it would be much more efficient for the council to consider the status quo processor obligation or removing the processor obligation altogether. Some CVs had concerns about a reciprocal, how a reciprocal agreement might be applied if they had a vessel breakdown or other issue. As discussed above, many participants discuss the fact that the processor obligation is a unique feature of this fishery that does not occur in other fisheries and should instead be handled through private arrangements between CVs and processors or within the Whiting Mothership Cooperative outside of the government. Pack dependent mothership processor gap. While this idea might be good in theory, it would be difficult to determine at which 
U.S. whiting tack level or mothership sector allocation, allocation level, a processor cap would kick in and could create more confusion than a straight percentage cap. Divisible catch history assignments. The CHAs made to mothership catcher vessel and door's limited entry permits came as indivisible values, but they can be transferred between limited entry permits. The scoping document suggested that one option would be to make the CHAs divisible. While the GAP did not define this option to support the purpose of processing cap alternative under which it was described, if the council chooses to retain the processor obligation status quo, CHAs that are minimally divisible may be worth further consideration. However, making CHAs divisible would cause the mothership sector to function more like an IFQ program and potentially increase cost recovery fees. In addition, WMC members declare quota into pools and they can reassign some or all of their pool declaration to other vessels. For these reasons, the gap did not support moving this forward in the range of alternatives. Last, <laughs> increase the number of mothership processing permits. The scoping paper suggested that the council could analyze adding new mothership permits beyond the six current permits. While some public commenters supported this idea, the gap does not support adding mothership processor permits without broader consideration of the sector and the catcher program as a whole. Mothership processor permits were established based on historical participation and investment in the fishery. Adding a permit for a new entrant would change the value of the current, per current permits and may not support an increased mothership sector utilization since there is a limited pool of at-sea processors available to process hate. And that concludes the GAP report. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, who could ever imagine that the GAP report would be twice as long as the GMT report? I, it's a first, but very thorough and uh, good stuff. Um, questions? Um, questions for Sarah? Maggie Summer. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, on the permit transfers uh, issue, the GAP um, report presents a, a little bit of discussion about uh, whether to include unlimited transfers on the in the range in order to prevent unnecessary barriers. Others didn't think it was necessary. Did you guys have some discussion? I'm curious on how many transfers might be reasonable to expect to occur. Um, you know, and that may be a more appropriate question to ask some of those sign up for public testimony, but thought I'd ask uh, if there was some gap discussion about it since it was in your report. Thank you so much, Ms. Summer, through the vice chair. Um, yeah, we had a little bit of discussion about this. Um, the two permit transfer, as Jesse mentioned, is the one that's in regulations. And so that seemed fair to some of the people in the discussion. And then others in the discussion thought, well, if we're gonna go ahead and change this, we might as well make it as flexible as possible so we don't run into issues later. So, um, you know, there was a little bit of discussion about why that, um, that wall was kind of put up in the first place. And, um, and so I think, the gap was just wanting to make sure that the full range of what gap um, members were wanting was covered there um, for analysis, especially since it might not be that different to kind of describe, you know, four transfers or unlimited. And so um, they basically, I think the best people to ask would probably be some of the public commenters about how much they may or may not um, utilize the transfer option, um, but I'm not sure, like, you know, we didn't have an explicit discussion about, you know, how unlimited might be used or otherwise. Great, thank you for that info. All right, thank you, Maggie. Um, Pete? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Just uh, one question, and thanks, Sarah, for the report, and really appreciate the, the thoroughness um, that the gap put into this in explaining these various um, alternatives and their view of that. On the processor cap, can you tell me, did the gap have a discussion about what the value of having some cap is or what it would provide 
maybe some benefit to the industry. Um, you know, as we look across the range of, uh, we've got several different purpose statements, but they all get at increasing utilization. So what would be the purpose of then having a cap on processing um, and, and including these, you know, looking at even a 65 or 85 percent cap, what would that provide to the industry? Thank you so much, Mr. Hansmer, through the chair, um, or through the vice chair. Oh, I'm getting feedback. Um, so, um, the gap did not have an explicit discussion at this meeting about, you know, well, I mean, we did talk about adding removing the mothership processor obligation to the range, but we didn't necessarily talk about like, you know, why a cap might be needed, but um, we have talked about that at prior meetings. And some of the reasons that um, I heard spoken about in the gap is that because there's um, six processor permits and it's pretty um, close, it's a closed class and it's a pretty small amount of processors that it might provide some protection um, that there's not going to be like one processor in the sector. And so, um, I, you know, I, I think that the gap found a lot of merit in looking at a range of alternatives so that we could see through analysis, like what, um, what the different outcomes would be under the different processing caps, including no cap, so that the council could, if the council chose to retain a, a cap, that you would have the latitude to choose anything within status quo to no cap at all. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if I'm <laughs> fully answering your question, but that's the best I can do at this moment. <laughs> No, thanks. That's good. Uh, there might be questions, you know, during public comment that could help to get at that also. So thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Bob Dooley. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Sarah, for a great report there for the, the gap and did a great job reading it. That was a marathon. Um, I, the question I had was kind of along the same lines. It, it seems like we're getting a, you know, we're, we're taking a snapshot of what's happening today, kind of, to to say what's going on, but over the years, and you know, there's been widely varying allocations and fishing conditions, you know, uh, in the whiting fishery as well as in the pollock fishery that has a, a, a profound effect on the on the on the whiting fishery as well and the availability. Um, you know, I, I remember some years where we only had a couple processors because the whiting uh, allocation was down and the price was down and there was a lot of pollock. So I, uh, I'm i curious, do you see with the, the amount of variability here and the need for flexibility, did you guys discuss that, you know, removing as many of the of the barriers out, that was there any was there any objection to that that was just fundamentally a, a reason why you wouldn't do that? Uh, when I'm, I'm speaking about the processor cap as well as the, uh, as well as the, the um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> The other cap that you're that is uh, so the permit transfer cap. So you know both of those seem to me like just to remove the barriers in my you know my view. But was there a discussion why why there should be some cap there overall, given the, the wide variability we see from year to year? Thank you, Mr. Dooley, through the vice chair. Um, so at this meeting, no, we didn't have a you know. A real deep discussion about uh, we we definitely did talk about removing as many barriers as possible and that increased flexibility could really help the sector in the long term both for the two that you mentioned the MS processor cap and the um, CP MS permit transfer as well as for the mothership processor obligation I think that's why you see the gap dropping the um, you know, the date earlier date for obligation or the later date for obligations is because we just wanted to get rate right to like max flexibility and max options. Um, and so I do think that the gap worked really hard to listen to the public comments from industry to kind of think about everything um, that the GMT and the council have said and asked before and tried to really hone in on a range of alternatives that would allow, you know, in a much increased level of opportunity or, you know, re removing some of these barriers altogether, um, like you're mentioning, and that those things could really contribute to increased flexibility in the sector. Um, 
And so we did have some, you know, sort of general and then more specific conversations around that, um, but did want to include because there was a previous program in place, obviously a lot of the thinking has changed since, you know, 2007, 2008, when some of this was being developed. Um, for the trial rationalization programs. So there's been a, you know, a big change in how people are thinking about this, especially now that we have, you know, we'll, we will have 11 years uh, under our belt after this season. And so um, I think we did have a lot of discussion about how removing some of these barriers could really help improve the sector utilization, but um, the gap didn't like select any, you know, preferred alternatives at this time. So, um, but certainly the discussion was there. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, further questions for Sarah? Okay. Seeing none, um, up next is public comment and uh, Sarah's first. So I think we're gonna uh, spare her and uh, being that it's late, uh, we're gonna try to keep that 6.30 hard stop. So with that, I'm going to give the uh, gavel back to uh, Chair Gromnik. Mark? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Um, we will uh, break now um, and uh, resume at 8 o'clock in the morning with public comment. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to, uh, as we always do, ask Chuck Tracy if he has <laughs> any announcements for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to let you know, we've been kind of working uh, behind the scenes as much as possible, given that the groundfish is on the scene, uh, to see where we might fit in um, the emergency rule to consider uh, whiting permit transfers. And I it looks like we're on track to uh, get this in <clears throat> uh, in front of the council tomorrow. Um, so uh, we, you know, we would like to get it as close to uh, following up after uh, G5. Um, as as we can, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it quite that early, but uh, but um, hopefully uh, sometime by uh, late morning uh, is what we're hoping for. Um, I guess we'll have to be a little bit <coughs> uh, flexible though, and uh, and see where we where things uh, fall out uh, overnight. Uh, obviously, there's some a little bit more work to do for um, and some of the people that are uh, here on the floor right now are uh, probably going to want to uh, have a chance to uh, prepare for that. So um, um, and while we don't want to make everybody work overnight, uh, you know, perhaps uh, if there's some time in the morning to um, allow them to, to work on these, uh, to work on their um, materials, I think that would be helpful. So again, uh, we'll, we'll try and get it in uh, when, we, when we can following G5. Um, also then just a reminder, uh, the salmon agenda item uh, scheduled for the afternoon. Um, uh, we'll need to, I guess, be flexible again with that. Um, but uh, but I think right now, sometime uh, in the afternoon is looking about right for salmon, uh, given that they had um, <clears throat> they've got some uh, work to do and some models to run, uh, some fairly uh, extensive revisions. So um, I think that's where we where we sit for now. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, um, we'll see you in the morning. All right, everyone. Uh get a good night's sleep uh we'll all need to be sharp in the morning until then